Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we uh, I welcome to the Standing Committee on Policy and Strategic Priorities of May 26, 2022, reconvening from May 18th and 25th of 2022. This committee meeting is being convened by electronic means as authorized under Part 14 of the Procedure Bylaw. As such, committee members may participate in person or by electronic means. Committee members participating by electronic means are reminded that in accordance with Section 14.13 of the Procedure Bylaw, video must be enabled in order to confirm quorum. Members are also asked to please advise the clerk if you need to leave the meeting. Um, members, we are just at six, so we just have quorum, and just, uh, we do have to see you on the screen. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young, um, so that we know that you are present and we haven't lost quorum. Thank you. Um, if a committee member uh, loses connection during the voting process, staff will get you back online quickly while we suspend it. The staff contact information has been circulated to you. Video committee members speaking, presentations and vote results will be projected on the live stream when available. Members of the public who wish to participate are encouraged to submit comments online or participate via telephone. May I start by acknowledging that we are on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples and thank them for having cared for this land um, and very much look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this great city together. I also want to take a moment to recognize the incredible contributions of a City of Vancouver staff who work hard every day to help make our city an immense, wonderful place to live, work, and play. Clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Councillor Carr in the chair. Mayor Stewart. Here. Councillor DiGenova. Present. Councillor Fry. Here. Councillor Swanson. Not present. Councillor Hardwick. Present. Councillor Weeb. Present. Uh, Councillor Boyles on a leave of absence from three to five for civic business. Councillor Dominato. Not here. Councillor Bly. Present. Councillor Kirby Young. Present. You have quorum, Chair Carr. Thank you. Let's go over the plan for the day. We will continue hearing from speakers on the Broadway plan, starting with speaker number 92. Um, speakers, please follow along on Twitter at Ban City Clerk for updates on the progress of the meeting so you don't miss your turn to speak. Comments on agenda items can be sent to Council using the web form on the City's website, and the link to that will be tweeted out on at Bad City Clerk. I also want to note the City of Vancouver's long-standing commitment to equity, diversion, and inclusion, including utmost respect for all genders. I remind Council that when addressing speakers and staff, please avoid using gendered honorifics. Instead, refer to the person by first and last name or role or title. As a reminder, this meeting is scheduled from 3 to 10 p.m. today. Should the business not be completed this evening, the meeting will reconvene Tuesday, May 31st, 2022 at 3 p.m. And that will also be a 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. slot that is being held for this meeting. We will recess at 5 o'clock today for dinner, reconvening at 6 p.m. If we complete hearing from speakers this evening, I'm reminding the committee that on May 18th, we approved a third round of questions to staff after hearing from speakers. Finally, I want to remind council members that if amendments are brought forward, they must be submitted to the city clerk in final written form before the council member introduces them. And please ensure the clerk has received your amendments by using council meeting amendments dash DL. Before we begin, I would like to remind speakers you have five minutes to make your comments, should state whether you are in support or in opposition to the recommendations, and may only speak once. Committee members, you have three minutes to ask questions to speakers. However, as you know, speakers are under no obligation to respond. I will also ask if speakers are residents of Vancouver if it is not already noted on the speakers list. Following the last speaker on the speakers list, we will go back through the list for those who were not present when their name was initially called do that. I'm going through the list um, one time. We will now continue hearing from registered speakers, starting with speaker 92, Paul Morris. Is Paul Morris on the line? Afternoon, Chair Carr, Mayor and Councillors. Yes, go ahead. My name is Paul Morris. I'm a resident of Vancouver in the Broadway Plan area, and I oppose the Broadway Plan in its current form. At the rezoning hearing for 1477 West Broadway, councillors heard me speak in detail about the adverse environmental impact of building concrete towers rather than wood frame four to six storey. 
You'll be delighted to hear I am not going to repeat all those facts and figures. However, I do want to remind you the environmental benefits of shifting people from cars to transit are negated by housing most of those people in concrete and glass towers. I would also like to note that the 2020 National Building Code, just published, permits encapsulated mass timber construction up to 12 stories. This makes it a viable alternative for construction along a Broadway built to a more livable scale. However, my main topic is the need to avoid what Theresa O'Donnell last Wednesday termed an unreasonable rate of change. Despite assurances of phasing in over 30 years and focusing initially in the centers, we already have signs of a land rush in residential areas. Six years ago, real estate agents were already approaching stratas in our neighborhood to wind up condos for redevelopment. Recently, for sale signs have gone up on these condos and on rental buildings in this area. Next thing I'm expecting is signs saying Broadway Plan Land Assembly. Controlling the rate of densification in residential neighborhoods and renter protections are clearly the two keys to minimizing permanent displacement from affordable rentals. In councillor questioning last Wednesday, Mr. Silito stated, in the existing apartment areas, we've calibrated the heights and densities at a level we think will lead to incremental change over time as those buildings age and begin to need capital investment. He also mentioned the minimum frontage of 150 feet and the limit of two towers per block as key factors in moderating the rate of redevelopment. He said, retaining the limit of two towers per block is really important. Also last Wednesday, in the Coriolis Consulting presentation, it was stated residential areas would have building heights up to 12 to 20 stories with a maximum of two towers per block. In the draft plan, nothing was mentioned about changing this long-standing limit. In spite of this, the small print in the full Broadway plan clearly states, on blocks with two or more existing towers, constructed prior to adoption of the Broadway plan, one additional tower will be considered. It's three towers per block. This is specified on pages 135 and 137 for the areas coded FSOA and FSOB. Other areas retain the two tower limit, but this is easily tweaked by council. There has already been discussion of adjustments as the plan unfolds and looking at guidelines on a case-by-case -case basis for the 150-foot frontage and the percentage of rentals versus strata. Provisions to moderate the rate of densification are already slipping away. I am equally concerned that provisions to protect renters will be watered down by a future council. As we've seen with the Mount Pleasant Community Plan, 30-year plans don't always last 30 years. I urge Council to, one, incentivize building four to six story wood frame over concrete and glass towers, two, step back from the slippery slope and return to two towers per block in residential areas, three, maintain the 150 foot frontage requirement for towers, four, consider the other improvements suggested by speakers currently opposed to the plan as published, and five, cast those renter protections in stone just not concrete, okay? Thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. Um, please, you, you um, remain on the line. You do have questions from councillors. Councillor Hardwick, go ahead, up to three minutes. Good one, concrete joke. Um, have you sent uh, these details into us, your five points? Uh, no, I have not. Would you be so kind? I was trying to keep up with notes, but uh, it goes very quickly. I'd, I'd appreciate having that in writing. Thank you. Can do. Oh, that's it, Councillor Hardwick. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Councillor Weeb. Go ahead, up to uh, three minutes. Yeah, just a clarifying question. I'm wondering. Uh, you're what... a bit faint, Councillor Weeb. If you could uh, speak more directly into a mic. Yeah, I just one clarifying question. On the 150 foot frontage, what is your rationale and what is your reasoning? why you would like to see the 150 foot frontage is kept in the plan? 
Um, I think uh, uh, Mr. Serto indicated that it, it would slow down the rate of change because uh, we would require developers to um, buy up three adjacent lots. Now, there are already existing uh, uh, rental buildings in our area which have 150-foot frontages. Uh, and I think that those particular rental buildings are highly, highly vulnerable to being uh, sold for redevelopment. Uh, I'm concerned that the same thing has got to creep down to the 100-foot frontage. It's nothing about the, uh, the massing of the towers. Um, we already have towers in this neighborhood which are currently reasonably well-spaced, and I'd like to see that maintained. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. Um, second, we've heard um, some people talk about wanting to see the towers and the park concept more than the power, power and podium concept. Is that something that you have any clarity on? Um, that, that's, uh, that's pretty much what I'd like to see as well. Um, I think uh, uh, that's what we've got in this, uh, this area uh, as well, um, the, uh, currently. Uh, the, the only issue with that is, um, you know, is, is the, uh, the ability to, to achieve the density um, but, uh, and, and the t potential for if we've got uh, you know, towers without podiums that, it, that they're liable to go even higher which I think is, is one of the major concerns around here. Okay, thank you very much, appreciate that. Great, um, thanks, Councillor Weeb. Councillor Fry, up to three minutes. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight and focus on your, your interest in uh, wood construction. And uh, in particular, you know, scaling this out, do you, I mean, do you, do you have a professional expertise in wood construction, first and foremost, and do you see the potential to actually meet our targeted needs for housing through sort of lower rise wood construction and then along the corridor? Uh, yes, to answer to your first question, I do have expertise in wood frame construction. I was the uh, former uh, research uh, manager for the uh, uh, durability and sustainability group at FP Innovations and uh, heavily involved in the leaky condominium uh, crisis and then trying to resolve that. Uh, I believe that it is possible to uh, to achieve the density requirements with uh, with six story. Uh, it's been done uh, elsewhere, and there's a, a lot of uh, research to show that it uh, not only can you you do it uh, in in low and mid rise and achieve the density, but you massively reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, so, I, or, so also, I'm sorry, where has it been done elsewhere? Um, uh, in, uh, if you look at if you look at the major cities uh, of uh, you know, the, the really livable cities of the world, in uh, like Copenhagen, uh, Vienna, um, and uh, some of the other European cities, you know, they have a, you know, a very high densities. And yeah, you know, they, it, for instance, Paris well, okay, uh, doesn't sure. even allow. But, but, but those were built out over decades, if not centuries. I mean, how how do we meet our immediate need? And also recognizing, you know, here in the West, we. Land ownership has been kind of the mantra and speculation, you know, for the history of the city. So we have a lot of lots that we would have to assemble to achieve that kind of density at that kind of scale. Um, it's a, it's also a question. A of, uh, it, it is a challenge, but it also I think that uh, the, the projected growth uh, that the uh, is being uh, considered in this plan is um, way higher than the, the, the true growth that we're likely to see. The United Nations projects Vancouver as retaining 1% growth over the next, uh, next period, uh, not, not the double or, or more that uh, the Broadway plan projects. Also, I understand that uh, with the existing uh, potential for build-out, the Broadway plan could house way more than uh, is being uh, proposed. Okay, so yeah, I mean, none of us have a crystal ball, of course, but I, but I, I do see a pretty grim vacancy rate and pretty steady growth in actuality, with the exception of the COVID blip. But okay, thank, thank, thank you very much. Appreciate your insight. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Councillor Fry. Councillor Kirby Young, over to you, over to you for for three minutes. Um, are you on mute? Sorry. Sorry, double mute, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for speaking to Council, and I appreciate the discussion and the points you raised about frontage. And I'm wondering, we're hearing different points of view on this, and we're hearing from some that 
um, retaining the longer frontage would actually potentially put more pressure for land assembly, because if you have to have a minimum size site, you need multiple lots, and then that could, an unintended consequence of that could be that it puts pressure on those older existing apartment buildings because you need more sites. So they would get bought up as opposed to being able to use one, two, three parcels potentially. I'm wondering if you have comments on that because we're trying to strike that balance between um, protecting and supporting existing renters in life of those buildings and trying to create new homes for people. Yeah, I, th I think if the uh, uh, the developers are required to put together uh, land assemblies, that's, that is going to, um, uh, to, you know, to moderate the pace. Uh, but uh, as, I said, as I mentioned before, there are a number of, uh, of rental buildings and condominium buildings in this area that already have 150 foot frontage. Um, and I think that uh, those are the buildings that the real estate agents um, uh, already have their, their eyes on uh, or have possession. And do you see a difference in sort of the, the age of the buildings that have those longer frontages, for example? Um, they're actually fairly new and very well maintained. I've seen new roofs being put on them, new windows, um, which, which might suggest that the, uh, the owners are going to, to retain those buildings. But uh, if we make it uh, too um, tempting uh, for the developers, uh, then they're going, to, they're going to be offering those, the owners of those buildings uh, you know, way over the odds. And you know, they're going to be highly tempted to, to sell up and, and thereby displace the, the renters that are present in those buildings. Yeah, it certainly is a balance because if you make it too prescriptive as well, then you may not actually see some of that development, like you said. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, I, it's, a, it, it's a balance. I understand it's a very, very delicate balance. Right. Okay. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Um, that that are, is it for your questions. Thank you so much for your patience in, in answering all those questions as well as uh, thank you for speaking to council. Thank you. Great. We're on um, 90, uh, speaker 93 has withdrawn, so speaker 94, Andrea Baxendale. Hi, thank you, Councillor Carr. Andrea Baxendale. I'm a resident of Fairview. I'm speaking against the proposed Broadway plan. Uh, well, I feel there's uh, multiple reasons to vote against this, but I'm just going to keep my comments to climate consultation and livability. I've listened after the last two days of presentations to uh, the presentations and the speakers. There have been uh, very good speakers, and I've learned a lot more about the Broadway plan than I originally knew. One thing that has been said by planning is how this plan will be good for the environment. I don't believe we can take just one aspect and say that it is a win for climate. Building 40-story concrete towers is not environmentally friendly. Concrete is not an environmentally friendly product. That, coupled with the energy needed to run these buildings once they're built, does not make them a good choice. Recently, Vancouver has said it will require new buildings to have air conditioners, which are also high-energy users and create heat to the areas surrounding them. The areas north and south of Broadway have established tree canopies, gardens, and grass. All this greenery helps to cool the city. The proposed Broadway plan looks to pave over a vast amount of it. I'm wondering what studies have been done to show the impact of adding so much concrete and taking away so much greenery will have on the overall temperature of the city, particularly in the areas that are affected by this plan. I feel very strongly that we cannot minimize the effect COVID had on the public consultation process for the Broadway plan. It's only recently that we are opening up after being essentially locked down for close to two years. For myself, these last two years have been incredibly stressful, both personally and professionally, and I know I'm not alone when I say that. To now be presented with a plan that will drastically change the city and be told that there was adequate public consultation is quite shocking. Filling out an online survey is not the same as going to an open house. Seeing actual models, being able to speak to neighbours and planners to ask questions and exchange ideas is an integral part of the democratic process. There has been criticism of the diagrams and renderings made by private citizens to illustrate what the added density in the 500 block plan could look like. These wouldn't have been necessary if the city had provided them to the public. I, for one, am very grateful for the time spent by those residents. It was shocking for me to see the several neighborhood plans would be dismantled by the Broadway plan. Worse to hear that Teresa O'Donnell say these neighborhood plans are outdated. Does that mean that this plan will also be outdated before it's fully implemented? The proposed plan lacks any 
added public amenities, including schools, libraries, community centers, and parks. The city cannot keep adding people without adding these amenities. Our existing community centers are quite literally crumbling down. If the intention of the plan is to attract family, then there needs to be the infrastructure to support them. Otherwise, they will be having to travel to schools and other facilities, which negates the idea that everything will be walkable distance from where they live. The city now defines two-bedroom units as family units, which has resulted in developers putting two bedrooms into increasingly smaller square footage units. 600 square feet now have two bedrooms, and as definition would be a family unit. I would say this is unlivable, particularly when there are no amenities within walking distance. I suggest for transparency we speak in square footage rather than bedrooms. For more than 10 years, the city has been upzoning as a solution to the affordability crisis. Rather than getting better, it's only getting worse. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. I'm asking Council to send the Broadway plan back. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, you do have speaker, uh, sir, you do have questions, if you would stay on the line. Councillor Hardwick, mm -hmm. hard, um, Hardwick, up to three minutes. Thank you. Very quickly, Andrea. Um, you were critical of the public consultation process. Uh, and I know during the pandemic, it, it has been very limited. Um, have you had experience in other community planning consultations in the, in the past? Yes, yes, I have. I, I live in a heritage building and uh, the one public consultation very close to me was, the, was in that building. Uh, we worked to push the building back. We worked with the city, we worked with planning, we went to the open houses, we went um, and talk to the planners, and we had a result on that. I also was involved in uh, um, uh, next to the hospice. There was another big uh, uh, open house. There, there was a proposed building going in next to the hospice on Granville Street, and uh, we campaigned in our neighborhood to ensure that lots of people got out to that. And again, a lot of neighbors talking with neighbors, planners were there. And uh, and it's vital to 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 get the information out and to exchange ideas and to get a better understanding of what's being proposed, and also for the public to be able to express how they feel about the proposed plans. There are those that are arguing that the online process is more equitable and accessible for uh, residents. How would you respond to that? Well, I would disagree with that. I, I took the surveys. Um, the surveys, I feel, are uh, when you're giving a multiple choice, then there's only so many answers. And um, I'm not sure. I would imagine that staff would have a lot of reading to do if they read every single comment. But my answers um, to the questions were not there. So I had to go into the, the comments. And again, I, I feel that, that it's very important for people to be able to come together physically in the same room and have a discussion. It's very different than an online process, as well as um, I believe those surveys were open to everybody and they were available multiple times. So, Well, thank you very much for your input. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Thanks, Councillor Hardwick. Uh, and that is it for your questions. Thank you again for coming to speak to Council. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Speaker 95, Lindsay Ann O'Shea. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Up to five minutes to speak to council. Thank you. And it's, um, I know it's spelled funny, but my name is pronounced Lindsay. So, and I also apologize if there's background noise, there's a redevelopment going on next door and it gets very noisy. Um, I'm calling in to strongly oppose the Broadway plan and request that council table until after the civic election. The City of Vancouver's job is to manage development growth, not promote it, and financially benefit from it. I reside in Vancouver, and I'm a 54-year-old born and raised Vancouverite, mother of three, nana to two, and after City of Vancouver Planning Department changed the zoning to the site, I'm now awaiting my dem eviction after residing at Elma Blackwell, 1656 Adnack Street, for 20 years. It's noteworthy to mention that this building is only 36 years young, and the tenants were told a year and a half before our unofficial official notice that the building is in good repair, in standing, and we had nothing to worry about. That changed with the zoning change, I guess. 
Entre New Femme Housing Society blocks tenants from being members and has recently partnered with BC Housing to double down on their rental income. The new build's affordable rent will be approximately double to what myself and current tenants are paying. BC Housing is not on my tenancy agreement, but yet I have to meet their parameters to be given right of first refusal to return to the new, more expensive Alma Blackwell. I am sandwiched between being priced out of returning and priced out of the rental market entirely. Had I not been blocked in being a member of that society, I would have had the privilege of notice and what was coming and had more affordable options for my household. Now it's too late and it's time, and I guess it's time to get an RV. Despite working two jobs, I will not be able to afford to live in Vancouver with the current rental market and an increased monthly rent of at least 150% to downsize into a one bedroom. I'm not being helped by the landlord, which is the developer ENF, City of Vancouver, uh, the Tenant Relocation Protection, or Brightside. I have raised many valid issues to the four entities and have been ignored, gaslit, discriminated against because I've self-advocated and insisted on the truth and being treated with dignity. I tried to meet with ENF CEO and she wouldn't meet with me without um, including a strategic communicator, Judy Kirk. There is no one advocating for me or willing to help without a retainer fee. I'm hurt, I'm confused, and very afraid for my future self. The chronic uncertainty of where am I to live is almost debilitating and is negatively impacting my health and permeating into all areas of my life. I cannot begin to tell you how much I and many of the tenants of Elma Blackwell have suffered and continue to suffer. I can easily foresee this nightmare of chronic anxiety to thousands of Vancouverites currently renting along the Broadway corridor. I do not wish this suffering on anyone. In reviewing the 2021 census data, there is more housing supply being built than required, and Vancouver has 23,000 empty and unoccupied dwellings. Please, please take heed to what the data is saying and not city staff. One of humanity's greatest strengths is our ability to innovate solutions to complex problems, and this can be a detriment when we misdiagnose the problem. There are plenty of rentals in Vancouver. Just look on Craigslist. The problem is there are no affordable rentals. The city saying 10% less market rent being affordable is absolutely not in tune with Vancouver Rights household income and is worlds apart from what current households medians and are doable. We have the supply, we do not have the affordable supply. The average household in- income in Vancouver is 66K. The average salary median in Vancouver is 39K. The household of 66K can afford a $210,000 mortgage. The current average one bedroom in Vancouver is $800,000. Now, how is it that I'm able to understand that building and densifying the Broadway corridor is not going to solve the affordable housing crisis and only exacerbate it? And how is it that this plan is actually on the floor before you for approval? The Broadway plan will result in existing renters being kicked to the curb and treated like squatters rather than stakeholders. And I say stakeholders because I personally have been paying another's mortgage for 20 years, month after month without fail, and no matter the financial struggles I was enduring. Rather than being appreciated for my dependable 240 months of rent, I'm being told to GTFO and treated like vermin because I was a long-term reliable tenant. I'm just going to skip because I think I'm running out of time. Where is the zone capacity data in the Broadway plan? Why is Council not making the collection and parsing of intelligent data program a priority before the Broadway plan? Vancouver's population increases 1% a year. What is the pipeline? Where exactly is the pipeline data coming from? Yes, actually, you are, not... out, sorry, you are out of time, but you do have questions. Um, so okay. potentially you can complete some thoughts there. But um, first to Councillor Hardwick for three minutes. Go ahead, Councillor. Thanks, Lindsay. You're breaking my heart. You're welcome. <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, my heart is broken. I love my house. The... It is your house in the Broadway plan area? Uh, no, I'm in Grandview Woodland and um, I'm uh, near Clark. And the reason why I'm bringing this to you is I'm, I'm worried for all the renters that are going to go through what I'm going through. So, yeah, so that's your point is you're, you're going through this um, 
terrible situation and you're anticipating that this will be the pattern uh, for for renters along the Broadway corridor. A million percent. Um, I know that uh, it, it was further down in my, I know it, it was long, but I, I have a lot to say. I have 20 years worth of stuff to say. But um, the uh, promise of tenant relocation and protection, it's, it's just, a, uh, from what I can tell, it's just a slogan for a mayoral candidate. Um, it certainly has not been my experience. I have gone to the TRPP. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to name staff that I've talked to. I've talked to several staff. And um, all I've been telling, all I've been um, told by the city staff when I brought different things to them about what we're going through here is it wasn't their job. And it doesn't seem to be anybody's job. Another quick question. Um, we know that the subway is going down Broadway. If not, what is being planned, then what? Uh, consultation. Um, I would suggest um, all the different speakers that have lined up to talk, myself included. There's a lot of really smart people. I don't think it's about necessarily densifying um, or uh, uh, and kicking out the renters. I think there's a way that uh, this can happen without gentrifying the corridor. But Wait. this isn't my area of expertise. I'm a yoga teacher. <laughs> um, so you don't have any particular comments about housing typology from your perspective. It's really about retention of existing affordable rental. Retention of yes, I, I, yes, but I know that there were speakers before, and I've been watching um, the Tai and different uh, media's about different ideas of what can be done in Vancouver to maintain affordability, like true affordability. If if the median is thirty nine thousand for the average income, how is a, a, a twenty five hundred dollar one bedroom? How is that doable? That's what the current rents are. Yeah, Councillor Hardwick, yeah. actually, you are out of time. Um, I had to reset your timer because it was, it had continued yeah, from a previous time. It's been time. long. Thanks, Chair, and, and thank you, Lindsay. Great. Thank You're you. welcome. Councillor Swanson, over to you for three minutes. Yeah, thanks for coming, Lindsay. So thank you. If we could change the TRPP so that it said that you would be evicted people, demo evicted people would be able to return to the new building at at their old rent. Would yeah. that be something that you'd go for? Um, well, at this point, it would be something I would have to go for because I really, I, I don't have any options. I have no options. My trust is very, very strained right now with um, my landlord and this developer. Uh, but I, that is absolutely, and if that is something that is doable for um, the developers and in the future, then then absolutely. I don't know. I actually don't know why it's people are not grandfathered in with their rental, especially especially for the long term tenants that have been contributing you know, for so, so long, right? Like, I also, uh, I know that Minister Eby put in, um, like, 2.8 billion or 2.3 billion, I'm sorry, I'm not very mathy, um, uh, for the housing hub. That was one of the things that I brought up. It's like, well, what about housing hub? Why would, uh, you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if us, um, I was a single mom of three, you know, I've never been able to have a savings account. And wouldn't it be wonderful if maybe my rent could contribute to a down payment and I could actually maybe own part of this or something. And, you know, I was laughed at. It was and so I don't even know, I don't know who Housing Hub is benefiting. I don't know where that money actually went, but I certainly do not have any access or way to access that. But yeah. sorry, Jean, to answer your question is yes. <laughs> yes, I would. <laughs> that Housing Hub money is pretty mysterious to me too. Uh, okay, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Swanson, and thank you so much, um, Lindsay, and appreciate very much you um, coming to speak and to answering questions. Thank you so much. Speaker 96, Matthew Schultz. Is Matthew Schultz on the line?
Uh, speaker number 96 is not on the line. Thank you. Ni speaker 97, Pierre Gallant. Good afternoon, Mayor Council. Um, I am the chair of the board of directors of La Maison de la Francophonie at uh, 1555 West 7th, and I would like to speak in favor of the Broadway plan. Uh, La Maison, as you may have been told, has, is owned by 13 organizations that offer services for Francophone and Francophiles in the Greater Vancouver. Francophones uh, not only come from Quebec, but from all parts of the country. There are Francophone communities in every provinces. We also have Francophones from other continents, and we offer services to enable them to integrate more with the, uh, the community. We are... Um, Asset rich and cash poor. Our facility is about 30 years old or so. It's in desperate need of repairs, renewals, and improvements. Um, partnering with our developer to allow a redevelopment enables us to hopefully get rid of our mortgage and instead of going for subsidies uh, from the federal, provincial, and uh, municipal governments, we would like to be more uh, self sustained. Uh, the redevelopment would answer many of our problems and offer newer, fresher spaces for the community. The theater that uh, we are rebuilding, um, we would rebuild, sorry, would offer services not only to Francophones, but to every theater group and indeed the uh, live performing arts. Um, I heard through many presenters that uh, concrete towers are energy hogs. That is not entirely true. I'm a recently retired architect. Uh, it's true that concrete has embodied energy, as most materials do, but if designed appropriately, it can use far less energy than many other buildings. So the stereotyping of energy hogs is perhaps inappropriate. It varies from building to building. I'd like to point out that older buildings typically use far more energy than newer ones, unless, of course, there's a retrofit and a renovation of, of, the, of the project. Many people don't like change. I used to say to uh, me, my AIBC members, if you don't like change or like being irrelevant even less, uh, I would urge council not to throw away the plan because of some concerns are not met. There's no such thing as a perfect plan. It's perfect to someone, and it's, of course, imperfect to others. It's a compromise. It's a balance. And it's very difficult to achieve. Um, I, I don't think the plan should be thrown away because it does not answer each and every need of every circumstance. Um, the residential tower, one of our board members alluded to the fact that it would be a mixture of market and non-market uh, housing. That has not been decided. The residential tower will be negotiated in good faith with city staff to fulfill our needs and, of course, the needs of the community in the city. And I will let our developer a partner, Kanderell, to speak to that. Um, a lack of density, I'm told that uh, increased density increases cost. Lack of density also increases cost. San Francisco would be an example where the rich want less density and raises the prices without uh, the social benefit that would come with it. So, again, I'm not a planner, only a lowly architect, but I can assure you that for a reaction is a reaction, and it's very, very difficult to achieve an appropriate balance. I certainly defer to planning staff and all the researchers that they face and to provide council with a balanced plan. Uh, it's a living document. It will continue to be modified. It will continue to be improved. And if specific elements can be addressed uh, to, uh, to answer some uh, more pressing concerns, I certainly defer to collective wisdom. Merci beaucoup pour votre attention. Thank you kindly for your attention. Yep. Merci beaucoup aussi. Um, but you do have some questions, if you don't mind. Um, staying on the line. First, Councillor Kirby Young, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks for speaking. I, I really appreciate kind of having your professional perspective, and I wonder if you can delve a bit more into this because we are hearing a lot of concerns and, and folks that are stating that this is not green in terms of the concrete towers, the amount of embodied GHGs, and you touched on that, certainly, um, with respect to sometimes the use of older buildings or building standards. Vancouver's adopted some pretty um, pretty um, 
detailed and kind of uh, leading green building standards. And I wonder if you can kind of comment further on that as well as, you know, should we look at it just in terms of the building? Should we look at it in terms of transit and people not having to drive cars? How does it compare to people, for example, living in single family homes and having to travel further? Like, would you like to fill in that perspective a little bit? Because that's something that we do hear a lot and I, I'd love to get your point of view. Smaller footprints, the smaller apartments typically have one exterior wall. Single family homes have four exterior walls, plus a roof, plus a, a, a slab on grade. So they have six exterior surfaces. So the, the the energy loss through the exterior surfaces is far greater than than a typical condominium project or an apartment building. Um, there's more energy efficiency in sharing some of the central units. There's more energy efficiency in having heat pumps and, and um, heat recovery, and those typically are more efficient with higher density. Um, I think. The, I spent a career repairing buildings, uh, retrofitting uh, uh, leaky condos, schools, and hospitals. There's energy loss through thermal bridging and air leakage. Most older buildings have considerable thermal bridging and considerable air leakage, unless, of course, they're renovated. Newer buildings with the newer energy codes are far more stringent. They're not stringent enough, in my humble opinion, but we are moving in the right direction. We're nowhere near ready for zero footprint uh, carbon neutral buildings, but there's a few prototypes that have been built in order to achieve that. And some, I guess, include concrete and steel structures, not only, of course, uh, wood frame structures. Okay, and with respect to, you know, looking ahead, I mean, staff have um, conveyed this as a 30 year plan. And right now I know that there's some constraints with respect to mass timber in terms of sort of the ideal, height um, and the, currently the cost of uh, construction of the relative options, et cetera. But do you see that also having the opportunity to change over time throughout the life of the plan that wood could also, um, mass timber could also contribute positively um, from an environmental perspective? Indeed, mass timber is relatively young. Um, BC has been at the forefront of promoting it. We have seen some European architects and constructors promoting it as well. It's in its infancy. Forestry needs to be managed, but of course, to manufacture these uh, these timber uh, has embodied energy as well, just like concrete and steel. However, it's more renewable. Uh, I think in due course it will be more competitive and be a better alternative. I don't know at this point if we're there yet. The plan should I'm certainly sorry. offer I'm, that I'm, opportunity. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but Councillor Kirby Young has gone well over her time. Um, but you do have more questions. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dominato, go ahead, up to three minutes. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Pierre, for uh, calling in today. I, I just wanted to uh, circle back. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young asked a bit about built form and sustainability of buildings, but I'm curious, both from a personal and professional perspective, can you, can you offer your thoughts on the issue of affordability? Because some of the criticism of the plan is that it doesn't deliver enough affordability over time. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts or insights to offer on that. With utmost respect, I think that uh, exceeds my uh, knowledge and expertise. But the little bit that I know is that you have construction costs and land costs. And if you want to make things affordable, uh, the best way to redistribute wealth is through taxation, um, deferred, uh, deferred uh, taxes, um, a tax incentive and the like. And of course that reduces revenue for the city. Therefore the city needs to increase revenue elsewhere. So that's a very simplistic comment in terms of um, reducing construction costs. I think uh, the market continues to try to achieve that. Um, and I'm afraid I, that's all I can add to that. I, it's not very helpful. <laughs> No, it's certainly helpful. We appreciate you've called in, and I know there's been a number of members of uh, Maison de la Francophonie who have uh, called in to offer perspective, and so thank you for that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Dominato, and that is it for your questions. Thank you so much for answering them and for speaking to us. Thank you kindly. Great. Um, speaker number 98, Erica Weiss. Afternoon, Mayor and members of Council. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, very clear. Go ahead. I'm not opposed to development that provides for greater density in Metro Vancouver, but I am opposed to the Broadway plan. 
There are a lot of problems with the plan, many of which have already been articulated by other concerned residents. And so I will limit my comments to the existential aspect, which affects us all, which is the environmental impact of the plan. Fundamentally, the plan is a generic overreaching policy that is completely blind to the twin exigencies of a local context and the reality of climate crisis. It treats Vancouver like an ordinary American megacity. It disregards protection of Vancouver's view cones, solar access and green spaces. It has a top-down approach which ignores the nuances of individual neighborhoods and it has an outdated emphasis on carbon intensive, energy inefficient high rises. And all of that reflects what a banal retrograde policy it is and how out of touch planners are with the unique qualities of the city. The plan would chisel away at Vancouver's livability by privatizing views and causing significant shading across Kitsilano, Mount Pleasant and Fairview, which may fly in places like Dallas or Vegas, but that is a big problem in a city as stubbornly gray and dark as Vancouver. The Broadway plan treats housing as a zero sum proposition of high rises or nothing. There's a common myth that taller, more densely packed skyscrapers are the most sustainable because they optimize the use of space, has more people per square meter, and limit urban sprawl. But recent studies demonstrate that densely built, low-rise environments are actually more space and carbon efficient, while high-rise buildings have a significantly higher carbon impact and reduced energy efficiency. A recent BC Hydro report concluded that despite many new high-end condo buildings being marketed as energy efficient, those living in them have a much larger energy footprint than those living in older buildings. Low to mid-rise buildings have 45% of the life cycle GHG emissions compared to high-rise developments for the same population density. In fact, the City of Vancouver's own 2016 Zero Emissions Building Plan stipulates that the low-rise multi-unit residential buildings are the ideal building form and construction type for cost-effective, high-performing building envelopes and ventilation systems. The city's density targets can be achieved with little high-rise construction at all. When wood-framed and mass timber buildings are widely accepted as the standard in sustainable construction, and the city's own zero emissions building plan recommends low-rise residential buildings as the ideal construction form, why does the plan provide for the development of hundreds of high-rises? But, oh, you may say, what about the millions of people who are coming here and the density needed to support the subway extension? Based on census data, Vancouver's population is growing at a rate of 1% a year, or about 7,000 people a year. Current housing projects already in the development pipeline would more than accommodate census-based growth for the next 30 years without any additional housing from the plan. The prospect of surplus housing development will simply increase land price speculation and further erode existing family-friendly housing stock as we are already seeing merely in anticipation of the plan's adoption. TransLink's own planning guidelines suggest that a density of 50 dwellings per hectare is sufficient to support rapid transit. The Broadway area is already at 62 dwellings per hectare. So why the continued insistence on the need for significant density increase to support the subway extension? We are on the brink of climate catastrophe and people are literally dying in BC from climate change induced heat waves. Council should be scrupulous in ensuring that future-oriented development is based on actual census-based demand and that any development under the plan meets the highest standards in sustainability. The Broadway plan squanders an opportunity for Vancouver to be a global leader in sustainable development and pays near lip service to its greenest city aspirations. There is a more climate resilient, less carbon intensive, family friendly middle ground that would meet census based housing demand while enhancing livability in the city of Vancouver. I would ask that the committee accept the plan for information purposes only, refer it back to staff for proper neighborhood based planning to adopt appropriately scaled forms of sustainable ground oriented development 
worthy of the city of Vancouver and reflective of its commitment to reducing global carbon emissions and bring it back to council after the election. Thank you so much. Uh, you do have questions. Um, Councillor Swanson, go ahead. Yeah, thanks so much for coming in. Um, you referred to a 2016 city study that said that low rise, low, low rise housing was best. I wonder if you could just email me a link to that. Yeah, so I don't no problem. I'd be happy to. I'm, I'd be happy to. You. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, that is it for your questions. Appreciate you answering the uh, councillor's questions and speaking. Uh, thank next, you. Next speaker, uh, 99, um, Andrea Olson. Hello? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hello, Council and Mayor. I'm Andrea. I'm a millennial that lives in the Broadway Plan area of Fairview, and I've lived here ever since I moved to Vancouver seven years ago. I'm speaking today in opposition of the Broadway Plan as it stands uh, because I don't feel it actually protects tenants in the way that you're claiming it does. Um, I've already seen reading through all the literature that you kept saying that people want development. I am one of those people that participated in the uh, surveys and said I wanted development. What I didn't want was to be displaced from my home for three to five years and be given an opportunity to have a third of the space for almost double the price of what I currently pay. That was not one of the multiple choice options. If it was, then I wouldn't have selected I, uh, and I'm in support of development. Um, I can already see the loopholes in place, and there are some amendments I think need to be made in order to assure protection. I believe that we can have development and we can protect tenants um, in a way um, that hasn't been done before because, in all honesty, tenants have not been protected in the city. There have been plenty of cases where we can see that developers have come in and said they will protect tenants that go through the loopholes that are currently in existence in the protection as proposed in the plan. The first thing I would really uh, like to see is that um, square foot is protected. Uh, when you talk about similar sized or right size units, having a third of the space that you have now doesn't work for most people. Almost everyone in my building is a family of three or four people that are living in one bedroom apartments. They're able to live in one bedroom apartments because they're close to 1,000 square feet. This works for families of three or four, and it is affordable for them. Under your plan, this square foot is not protected. They'll be given a third of the space and expected to have three or four people live in that space. It just is not right-sized or livable. Um, you say this is for families. It's also not affordable. These families can't upgrade to two or three bedrooms. That's why they are making one affordable one bedrooms work for them. Um, I think, you know, if we apply the same logic about right size to your salaries, and we said, let's go to a third of your salary because it's right size, you would probably disagree with that and say that that's not equitable or fair. Um, I also think you need to consider when we talk about people being displaced or them evicted for a period of time, where are they supposed to go? You know, there's no, um, there's hardly any units available, especially that are affordable. And I think developers need to ensure that people are able to stay in their same neighborhoods during this time. Um, you know, again, because most of the people in my building are families, these people chose Fairview for the schools. They chose Fairview for the access to work. Um, where are we supposed to move for two or three years while we wait to move back into a micro unit? There needs to be protection in place to ensure developers have rentals available lined up in the exact same neighborhood um, for people to move into so that it doesn't fall on the tenant and create what other people have mentioned, this uh, deeply rooted anxiety. Um, about where they're going to live. Lastly, you have nothing in there about how these protections are actually going to be enforced or put in place. Uh, I think that really needs to be considered because there's already so many cases that even you as counselors have spoken out on saying, ooh, we didn't want the developer to do that, but when they're not legally held accountable, they get away with it. Um, so those are the things I would like to see considered before the Broadway plan gets approved. I'm afraid that if you approve the Broadway plan, we'll never have real protections in place um, for all the current tenants. And um, it's just, it's that if you're not going to put in real protections, then please just stop saying that you have rental protections in place and gaslighting people for both. That's not the case. We can all see the loopholes and you need real protection if you want to make this development work. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you. You do have some questions, so please um, do stay on the line. Councillor Weave, up to three minutes. Yeah, no, I really appreciate your comments. One of the ones I was wondering is about, there's been conversations about swing space, about making sure that there's spaces available for families to go or for people to go and that we need to make sure that the current renters are significant stakeholders in this plan for the group support. Is that something that you think we need to make sure that we kind of focus our efforts on putting new housing in places that don't displace while we build out the kind of process and ways that we can support renters appropriately? Yes, I absolutely do believe that. Um, you know, I've looked into cases that exist right now and we'll see, you know, some of the buildings in the West End that have been redeveloped and displaced people to gas town. I'm sorry, but most of the families in my neighborhood can't be displaced to micro units in gas town while we wait for redevelopment. So I do believe that clean space um, and that protection needs to be in place so that families can continue to live in the same neighborhood. I mean, myself personally, I'm a millennial, I have a master's degree, I work through jobs. The reason I'm able to do so is because I live in Fairview and I have created a life where my jobs are accessible to each other within the areas uh, which I live and work. Um, if I get displaced, that would greatly change my livelihood. I'd likely have to quit some of my jobs and all the things I go between. Um, and I can see that for many people as well. And then the other big concern you have is that if you return back to a space that's half the square footage, that won't be able to be place that's acceptable for your family, is that correct? That is correct. Um, it's not only my family, it's literally everyone in my building, like I said, is a family of three or four, and they live in one bedroom, but they've been able to MacGyver and maneuver into two or three bedrooms. Um, and so, yeah, so I think the space needs to be considered, and if this can be considered with the development going on, you know, yes, maybe they have to build a few bigger units, um, but I believe it can be part of the build, and if it's put into place now, developers can prepare for that accordingly. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Because if you can't move all your stuff back in, it doesn't seem like it's similar unit to me. No, that makes sense. Appreciate you coming to speak today. Great. Thanks, thank Councillor Weep. So uh, Councillor Swanson, over to you for questions. Yeah, Councilor those are three really good points. Thanks for making them. I'm going to uh, ask staff what their answers are. Like, is there a way we could get the same number of square feet? How do we know that there'll be a unit available in the neighborhood for interim housing? And what kind of enforcement would we have? Um, do you have any ideas as to what would be a good way of enforcing it? Uh, I do not. Um, I think it'd be a brand new thing that could, again, um, create kind of a framework for the rest of development going forward um, and tenant protection going forward. Um, as far as the enforcement's in place right now, I know that they don't work. So that's all I've seen. I mean, I've read a million articles about people, you know, going back to units when they were told it would be the same rate, but that only lasts a year, or going back to units that are, you know, a third of the size and like their furniture can't even fit in. So that to me is, again, um, I'm not sure how it can be enforced. Perhaps there's a city task board. Perhaps I don't know how to hold developers accountable in LSD once they get the approval and they have a legal team working to find these loopholes. But um, yeah, that's all I have. Yeah, maybe if um, instead of saying, or if we had something that said, like they, when you, being very inarticulate here, <laughs> um, that if you have a one bedroom, you go to a one bedroom, but if it's a really small one bedroom that you're going to, maybe we could say that you go to a two bedroom or a three bedroom, depending on the square feet. Yeah. Maybe we could do something like that. That's exactly it. I think square put feet protection is really important because, again, a third of the size is not a similar size or a right size unit. Okay. Thanks so much for coming in. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, um, indeed, for speaking and to uh, answering those questions. Thanks so much. Great. Take care. Thank you. You too. Uh, speaker 100, Wendy Germain. Wendy Germain. When did you mean? I believe you are on the line, but um, but we can't hear you. 
Uh, speaker 100 is not on the line. Okay, Speaker 101, Janice Hamilton. That's me, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, up to five minutes. Oh, good. I'm sorry if I'm a bit slow and fuddly. I've got a broken arm. I'm trying to manage my notes and my cell phone, which is propped in the toaster to hold it close to my eye, ear, my mouth, so you can get the picture here. I'll do my best. Uh, thank you, Chair Carr and Council. My name is Janet Thomas, and I live in South Granville. I've been engaged in a variety of uh, uh, processes and uh, surveys and so on on the Broadway plan, and because of that, I ask that you oppose this version. I understand that this is about high-level concepts and not the detail. However, I found it to be a disappointment, as in my opinion, it has not lived up to its promise, that of a design to create complete communities for both the massive Broadway corridor and the neighborhoods first to 16th Avenue. I object because it's not comprehensive, even at a high level. It suggests where housing will go and transit and traffic flow, but it's missing the factors that actually attract people to any area green spaces, gardens, parks, playgrounds and schools, libraries and communities and senior centers? Will there be dedicated mini spaces publicly beyond cafes with small seating areas just to enjoy the day or visit with your neighbors? It needs to show how these elements will be integrated into communities to give a sense, um, give us all a sense of the overall look and feel of the neighborhood. Speaking of look and feel, we weren't asked about our thought and preferences for the built form. We were asked about a number of other things, but not that. So I'm dissatisfied with the idea of only one vision, that of high rises. I am realistic about having a few 12 or so story towers along Broadway, just as there already are in my area. But I'm keenly disappointed that the seemingly favored option for housing is to stack us into the sky in concrete towers. Surely Vancouver can be much more imaginative than that. For all the reasons you've heard from experts and even the callers today and uh, yesterday, Concrete towers are not the way to go, nor does it feel like forward thinking. Vancouver's response in terms of built form to the science of climate change and the very real crisis upon us simply cannot be this. Um, we know that wood is a sustainable material of choice for many, and we know that low rises and even mid rises are the right scale if the city is serious about its climate change practices. So I'd like to see more creativity in welcoming human scale buildings. Uh, of wood construction primarily. Let's add some low rises and courtyard style housing where people can socialize and kids can play safely. And what about rental only areas interspersed with other housing in neighborhoods so purpose built rentals can catch up? Co ops and social affordable housing woven into neighborhoods, and this way density can be creatively spread through the entire area. My last point is about the gentrification that accompanies concentrated. Uh, any concentrated densification. As a renter for over 20 years by choice in South Granville, my favorite area, <laughs> I have the right to enjoy community enhancements like transit, but it should not come at the expense of being forced out. The proposed transit oriented displacement of secure, currently secure renters like me, living in affordable rental stock like me, creates enormous insecurity and instability. This is an unexpected financial concern. My high rental area is home to single families and about 6,000 seniors, all several comfortably. Point of privilege, Chair. I'm home. having difficulty hearing the speaker. Yeah, yes. Oh, is this any better? Yeah, um, yes, just try. Go ahead and let's hear. I'll pick up where I left off. Um, sure, just... My high rental area is home to singles, families, and around 6,000 seniors all settle comfortably here in a place we call home. The Broadway plan asks me not to mind, to not mind living in suspense over time, wondering if and when my property owner will sell my building or renovate me <clears throat> for huge profits, and then ask me to pack up and move away for the years it takes to build, rebuild, and then relocate back to a smaller, more expensive unit in most likely a tower which may not feel safe or secure. That will be my new reality if you approve this plan. The proposed Broadway plan is already creating the expected land lift and incentive to sell and redevelop in my area. It's in full swing. Yes, there will be more housing for some who don't mind inflated rents, but for most, it will not support affordability for renters. It will sadly displace us. Renters need to be given more consideration and respect. This version of the Broadway plan does not achieve that, and so I reject this planned gentrification. I hope you, or at least enough of you, will as well. 
I hope, or at least I hope you, or at least enough of you, will ask for refinements to the plan after more public consultation specific to build form and uh, density is done. Thank you very much. That was very well timed. Um, you, you have no questions, but you uh, were very clear in expressing your thoughts. Um, and good luck with that that arm. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, um, Council. It's uh, we're on to speaker one o two, Don Sargent. Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, we can. Go ahead. Up to five minutes. Okay, well, thank you for this opportunity. And uh, my name is Don Sargent. I'm a resident of Kitsilano and a longtime resident of Vancouver and a uh, uh, professional engineer who had worked in urban development. I'm opposed to the Broadway plan, as you've envisioned it. Uh, I have a few reasons I'd like to share. If you could speak just a little I, bit more, more um, clearly into um, the microphone, that would be... A little bit more what? Just speak a little closer to the microphone that you're using, either your computer or okay. your cell phone. Thank you. Is this, is this better? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. The plan is... Oh, sorry. Uh, um, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. The plan is... Oh, excuse me. I, I'm, yeah. so, I'm very sorry to interrupt you. I'll stop your timer. Uh, we've just lost quorum, um, so we don't have sufficient counselors at the moment uh, to continue with the meeting, so I'm just going to pause and make sure we get up some people have now reappeared um so again um okay. we didn't i'm going to reset your timer go ahead we've got quorum now okay. Start All right. from the beginning. Uh, my name is don Sargent. i'm a resident of uh, kitsilano a longtime resident of vancouver and retired professional engineer who worked in urban development I'm opposed to the Broadway plan, and I have a few reasons. First of all, the plan is totally inconsistent with the past practices. Uh, citizens of Vancouver are used to engagement. One speaker talked about the old brewery site at 12th and uh, Arbutus, and that's a good example of what's happened in the past. I recently reviewed a couple of plans for low-rise development in my immediate neighborhood, so it wasn't what I expected. It's still, after it was brought forward and reviewed, it's going to look very similar to what's already being developed in that area. Another consideration is that the Broadway plan looks like a bit of a social experiment. Vertical silos replacing neighborhoods, portable solutions that may not work or don't make sense, displaced present-day citizens, really believe that people want neighborhoods. It's a basis for security and well-being. And I understand that some municipalities are uh, proving large developments at uh, high train stations like Burnaby, but I'd ask you to remember that just because it can be built does not mean that it will work. And I mean work from a social point of view. Another reason is the Broadway plan, as envisioned by Council, imposes enormous change or rate of change in a very large area. The area encompassed by the Broadway plan is, for information purposes, two and a half times larger than the total of the downtown core of Vancouver. It stretches from Stanley Park all the way to False Creek and the oceans on the other side. When I look at the overview leaflet for the Broadway plan, I see several bullets. Towers, jobs and industry, arts, affordable housing. Concepts are mind-boggling when brought together over such a large area. I do believe there is a way forward. That would be to break it down. Learn as we go as to what might work. Now, here I'd give you an example of this. If you one area is that uh, Broadway and Granville, the 39-story rental building, let's look at that over the next five years and see what we learn from that. Also, let's take another area, for example, at the inter Broadway, and take a five or six block radius around that area and implement this plan that's envisioned in, in, in get 
people engaged. Meanwhile, the third area is the remainder of uh, Broadway, allowed to develop under the current zoning and see also what's going to work. Another reason I dislike the plan is it poses unacceptable risk to repeating what is currently happening or has happened in Vancouver, building a large number of homes, and yes, some of them are vacant. There are other issues, for example, money laundering, which is been and essentially the scale, the risks, and consequences of massive development area like this are unknown. Only now some of these issues are being. So to sum up, I'm opposed to the Broadway plan for lack of uh, community. Very risky undertaking. Change or rate of change will affect all Vancouver residents. But I believe it can be done in a measured and managed, managed approach. Um, the sheer scale of the issues uh, that enormous and this large area is, is intractable to deal with for the residents of Canada. I believe the best way forward is to break it down, look at small localized areas, and develop in those areas under a new plan, even the remainder of the existing corridor to develop under the current. I encourage the Council to uh, vote against this plan and engage the people in this change for the well-being of all people. Thanks. Thank you. You do have questions, if you wouldn't mind staying on the line. Councillor Kirby Young, up to okay. three minutes. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks for speaking to Council. Um, got two questions for you. Um, the first one is, and I didn't quite hear all of what you said. You, I think you mentioned you're a professional engineer. Is that right? That's right. Retired. Okay. And did you work in the housing sector or or other areas? Well, I worked in urban development, so that included housing. Uh, infrastructure. Okay. And, and was there a specific type of housing that you focused on? I'm just trying to get a bit of perspective, like if you have dealt with multi-unit buildings before, for example, or were you more focused on single family, or what was your, your kind of focus? All, all of those. I mean, you know, Westwood Plateau would be single family. Ours in Vancouver would be multi. Okay. Yeah. And the other thing is that you mentioned, um, you said we should potentially learn as we go, you know, build a building like the one at Granville and Broadway, um, wait and see how it is. Do you think that there are other areas, like, for example, perhaps the west end of Vancouver um, that have, there are more dense communities where we could uh, learn from them as opposed to having to wait, sort of, say, five years to see the impact of one building, for example? Well, I, I think that the issue of the learning is the learning done by the local residents of the area that's affected and it's getting them engaged. Yes, but I mean, there may be stuff in the West End that can be looked at to help them understand how development's going to transfer. Sorry, you just cut out there. There may be things in the West End that didn't quite catch that. That would help uh, the citizens of the affected area understand how how they will adapt to the change. Right. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Councillor oh, Kirby Young. Thank Thanks, Councillor Kirby Young. And that's it for your questions. Thank you so much for speaking to Council. Okay, thank you. Bye. Great. Speaker 103, Maynard Aubuchon. Maynard Aubuchon on the line. Speaker 103 is not on the line. Okay, Speaker 104, Valerie Porter. Speaker, uh, Speaker 104 is not on the line. Speaker 105, Richard Campbell. Hello? Yes. We, we, can, hear you. we can hear you. Go ahead. Up to five minutes. Oh, great. Okay. Hi, Chair and Council. Thank you for the opportunity to address you uh, this afternoon. So uh, regarding the Broadway plan, I guess I support it generally, but I would like to see more affordable housing and also more density and more homes in general within like 400 meters of the rapid transit station. I think that's really important, especially if it can help with affordability and enable uh, more people to live in the city. My main comments are going to be around transportation and public space, and I strongly uh, 
encourage you to support the proposed amendment uh, by uh, Councillor Boyle regarding uh, more street uh, space, uh, you know, for, for people in general and specifically active transportation lanes. I think that's a critical uh, critical component of the land, and it's a bit surprising that other municipalities are doing these, like Burnaby is including these in all new developments, and it's surprising that uh, these will actually you know, stop at the uh, the border of uh, Vancouver unless, uh, you know, this is addressed. So uh, I passed, uh, sent an email earlier today. Uh, apologies for sending it rather late, but, uh, you know, had some, <laughs> it's a lot of work and kind of digging into it. I, you know, made some realizations and specifically in the, uh, in the area around uh, Broadway, Main, uh, Canby, and Second Avenue, I had the realization that there's uh, the industrial area there, and uh, you know a great idea would be to uh, route the through traffic off the uh, arterials, uh, like Broadway, Main, um, Second, and Canby, onto the wide roads that are on the industrial area. Nobody lives those lives in there, so the uh, the noise isn't as a big concern, and it would uh, uh, enable us to get a lot of space on Main, Broadway, uh, Second, and Canby, you know, for, uh, you know, for people and green space and things that people really value on the city while still maintaining uh, essential access uh, to vehicles. So I strongly encourage you to look at that and uh, other options to make uh, the streets around, especially the transit stations, much better. You know, right now, it's Quite frankly, the roads around almost all the transit stations in Vancouver are really miserable. Many lanes of traffic. It's moving fast. It's noisy. It takes time to cross the street, and it's not particularly safe. Uh, and I sent you, uh, you know, a few images and a few examples of other cities, like like New York City and Rotterdam, where basically. Uh, you know, they're pedestrian plazas and some have buses in them, but, you know, people can walk and cross the street wherever they please. And that not only makes transit uh, more convenient to access, but it, all, it also makes it safer and also, you know, puts that, that strong message home that transit is the priority. People walking are the priority. People cycling are the priority. And people using wheelchairs or enjoying public space are the pride priority. And while that language is at a high level in the Broadway plan, it's really not uh, you know, reflected in the details of the streetscape or actually the maps that it comes out with. So I think that needs to be addressed. Uh, you know, failing that, it might not be possible in all spaces, but, you know, definitely let's not have left and right hand turns right by the transit stations. They can happen you know, on the roads before or after, uh, you know, like uh, uh, King Kingsway, Quebec, U Yukon, Ash, Hemlock and fur, and at least that would make the intersection smaller. You wouldn't have people walking, conflicting with the cars turning, and that holds up the buses, which is makes buses slower, and it's not safe for pedestrians, and it's probably frustrating for people, you know, driving as well. So I think we we can and we need to do a lot better, uh, you know, in air, air, areas like that. And I think you know broadly, this is what people want. And I think if you actually presented you know, this to people, they would get more excited. Uh, people here have been in other cities in, in North America, around the world, where they see people doing this. And, you know, especially with this huge amount of money invested, $3 billion, and who knows what the UBC line extension is going to be. I think we really need to make sure this is really a transformative process that changes the city into what we really want it to look like going forward, not just minor incremental changes on uh, you know, the city as it evolved over the last century where, you know, some of these roads were industrial roads or, you know, Broadway it was mostly car dealerships. It's not that city anymore. And we need to make sure the road uh, network and everything else adjust according to how people are using it now and how people want to uh, use it, uh, you know, in the future. So I think there's, you know, Plenty of ideas here, and I think uh, from other places, and I think doing a lot more work and, you know, uh, approving Council Boyle's motion, and I sure hope it includes the other streets as well, because certainly there's lots of options on the other arterials in the area and, and right. not just Broadway. So okay. I encourage you to support that. Thank you. Thank you. And you do have questions. Um, go ahead, Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Richard. Um, thanks for speaking. I Hi. share your enthusiasm for... Um, better streets. I guess the question, just to be clear, are you suggesting routing 
some of the traffic or all of the traffic? Are you differentiating between commercial traffic? Like apparently there's quite a lot of commercial traffic, for example, trucks, larger vehicles, as well as private vehicles on Broadway. I just want to be clear um, on what you're proposing and exactly where you would suggest those. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I think it would depend on, you know, on the streets, on the area, but certainly in the area around the, uh, um, uh, between Canby and, and Maine, there are uh, you know, seventh and eighth, you could make those one-way couplets so they could be very efficient for uh, moving traffic. There would actually even be room for protected bike lanes on them, but two lanes in each direction and general purpose traffic, including trucks, take that. And of course, if somebody, if there's essential access needed on Broadway, you know, of course they could access the businesses up there, but the through traffic, you know, would use the other streets in that case. It's probably not possible on other sections of Broadway. So, you know, measures to reduce the number of lanes uh, of traffic as I, I believe, uh, 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 Councilor Boy is suggesting in her motion it, it w- would be another. And, and and really, I think there's, you know, I guess the other thing is uh, generally there's too much in areas of the city. You really only need one lane in each direction, uh, you know, during most of the day. So, you know, let's not, you know, plan everything around when it's busy, especially as we've learned that, you know, a lot of people just, have other just options. I have, that, that, just because I have limited yeah. time, and I'm sorry to jump in, like I'm uh-huh. thinking of Park components, parts along the route, like Fairview, for example, that have really quiet residential streets, a lot of traffic calming measures already, no through ways on certain blocks um, to protect that neighborhood aspect. So that might require us to do away with some of that. And then you potentially have trucks going down some of those residential areas versus at least on one consistent area. How do you think the neighborhood would respond to well, yeah, and, and so that, that's an area where there's a quiet residential street where I don't think that would work. So I think, you know, reducing number of lanes on, on Broadway is probably the only choice. And, and, and doing, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, other measures that uh, make Broadway uh, nicer. But, you know, in, in, the, in the other area where, where there's industrial streets, I think that's where it would work. And, you know, maybe... Where, and where, over, are, the, where or, are the industrial ones specifically? Because I'm thinking like Mount Pleasant still has a fair amount of residential. Like, which part are you thinking of as being mostly oh, industrial? Oh, yeah, so the, yeah, so the or, or commercial, so the area bounded by uh, Maine, uh, can can be Broadway and Second. So that area, it's almost all industrial, and I believe the plan, or, or, or you know, commercial or, or employment. So I think the uh, I think the the idea behind the plan is that's going to remain like that. So I think there's a huge number of roads there, and they're really wide, and they aren't particularly busy. So I think that's where there's the opportunity to divert traffic off of Broadway, Maine, uh, Canby, and Second onto those roads. And actually on Second, it's actually shorter. <laughs> it would be a shorter driving distance uh, you know, through there because it's actually it's a longer distance than along Second, and, and you might be able to have fewer pedestrian lights. So it, it's something that could actually work out for okay. uh, okay. You know, most people, if not everyone. So yeah. that, that is it for Councillor Kirby Young's questions. Thanks, Councillor Kirby Young. And um, Councillor Swanson, up to three minutes. Yeah, thanks for coming in, Richard. Um, you said at the beginning that one of the things you wanted was more affordability. Do you have any ideas on how to get that? Well, you know, certainly I'm not an expert in that area, so I believe there's lots of other people that will be uh, kind of speaking on, you, you know, on on that. I, and I guess what, one option, I guess speaking to what I, I, I just talked about. So if you make Broadway quiet, quieter, uh, there, there's strong evidence that you can get higher rent, you know, for that, or people are willing to pay more. So you could actually use those higher rents to subsidize, uh, you know, uh, other apartments in that building. So essentially, it improves the financial viability. And of course, some people may be paying more, but you know, especially if it's a, a nonprofit or a government, uh, you know, run building, you're generating more revenue, which means you could subsidize more uh, people, uh, you know, for social housing or affordable housing in that building. So that would be my one idea that kind of rips off what I've, what I've been talking about. Or, or if there's more greenery on the street or it's a linear, linear park, that's going to be much more attractive to people than something along a busy street like Broadway or, or Fourth Avenue or Maine. These are horrible streets to do anything along. And anything to make them more pleasant, you know, will you know improve the uh, you know the financial performance of it, which if it's done right, can also generate more money, which can subsidize uh, other housing. Yeah. And okay, so the second question is, um, what would we lose on Broadway if we did with it what you're suggesting? I, 
I don't think we would lose anything. You would still have essential access. Uh, you know, we do already do that on a street like Granville, where deliveries, uh, you know, work just fine there. Broadway's a lot wider than Granville, so you, you know, you can accommodate buses and and and, and cycling lanes and and delivery bays, and especially, you know, if there's not general traffic on that, that just makes the street. Uh, you know, more flexible and, and, and nicer for everyone who really needs to be on, you know, on Broadway as opposed to the people that are using it just as a, a through a through street. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Swanson. And I do have a few questions. First of all, thank you so much for sending that um, email full of an unbelievably long list of suggestions around the plan. Um, really appreciate it. Um, my first question is around uh, around this idea of um, that you've got in there about um, taking car traffic or reducing car traffic on residential streets. We had a motion at council uh, that council uh, passed, I believe it might have been unanimously, um, to reallocate 11% of Vancouver streets uh, to emphasize non-car uses, uh, which would include um, active transportation, parklets, community gardens, play areas, etc. Do you think this plan uh, would be a good place to actually implement that um, that uh, policy suggestion by council? Yes. Well, yes, uh, I think that would be a, a, an excellent uh, uh, place to do it. And you know, the place where we really have street space is on these wide arterials. So if you actually want to create, you know, a, a nice park with lots of trees and uh, and other things on it, the arterials are the opportunity to do that. And I think the ones in, in the area that I've been ta talking, uh, you know, about, it, you know, that's a prime opportunity to look at, you know, those opportunities and get some really nice, nice space, uh, you know, for, for people, uh, you know, residents and people using transit and other people wanting to, you know, hang out. I think that, that would be a great way to do it. And obviously there's opportunities on, uh, residential streets. The challenge is there's narrow, and people want parking, and you need essential access. And it, it just, uh, uh, you know, the city has had challenges, uh, you know, putting real traffic calming and making the the, uh, the residential streets really green, just because they're they're narrow and there's so many other you know demands on them. Me meanwhile, just because they're you know sometimes twice as wide, almost there's just a lot more flexibility and and space to to play with on 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 the arterial streets. So I think uh, you know that that's something that we really need to look at. Under, understood about the arterial streets. Um, I'm curious, um, I, I just returned from Europe where I was um, speaking on behalf of Metro Vancouver, um, so in, in Northern Europe, uh, Denmark and Sweden, and I noticed that on their arterials, not on their arterial streets, but on their, which are very much devoted to um, active transportation, the arterials are, that is, um, uh -huh. and everything flows very smoothly. Uh, but on their uh -huh. residential streets, they've designed the streets in such a way that um, it, it, the, there can be cars that go in and move in and park in front of homes, for example, or restaurants. Mm -hmm. but the street design itself makes any kind of rapid movement impossible. I mean, it's very, very slow um, traffic. Is that is that kind of design um, design um, for pedestrians okay. and bikes that, and those kinds of, I think. Um, engineered measures what you're thinking of oh i'm sorry and i've run out of time yes or no <laughs> yeah I, I think those those would be fantastic on uh, on the residential streets right. as well and, and really right. every residential street should be a nice place to walk and cycle and right. do whatever else on. thank yeah. you mm -hmm. again yep. really appreciate you taking the time oh you're welcome well, thank you thank you very much great thanks okay. speaker 106 thanks. sal robinson hello Yes, we can hear you clearly. Go ahead. That's good. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm just getting over COVID here, so I'm coughing a bit. Um, I am Sal Robinson, and I've lived in Vancouver all my life. Uh, the last 40 years have been in Kitsilano, not far from a scary new land assembly at 8th and Trafalgar. A lot of good ideas have been raised in the many hours of this hearing, and I wonder if they came up and were somehow lost in the so-called robust public engagement. Even before the Broadway plan was presented last Wednesday, was it Wednesday? Yeah, amendments were announced and more were requested just moments later when speakers representing public bodies punched holes in it. Barrett Soren told you the plan is out of sync with existing policy on transportation priorities. 
that his committee unanimously urges an amendment to require protected bike lanes and to adhere to road use targets. Mark White told you his committee found nothing for seniors, Vancouver's fastest growing demographic. He said, our input appears to have had little impact on the framing of the Broadway plan. The Park Board is unanimous in condemning the absence of park space and recreation facilities planned for a residential area already starved of those amenities. At Tuesday's Park Board meeting, Commissioner Cooper lamented that the Park Board staff, quote, were not properly listened to or considered. I find this damning. And right from the get-go, Kit Sauter told you that the tenants he is engaged with don't trust their government. They do not trust this mayor and council. If the city's own advisory committees complain of the Broadway plan being out of sync, that their input has had little impact, and that the people they speak for don't trust you, what does that tell you about the consultation method? If robust engagement with park board staff left them feeling disregarded, what chance did someone like me have to be heard over the years of this process? The director of planning said she deems online engagement to be more equitable. If that means that there's parity in being unheard, then I guess I have to agree. I'd have thought that after the False Creek South shambles, it would be clear enough that this process is too flawed to ever produce genuine consensus. But here we are doing it again for no other reason that this is the way we do it. We're running in grooves laid down by people without, seemingly, a concept of anything finer. But that doesn't mean there isn't something finer. Instead of hours and hours of repetitive arguments ending in a vote that dismays many and satisfies nobody, how amazing would it be if this were a meeting where the speakers come and tell you how their committees worked with stakeholders to bring in their ideas and make them part of a Broadway plan owned and embraced by the people who live here? Please take a few moments to imagine a meeting like that. I've allowed a bit of time for you to reflect. I, I see no questions yeah. for you, but yeah. thank you very okay. much. No, I'm not, I'm not finished. Sorry, oh. I'm not finished yet. I'm, I was hoping that you would reflect on the possibilities of a better meeting. I read the 1977 Kitsilano Neighborhood Plan, the one that is outdated and irrelevant. These are some of the issues it addressed. Upzoning, open spaces, commercial and shopping areas, people services, loss of families, opportunities for residents to remain in the area. How are these issues not relevant now? In 1974, the city opened an office on 4th Avenue and staffed it for nearly three years. Planners and neighborhood committees worked together not only to identify and solve problems, but also to inspire dreams and make them a reality. Residents came up with plans for daycare centers, community center improvements, an ice rink, low-income and senior citizens' housing, mini parks, restoration of old homes, and a curb on demolition. How many of those things are not built into the Broadway plan? Why aren't they? I ask you to call out this manufactured consent for what it is, ignore the developer hysteria, and stare down the bully in Victoria. The Broadway plan is not good enough yet. Please send it back to your staff and demand something better. Be remembered for that kind of leadership. Thank you for listening. Thank you, and um, you do have some questions. Go ahead, Councillor Hardwick, up to three minutes. Thank you, Sal, thought-provoking. Uh, um, you referred back to the 70s when the Kitsilano plan was done. Um, we hear a lot of people say that was ancient history. Um, today, it's a different deal altogether. Um, why do you think it was important to consult with the public at that level of detail then and not now? Uh, it's absolutely important to consult with the public with that level of detail now. It's because we did it then that Kitsilano is such a great place. Um, but We're that's really missing an opportunity. What... Uh, sorry, I, I just think that, that a, a huge opportunity has been missed, and it's clear from what people are saying when they call in and, and give suggestions that that are of things that would work better than what's suggested in the plan or that, that aren't even mentioned in the plan. Well, there's two parts to this. There's the, there, there is a plan, and it's how the plan is arrived at, whether it's reflective of, of the people that live here now or whether it's reflective of, of a desire for the future. And 
I think what we've been hearing uh, in large part is that we have a huge influx of people coming in the future and we have to be get out ahead of it. Um, and so the people that are here now, um, you know, listening to them, it's just not being balanced in my view. But I'd be interested in hearing your perspective of where you think it changed the way that we approached our planning process as a lifelong resident. Um, well, I think the internet didn't do us any good. <laughs> Back when the only way to do something was to walk into a storefront and look at a map and say, wouldn't this be a better place to put that? That's how they did it in the 1970s. And now we think that just because we drop a postcard through a door and wait for somebody to go on a website, that that's consultation. Um, COVID has done us no good at all. Um, I remember going to you know public meetings at at Kitts Neighborhood House or at a community center or something, and we see a plan and we see how it's going to look. Those kinds of things are vital, and people will come up with ideas just like they've done in the last many hours of this hearing that that haven't made it into a plan. Um, the plan anticipates a huge influx of people that isn't isn't supported by any kind of, like, ancient history. For the last 50 years, Vancouver has not increase its population on average by more than 1% a year. So I don't know where all these people are going to come from, especially if they know how unaffordable it is. The pace of change is what we should be dealing with, not something unsupported and ridiculous. And we really need, first and foremost, to care about the people who live here now because we are Vancouver and we're going to try and make it the best possible place for our families down the road and the people who will eventually move here, but yeah. you've got to look after the people here first. <laughs> and and that, that is it for Councillor Hardwick's time. Um, thank thank you, you so much for um, coming to speak to us. Uh, I really appreciate it and, and uh, take care. Thanks. Speaker 107, I believe is in person. Um, uh, Jocelyn um, Bierstel. Yes, it's the one with the red light there on the, yes. Hi, um, my name is Jocelyn Bearstow. I'm here as a citizen. Um, I'm a bit concerned and I live in Kitsilano. I've lived here for 40 years by choice. Um, I've lived in three areas of the city, Kitsilano, uh, Commercial Drive and the West End. I oppose the Broadway plan. Three reasons, three main reasons. Um, I do not believe that it'll provide affordable housing for the citizens and the taxpayers, either now or in the future. Um, I do not believe that it adequately addresses the concerns of the climate emergency and sustainability. And I do not believe that it's the result of a democratic process that includes um, the people that it's going to impact. Um, I want to thank, I should have started with this, but thank you. Um, uh, sorry, I'm getting nervous. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. Um, and thank you, everybody that's stepped forward to be part of this. Three parts. One thing is what I cherish about where I live now, Kitsilano. Um, a few concerns and a, a vision that I'd like to see. What I cherish about Kitsilano. Um, uh, we, afford, we provide a lot of affordable housing. I live in West Kitsilano. We did an, an informal survey. Um, we've got 1,200 rentals between 3rd, West 5th, and 8th, um, and also the North and South Streets. Um, under the Vancouver plan, we'd also be including more, uh, a wider area, and that would include about 2,000 affordable rentals. So those would be people that would be displaced. Um, there's also some purpose-built affordable housing. Um, it's green. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm very nervous. I walk a lot. I walk this morning, and there's trees everywhere. Um, everywhere. That's healthy. I don't need, we don't need numbers. It's healthy for people. It's really healthy for mental health. During COVID, there were people everywhere. Everywhere, under trees, in parks, on the beaches. Everywhere. We, we, we have... We have a beautiful city. I would love, I don't want to say I'm a rich person in that area. I would love that there's lots of green space 
in the, you know, the 465 blocks of the Broadway plan. For Pete's sakes, they need place for their children. Ah. Um, yeah, and there were trees for people to get shade during the heat dome last summer. I could go on. Um, it's an ecosystem and it's a community. You've heard from lots of people from Kitsilano. We are a community. I haven't been a big contributor, but I'm here now. I'm starting. Um, our plan reflects the work of so many hours of so many people. Are we irrelevant? <laughs> the sidewalk outside of my house, it was laid in 1926. Somebody duked it out to get a sidewalk. Our street is wide. I don't know who designed the street. I haven't been to the archives yet, but are those people irrelevant? There's, there's, I don't know, half a dozen benches in our park. You guys, your council, you guys, you put a bunch of benches. You calmed our street last June. Thank you. There's been 30 years of citizens, my husband included, who worked to, to make our street livable for the people that are really lucky to live there. That's what I love about Kitsilano. Dogs, cats, crows. We evicted a squirrel. It cost us $1,200. We've never done an eviction. My husband lived in the house in 1983. We've only paid once to have somebody evicted. It was a squirrel. We, we hired AAA wildlife. <laughs> um, my concerns. It's not about affordable homes. You guys have heard the, everybody else speak. It's not about affordability. It's not what it's about. I studied public policy in Ottawa. I was in public policy in three social policy areas in the province for 20 years. It's not all truthful. It's not all lies either. But there's lots of stuff being spun. Come on. Um, it doesn't address the housing needs of average people, the gig economy, the ones that are on their bicycles. Um, you know, the people that are disabled, the vulnerable. There's lots vulnerable. Um, doesn't address the needs of seniors. Uh, the average age in Vancouver is 42.2. 25% of the population um, is, is, is a senior. Um, it represents, it doesn't represent people between 50 and whatever their end of the life is. That's a lot of people. Um, it favors, sorry, favors investors, local and foreign. Favors money launderers. Um, it favors numbered com companies, people who may not be, maybe not as honest as some of us. If you could just wrap it up here, just for your time. Um, what I'd like, I'd like us to pause. I can send you references on that. There's lots out there about stopping and pausing. Sorry, but it, it, Minneapolis, um, Krista Tippett, there's lots of documented stuff on pausing. Um, sorry, um, that, we, that we take the summer off. Everybody takes summer holidays, two and a half years. You guys have worked for four years. You've worked like hell, obviously. Look at the work you've done. Take the summer off. Come back in September. Say no to the Broadway plan. Yes, it's got good things, but don't do it, please. We come back. We, you know, I am October so 15th, sorry. we vote. I, you are so over time. I'm so sorry. sorry. I have to be fair to everyone. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us and Thank being you. here in person. Thank you. Uh, speaker 108, I believe, is also in person, Virginia Richards. Good afternoon, councillors and mayor, or is he not here today? Anyway, uh, it's people like Jocelyn, who I've never met till sitting here today, that inspires me to keep trying to make this city better. And I'm here to oppose the Broadway plan. And I just, my message today is to city councillors. And I think you're being fooled. I've got, I'm going to tell you a few stories. Many have stated, and I've heard some of you, saying that the Broadway plan will solve unaffordable rental housing. These same people say the solution is to build, build, build. Make the city higher and denser. It is a better solution than creating low-rise condo. And it will accommodate new growth along a transit route via the Broadway plan. I disagree. Our West End neighbours experience with West End Community Plan should be a warning of what's to come for those living around Broadway from Clark to Vine and 1st to 16th and the rest of the city from east to west. It's been a history in the city that we've had con uh, concerted and very 
active consultation. We had that for the West End Community Plan. Uh, we did for two years. And I was one of those West End champions. Uh, so at 2011, 13, and it was very active. We engaged with a lot of the community. We got to know each other well. And it was very neighborly. The new West End Community Plan allowed construction of units to accommodate, this is the city's calculation, an anticipated seven to 10,000 additional residents over 30 years from 2013 to 2043. Well, we are well on the way there. As soon as the plan was adopted, the city withdrew all public outreach and engagement resources and even now is paying limited attention to neighborhood concerns. It has completely lost control, was flooded by development and rezoning applications as soon as the West End Community Plan was passed. Well, actually, it was before it was passed. It was a gold rush, and I mean a gold rush. Developers bought every piece of property along Alberni and Robson that was possible to develop. Yes, the uptake of the West End Community Plan rezoning and development policy may have been faster than originally anticipated by the city. It is certainly faster than anticipated by the community and the West End neighbours. And as soon as the West End community plan was adopted, the media tone changed. The secret was out. They quickly understood what the West End community plan was really all about. In nine years since November 2013, there's been a wave of development and change. Eviction of renters involving relocation by voluntary, both voluntary and involuntary, and demolitions of older and more, offend, more affordable rental build buildings, property tax increases, retail business closures, multiple construction projects, and dozens of development applications. View cones have been pierced, shadowing of neighboring buildings, roads and traffic is increasing, and privacy being lost, creating reduced livability for those who currently live in the West End. It's been suggested by some in the community that the West End Community Plan reflected a compromise whereby construction of tall towers on the edges of the community would be acceptable, while lower and less dense de development would be directed toward the inner portions of the neighborhood. A compromise of this nature was never discussed with the community during the West End Community Plan discussions. And I was there for every meeting except one. And all my other West End neighbours, founders and directors and members were there as well. Rather, the plan was intended to allow for an increase in density in the whole neighbourhood to accommodate the city-defined target of an additional 10,000 residents, this while respecting all parts of the West End, because it's our focus with the West End neighbours to consider the whole of the West End and to work to improving it for the good of all, making it a better place in which to live to learn and play. Sadly, so, not so the city. And in fact, the, the uh, additional population of over 30 years, from 7,000 to 10,000, has in fact uh, been absolutely <laughs> demolished. The projects approved or in progress is already 25,627 residents and there's still 21 years to go. So I am just warning you, councillors, that this will be another gold rush around Broadway plan and all the, all the streets, the arterias that feed into it. Uh, you, you are just um, at your time, but Sorry. you have questions coming. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hardwick, go ahead for three minutes. Councillor Hardwick, you may be muted. Thanks, sorry, just starting now. Um, I wanna be really clear on this. You asked an early question. Uh, you said what this is really all about. What is it really all about? Well, I think the city is, needs a tax base and uh, it's a bit short of cash and the developers will be happy to give it to them if uh, give them the cash, if they will approve this increased density and these towers. And I guess that will help pay for the, uh, the subway. And I think people are unrealistic. They don't realize how these things are linked together. And we need to learn to understand that as citizens. So I'd like to, uh, I very 
yes, very strongly think that's what it's all about. You mentioned in the West End plan that there were targets. Did you say the original targets were 7,000 and then increased to 10,000? And yet, already during the period, there's 25,000 units? That's right. Units? Uh, the, it was anticipated 7,000 to 10,000 additional residents over 30 years. And it's now already 25,627 uh, applications have been approved or are in progress. So to what do you attribute that? Um, it, that's more than double. In fact, that's triple the uh, original um, estimates. Well, I can, I guess one could say you, you, all of you would know better, but I imagine they underestimated the targets. And, um, and the tower pace has gone a little faster than maybe people thought. Uh, maybe they're denser, maybe the, the, the suites are smaller because they need to get, the developers need to make money too. So it's just a piling on of things, and it's, it's foolish to think that this Broadway plan is going to create affordable housing. It is not going to create affordable housing because, anyway, because it's not. <laughs> well, but presumably because of land inflation. Well, that's true, but, yes. But uh, riddle me this. We've heard consistently that there's a 1% per annum uh, uh, population increase. If there were... A projection uh, targets of uh, seven to ten thousand, and there's now twenty five thousand new units in the West End. Using this as an example, how can that be? Um, are there a lot of empty units? Because that's hard to reconcile. Yeah, there are a lot of empty units. I can see we live right in the thick of it all, and yes, you can see there are a lot of empty units, and um, uh, it, it's very disappointing. And I guess to some people, it's just the cost of owning a place here. It's their investment. It's just the cost of having an investment. So uh, just in sum, the West End plan is a cautionary tale for us with the Broadway plan. Absolutely. And that's why I'm here today. And, um, and I hope that you will all consider this because I know, I know the intention is from councillors is to create more affordable rental housing. But there is more to consider. And that's, what, that's the main reason I'm opposing this plan. And I think we can do better, and I think you can all do better, and I think we need to have some consultation that has not taken place in the Broadway plan. I mean, just because I live in the so, West End. I'm so sorry. Councillor Hardwick is out of time oh, for okay. questioning. Sorry. Um, thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank, you. thank you very much for coming to in person um, to speak <laughs> to council and to answer those questions. Um, council, we are thank you. Um, at 4.55. I don't think there's time for another speaker. Um, so I think we, we should, because there would be absolutely no time for questioning. Um, so I'm going to suggest that we end now and that we, um, that we reconvene. So um, recess until Tuesday, May 31st, 2020. Pardon me? Oh, ah, ha, ha. I'm, I, you're right. We're coming back at six. We're recessing for uh, one hour, <laughs> not five oh, days. Do that. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess I got into my head yesterday. Script was for two hours. Um, so yes, we are we are just re recessing till six, and um, and we'll uh, go through to ten tonight. Have a good dinner break.
To join the conference, enter your access code followed by the Hi, Denise, can you hear me? <clears throat> I can hear you. Okay, thanks. Oh. That's <laughs> Colleen. <laughs> thanks, Counselor Hardwick. We can hear you. I'll just be here. I'm just here in the background. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Hi, Elise. Yes, I can hear you. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>
everyone. Um, hope you had a good dinner. Uh, we are reconvening um, to uh, start with number speaker number 109 on the list, Kevin Liang. Kevin Liang on the line. Speaker 109 is not on the line yet, Mayor, uh, Chair Carr. Thank you. Speaker 110 is withdrawn. Speaker 111, Joan Bunn. Not on the line. Speaker 112, Lorna Shapiro. Not, oh, just a second. No, but uh, Chair Carr, I'm just seeing we may have a slight issue if you could just um, pause for a moment. No problem. We're still just sorting through um, an audio issue. Denise, can you hear me? Hi, yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Just letting everyone know there's a bit of a technical difficulty with the um, line for the speaker. So uh, we're just, it'll just be a few moments, um, we hope, to get that sorted out. Okay, because it was a bit of a technical glitch with the uh, speaker's line, I'm going to start again with speaker number 109. Is Kevin Liang on the line? Speaker 109 is not on the line. Okay, speaker 110 is withdrawn. Speaker 111, Joan Bunn. No for speaker 111. Okay, Speaker 112, Lorna Shapiro. Hi, I'm Lorna. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Uh, go ahead, you have to, oh. up to five minutes. Good, thanks very much. Thanks for the opportunity to address you today, City Council. I appreciate it. I've lived in Carrickdale for 34 years, and I haven't been um, an activist in any way. Uh, but I'm sufficiently distressed by what's been happening to the city I love over the past 15 years that I'm here to talk to you today. Uh, we moved to Vancouver in 1988, settling in Caresdale, where our neighbors were other middle class working people. Our children walked to local schools and they played in local parks. We parents formed a community that knew and cared for each other. Some of us were renters, some of us were owners, but all of us were Vancouverites committed to creating community. That reality over the past 15 years has given way to a housing market 
that seems to me to be driven by investors and speculators, ably assisted by developers happy to build housing that is unaffordable to middle-income citizens. I see affordable rentals being torn down as the city taxes properties based on the most intense possible use of the land. Real estate agents that I talk to speak of servicing an investor class these days who are buying up multiple properties. New developments such as Oak Ridge are built with 85% of the housing designed to serve not Vancouverites living and working here, but foreign buyers and local investors. Our children, working professional couples with two incomes and raising children, are unable to afford to live in Vancouver. I believe you don't, that you don't want this to continue, that you do want to address affordability. Certainly I do, and I've heard many of the speakers so far today speaking to that issue. We have to find a way to make Vancouver affordable. The Broadway plan, as I see it, will take Vancouver further down the path of being a marketplace for investors and speculators. It will make living here even less possible for middle-income citizens that I think we're trying to help. And why, are we, why will it be less affordable? Because high-rise developments will fuel the speculation in land and greatly reduce the livability of all the neighborhoods along the corridor. So I oppose moving forward with this plan and propose instead that city planners be asked to work with community members and develop alternate strategies for consideration. Let's not see just one strategy being presented. Let's see some alternate ones. And in doing so, let's look at the possibility of low-rise densification, where we can maintain the beautiful ambiance of this city that all of us love to be part of. We want to answer these questions. How many resident Vancouverites are we trying to accommodate? We heard the woman from the West End talking about all the housing units that have been built, but many of them don't seem to have people living in them. What's the capacity of current housing units and those that are already under construction? And what's the shortfall and how best can we meet it with affordable housing, not high rises that are $2,000 to $2,500 a square foot, and not destroy the ambiance of this amazing city. So I'm not a professional, I'm just a very concerned citizen who wants to not see this amazing city turned into a, just a concrete American focused type of city. That's what I have to say for today. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for speaking to council. There are no questions for you. That was very clear. Thank you. Speaker 113, Chris White. listening to me today, uh, Mayor and Council and Chair. Um, my name's Chris White, and I commend you for your focus, your curiosity, and the commitment you're demonstrating to this process. It's not an easy task. I'm not in favor of the plan, primarily because it fails to ensure sufficient affordability and neighborhood resilience throughout the Broadway corridor, and also because the process of resident engagement has been less than fully transparent. I'm a resident of False Creek South, bordering the Broadway Corridor, as you well know. My family has lived here for over 40 years in two housing co-ops. Together, we've grown and matured with a strong sense of belonging that co-ops clearly foster. My needs are changing, as are the needs of my neighborhood. 
I'm a retired medical social worker and have worked in three health regions. I currently provide mental health education and conflict resolution services on behalf of member co-ops with the Co-op Housing Federation of BC. As a resident of False Creek South, I learned a lot from the city's engagement, planning process, and development proposals for False Creek that went before you last October. The lessons learned and unanimously approved by you about the future of False Creek can certainly inform the plan before you now. As a brief reminder, these included design principles to create social and spatial equity that ensures community cohesiveness, ensuring enduring park and green space, development principles that increase density by specifying the development first of existing vacant lands, maintaining existing housing as long as possible, knowing that the most affordable housing is that which already exists, targeting a specific income mix of one-third lower middle and income uh, lower middle and in- higher income residents living together, building more co-op housing and specifically committing to working with the nonprofit sector to build affordable housing. My needs include remaining in and preserving my neighborhood in Falls Creek while enhancing its social, environmental, and cultural resilience. This means deliberately making it more cohesive and inclusive, definitely increasing its population, making it safer and more accessible, and ensuring its future economic viability for everyone. The question is, does the Broadway plan accomplish both existing and future residents' needs for sustained neighborhood resilience, for economic viability for all, and especially affordability? My most important comment to you tonight is that I believe the plan doesn't offer this future for everyone who Council was elected to represent. The plan needs to create greater affordability. You've heard expert opinions suggesting that achieving even moderate affordability for currently defined low-income residents is quite a stretch. Given Council's approved framework agreement last July delineating co-op lease land cost calculations based on the average Vancouver rental income, there is no guarantee that this formula will work. Patrick Condon's suggestions that the plan should incorporate the land lift opportunities available, should obtain additional expert opinion on how to realize land lift opportunity, and formalize, not just encourage nonprofit property development are three specific ways the plan could be improved. Raising the minimum affordability targets from 20 to 50% is achievable and, I'd say, necessary. There are other aspects of the plan that need improvement, namely a model of construction that is primarily wood-based, which means, yes, lower-rise buildings, but again, from expert comments to you, I believe that's achievable. There are suggestions to phase develop closely around station hubs first, allowing existing rental stock elsewhere to be protected as long as possible. I'd also encourage specific amendments that increase available public space and amenities and both pedestrian and, if possible, bicycle access along Broadway. I'd like to end by reflecting on others' comments and my own experience living in my neighbourhood and in my cooperative. Deciding to live in my co-op was a deliberate decision, one based on, yes, a strong sense of social responsibility, but also on an economic decision to trade opportunity over ownership. This included the opportunity to place a child in a special school that Vancouver offered, of working closer to home and commuting by bike, and working in a profession that offered inspiration over income. None of this is particularly unique, but would not have been possible without the opportunity to live in a viable community that needs to continue to be sustainable, affordable, and resilient. I urge you... Yes, I'm sorry, you are over time. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> Super. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was a, that. Yeah, you were very clear in uh, in the in your points you raised. Though, thank you so much for speaking to council. You're welcome. Um, speaker one fourteen, Robert Heyman. The speaker is not on the line. Great. Thank you, Speaker one fifteen, Celine McRae Hamby. Yes. 
Celine? Can you hear me? Ah, yes, we can. Go ahead. Up to five minutes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Celine. I'm a resident of Vancouver. I was born after Expo 86, moved here after the Olympics, but before the Women's World Cup. And I'm calling, and I, a renter calling in support of the Broadway plan because, frankly, we don't like if you're a, like somebody like me or the generation like me, we don't have time for all this dithering. I'd like to. To this point, I'd like to address a couple of myths that I've heard today and in the past that I really want to reframe because I think people are missing the bigger picture. The first myth I'd like to address is that the size of this uh, zone is unfathomable. This is about 8.6 square kilometers for the Broadway plan. But I really want to emphasize that this is, this is about half the size of the downtown Montreal area. So in total, even if, with this NC plus downtown Vancouver, we'd still be smaller than the downtown of Montreal. And if people want to say that Montreal is an unlivable or unsadly large dystopian megalopolis, let them say it, but I don't think they could say it with a straight face. The second myth I'd like to address is that there hasn't been enough engagement or that this, uh, the engagement process has somehow been undemocratic. 3,500 Vancouverites filled out the survey in response to the Broadway plan's final iteration, and that doesn't include all the people who engaged with it at earlier stages. That means that one in 200 Vancouverites, that's including all adults and children, have engaged with the surveys in, this, uh, in the Broadway plan. And out of the people who filled out that survey, two-thirds uh, were supportive of the Broadway plan, in, uh, and that's two-thirds in every neighborhood, supported the plan either in full or in part, and over 50% said they thought the plan would make their community better. So the question I have for you is, if we're never, uh, the myth I'd like to address is that we need to achieve consensus. We're never going to achieve consensus because there are people that have entrenched value, there are people have entrenched interests and those that do not. And if we want to have an engagement process only to have like 3,500 people come in and two-thirds of them say they're broadly in support and you've got 200 people call in, even if every person other than me opposed this plan, why would you let those 200 people veto a plan that 3,500 people had broadly supported? If you want to have engagement, what's the point if you can just throw it out if you don't like the answer? The third myth I'd like to address is that we have time to delay or more time to work on this or develop experiments. There's been a housing crisis in some form or another since, depending on how you ask, 1980s and the 1990s. There is a climate crisis that has been identified by the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change since 1992. And after, after wasting 30 plus years, we don't have the time to dither on the deck chairs in the Titanic oh, in the next 28 years to 2050. It's a housing crisis and a climate crisis, not a discomfort, a crisis. The fourth myth I'd like to address is that density on its own drives gentrification. If that were true, if that were true, then single family home neighborhoods in Vancouver would be affordable or not gentrified, but you can't buy a house in anywhere in the city of Vancouver for less than $1 million. And if that isn't gentrification, what is? Gentrification has happened no matter whether you have density or not. So we need to run away from the myth that density is the one causing this. And maybe look at the factor that we have a space, we have limited land and an increasing population in the third largest city in a G7 nation. The fifth myth I'd like to address is that the myth that people who live out of the Broadway corridor plan don't deserve the same protections as those who do. The people, longtime renters, uh, what they fear or describe as their nightmare, the circumstances that they are describing is what Vancouverites of every, of every flavor uh, experience every day if you live in a secondary unit. But I could have my tenancy ended with a two months notice by my landlord, and, and that is in a place that my, my two roommates and I rent a two bedroom for 30000 a year. That's perfectly legal. Under every regulation you passed, under every regulation in order, if it, was un -okay, if it wasn't okay for me, why is it too, uh, too brutal for the people who have lived in these neighborhoods for 40 years? 
The neighborhoods in question are already unaffordable to anyone who hasn't been entrenched for 40 years. But if you want to get a one-bedroom apartment in Kitsilano, you'd be lucky to find a rat-infested one-bedroom for less than $2,000 now. And just realize that, you know, maybe it's a dislocation for some to have to find a new place, but for others, it's literally what we have to do every year because landlords are allowed to end tenancies at the end of the fixed period or on a month-to-month basis. And we need to let, if the councillors think the existing policies are too brutal to expose the Broadway corridor of renters to, they are perfectly free to pass more renters' protection that affects all Vancouverites. Yeah. But why do some people think they are entitled to have the benefit of living next to an urban core with none of the trade-offs? People, I appreciate that they may have, uh, people might be used to how their neighborhood used to be in the 1970s, but the Vancouverites of today can't live in the nostalgia of retirees and millionaires of yesteryear. Those are the, those are the five myths I want to uh, correct before you make your decision. I don't want to let misinformation or a myopic view of what it's like to live in Vancouver shape your decision. There are people, the people that will turn your bedpans, clean your houses, but, you know, be your firefighters, engineers, every employee, everyone you rely on will have to live here somewhere in the next 30 years. And if your answer is maybe they should go live out in a different part of the city but commute in, all you're doing is just saying climate, the climate change crisis, it's not urgent, it's totally fine, someone else's problem. That is all I have to say. Thank you, and please take the uh, big picture view of this issue. Thank you. That was very well timed. Um, I really appreciate your comments. There are no questions, but you were extremely clear. Thanks a lot. Speaker 116, Helen Salter. The presentation is loaded as well. First, I want to express my respect for the Coast Salish peoples, and particularly respect for their elders. For over 40 years, I have lived on their beautiful and unsurrendered homelands, the homelands of the tsleil the Musqueam, and the Squamish. My name is Helen Salter, and I'm opposed to the plan as it is presented. I live in Vancouver, in the Broadway plan area at 3rd and U. I am asking you, Council, to demand one more round of public information before voting on this plan. I will use two recent publications from the city to illustrate what has been missing from the public information campaign. First, this is the postcard I received in February about the final phase of public consultation. The time allowed for feedback was very short, only three weeks. The text doesn't even read properly. And this is a very generic communication, looking like any other from city planning. There is no indication whatsoever of the massive changes being proposed under this plan. It doesn't say, for example, did you know that we are proposing concrete towers up to 20 stories high and up to two per block for your neighborhood? And that council will be voting on this proposal in May 2022. What do you think? We want to hear from you. No, it doesn't say anything like that. Next slide. And here is the Broadway plan summary and highlights document. This is an eight and a half by 11 brochure, four pages, which I found by chance at my local library two weeks ago. I know you can't read the details on the slide, but I assume that you're all familiar with this brochure. Next slide. First, I want to draw your attention to the date. At the top, we see the brochure is dated May 2022. This is very late to be providing a summary. And at the bottom, we see under what's next, the Broadway plan is scheduled to go to City Council in May 2022, the very same month as the publication. In fact, Council was originally supposed to vote on the plan last Wednesday, May 18th. Next slide. Now look at the graphics. This is really more of a marketing brochure than a public information bulletin. There's nothing here that shows the massive scale of the changes being proposed. The words tower, skyscraper, or even high rise are never used in this brochure, and there are no pictures of them. Concrete is never mentioned. 
You have to read the text in the rest of this brochure quite carefully to even find the proposed building heights for the various areas. This is why the graphics of Stephen Bohus are all over the Internet. The city hasn't provided the information that people need in the right format at the right time. It has not shown graphically the overall plan height or the expected build-out at 5, 10, 20, and 30 years. So again, councillors, I am asking you to demand one more round of public information on this plan before voting on it, to address succinctly, directly, and graphically the legitimate concerns citizens have raised about this plan. This round can answer the questions that have been raised by many speakers. Why is the number of affordable rental units so low when the total development is so huge? Why is there so little social housing? Why are there so few co-op housing units? How will renter protections be enforced? Where will renters go when their buildings are demolished? How will this area, already underserved, be livable without new parks, schools, or community centers? What is the expected build-out in 5, 10, 20, 30 years? What will it really look like standing on the corner of, say, Broadway and Heather, or 8th and Carolina, or 3rd and U? Why are very tall concrete towers being proposed when one of the stated goals of the plan is to reduce operational and embodied emissions of buildings? These are difficult questions. No doubt about it, but they must be answered. Thank you for listening to me. Um, and thank you um, for both speaking to council and the presentation. You do have some questions. So just uh, if you would stay on the, mi- on the line, please. Councillor Hardwick, over to you for three minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I was wondering, had you sent your slides in to share with council? I haven't, but I can. I'd appreciate it. Um, you know, sometimes these things pass us by and we don't have as close a look as you have. And uh, I'd, I'd appreciate it if you'd send them to council. I will do that. Thanks very much. Great. Um, thank you. Those are, that's your, your questions. But again, very much appreciate you coming to speak. Thank you. Speaker 117, Chris Kyle. Not on the line. Okay, Speaker 118, Susan Tom. Yes. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Go ahead, up to five minutes. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Susan Tom. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. As a resident of Fairview, I oppose the Broadway plan in its current form. What I don't understand is why city staff would consider putting 50,000 people in a 500-block area of the Broadway corridor over the next 30 years without proper neighborhood-based planning. This massive increase in density would destabilize communities as neighborhoods are distinct, and this plan should not take a cookie-cutter approach. Mostly what we've been hearing from supporters is that they simply want more density and affordable housing. There is the blind trust that the proposed plan will give them the needed affordable housing to increase density without understanding the full impact of the Broadway plan and whether massive high rises will actually deliver the affordability that renters desperately need. We've heard from numerous speakers that there are other options for achieving density with low to mid-rise buildings throughout the city without resorting to 20, 30, 40-story towers. Just look at the Olympic Village as one example. Another major controversy is the erosion of existing affordable odor housing stock. The potential displacement of renters through demo eviction is real. As such, The last-minute proposal of a tenant protection plan is clearly an indication that the Broadway plan was not well thought out, and now developers must buy into this ambiguous plan as they are the ones that will have to pay. Critics have called this plan pie-in-the-sky, fantasy land, and some developers are even saying this plan may not be viable. Just where do developers plan to relocate displaced renters in a housing market where the vacancy is at 1%? 
And will developers actually be willing to pay? Who will enforce this ambiguous plan? Many of us who oppose the Broadway plan do support more affordable housing and growth. The issue is how we do it. So I hope, council members, you will consider the following amendments. One, build low to mid-rise buildings instead. Not only will massive towers increase property value and erode existing affordable housing, but they are also disastrous for climate change. Concrete and steel towers are major culprits of greenhouse gas emission. According to the International Energy Agency, high-rise buildings are directly or indirectly responsible for nearly 40% of all greenhouse gas emission. It also contradicts the city's climate emergency action plan. Let's not forget the heat dome last summer that killed hundreds of people, the devastation of forest fires each year, and the horrific results of atmospheric rivers. Global warming is with us. You and I will not be around to see what will happen to planet Earth if we don't do something about climate change now. But I do worry for our children and our grandchildren. Two, include new public amenities and infrastructure into the plan. There needs to be the addition of new schools, parks, community centers for children and families to thrive and grow. After waiting 10 years, the communities of Yale Town and Olympic Village still don't have adequate numbers of public schools for their population. Three, bring back neighborhood-based planning. First of all, do not arbitrarily repeal the eight neighborhood plans that are already in place. Years of work have gone into them. And we must engage local residents if we are to move forward with the next step of the Broadway plan. These are our communities and our homes. The feelings of many residents is that the city is only concerned about increasing density to extract CACs and DCLs from developers at the expense of Vancouver residents. Vancouver is my home. I love the beauty and the character of the city. Please, take an incremental and measure approach with the Broadway plan. Let's pause and ask city staff to make these amendments. Let's protect the heart and soul of Vancouver. It's what makes this city beautiful. We need to restore the trust and the confidence in our democracy. Thank you for listening. And thank you for, for your presentation. You do have questions? Councillor Hardwick, up to three minutes. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, I have been asking many of the speakers, uh, I've said, first of all, the subway is coming no matter what. Um, and what do we do instead? And I think you've answered that question in a succinct way. Just want to make sure I got it right. One, low to mid rise. Um, two is um, amenities. And three is neighborhood based planning. Yes, right? that's correct. So to- yeah, I was going to say, um, Councilor Hartwick, there's one other additional thing I would add to that, and that is we do have the time to pause. My understanding is that our population growth for a, for a number of years now is at 1%. That's about like 7,000 people. And we do have a number of developments currently in the pipeline. We've just approved the rezoning recently on 1477 West Broadway. There's the Birch Project on West Broadway and also 1395 West Broadway. And there's the Jericho Lands and the former Molson Brewery site. And just yesterday, the uh, Squamish Nations, 11 Towers. Um, So there are developments in the pipeline. So we can take a more incremental and measure approach to the Broadway plan. So it's not either or, it's how much, how big, how fast, basically. Um, um, thank you. I thought you, you did a very good job. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. That is um, it for your questions. I appreciate you taking the time to, to speak to council. Thank you. Speaker 119, Bruce McLaren. Welcome. Okay, my name is Bruce McLaren. 
regarding the public consultation process for the Broadway plan. Honorable Mayor, Chairperson, and Councillors. Slide one, please. It's up. The use of surveys for public consultation has become predominant. The interpretations are quoted by Planning and Council with increased frequency. Last week, the U.S. National Women's Soccer Team was awarded pay equity with the men's team. I reflected upon the wisdom of a university professor for statistical mathematics. Her integration of social issues such as gender pay equity piqued the interest of both the female and male students. We were exposed to how our innate biases affected most areas of a survey build. Purity of the data was sacrosanct. It is possible, often unintentionally, to skew survey data to such an extent that the result is grossly in error. Generally, the more complex issues required more complex survey designs. This could involve multi-day user focus groups. A question. What would you consider a moderate increase to your mortgage or rent? A half percent, two percent, ten percent, something else? Note, plus two percent equals a debt collapse for some households. What about a moderate building height increase survey question? The question did not include any parameters. Reviewing the plan, the height increase is 50% and more. If a 50% rent or mortgage increase cannot be defined as moderate, how can the non-specific survey answer results be of any value? Slide two. The public participation process for the Broadway plan and building block Vancouver plan is deeply flawed. Question Pro is an American company with numerous large corporate clients and is contracted to provide the basic structure. There remains a user requirement, Vancouver City Hall, to provide appropriate content, implement the survey, and properly conduct analysis to provide accurate data. In a democratic society, this process should be done with transparency. That city planning staff are the authors or conduct the survey build is not information that is provided on the surveys. Likewise, the data collection and analysis is not credited. Slide three, please. This does explain what could have been a planner's unintended survey content biases. Staff at the planning department presumably put solid effort into realizing the plans they are tasked with. Much of their contact would be with other staff and possibly commercial developers. It would be exceedingly difficult for anyone in that position to provide input from a point of impartiality. The city's director of planning answered a councillor's question about the adequacy of public consultation during the pandemic. Theresa O'Donnell stated that she thought it's more equitable. Producing the plan, the survey, and controlling the online feedback is an interesting take on equitable, defined as fair and impartial. So who benefits? A planning remark by a speaker on the 18th of May. Brent Tadarian is a former chief planner for the city of Vancouver and consulting for a property owner affected by the future Broadway zoning. Brent spoke clearly and with authority as someone with over 30 years planning experience. Brent stated that, People in opposition to plans always say that the process is flawed. That statement brokers no room for introspection. Also, it is triggering for me as a specialist who has been seconded internationally after catastrophes that resulted in the loss of many lives. There are no flaws and anyone who says otherwise is wrong. Fixed mindset was too often a root cause of those catastrophes. Public consultation and council debate for the massive plan needs to be based on rational participation process and good data. Neither applies. Slide four, please. Council should consider improve the data with the consultation process. Integrate the plan with the 6,000 unit Squamish First Nation development. If survey results are to be included in the decision making that a forensic audit of previous surveys be conducted. Options for moving forward, perfect the data, add a neutral third-party consultant that oversees all aspects of future surveys, or utilize planning staff, survey methodology in conjunction with the Volunteer Residents Association input to build out the public consultation process. There are ways to move forward, 
both fairly and together. Thank you. Perfectly timed. And you do have questions? Go ahead. Well, first of all, I, thank you. I, first of all, um, I'd appreciate it if you would make your slides and, and uh, text of your talk uh, available to council. But I'm curious, what's your, what is your background? Um, well, as I mentioned, uh, university program for statistical mass. Uh, I don't have uh, a specialty in um, urban planning or anything like that. Um, and if there's more information required, I'd be pleased to uh, speak with council off camera about countries I've lived in, authoritarian governments I've worked under, uh, passports I hold, um, and former other councils that I've dealt with, because I have a lot of information. Uh, well, um, that's excellent, uh, being a big fan of data and evidence-based decision-making. Uh, thank you very much. I'd be keen in uh, learning more and appreciate you sharing with council. Thank you Pleasure. very much. And that is it for your questions, but thank you very much for um, both presenting and, and coming in to council. Yes, nice. It's kind of a dystopian process here. It's, it reminds me of a Vancouver movie set or something. Well, it is a pleasure to have somebody from the public come. Nice to see you. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Speaker 120, Evan Allegretto. Hi there. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, absolutely. Go uh, ahead. Hi, hi, Mayor and Council. It's uh, Evan Allegretto. I'm the president of Intracorp in BC. I'm just calling in uh, in support of the Broadway plan. I um, you know, generally, I would say there's a lot of good things in the plan. There's one thing that I would like staff to consider, or, or council to consider. Um, in the plan, there's a, a two two tower limit on all the blocks. And you know what what I'm concerned about with that limitation is that with all the um, different um, variables in the plan, with the shadowing, the heritage. Um, the soul, the uh, view cones, and uh, some other concepts of the plan. That there's going to be pockets of the Broadway area uh, that development's only going to occur where there's the most amount of uh, density achievable. And the reason why that is going to occur because um, where the tenant protection requirements uh, that are likely going to occur, um, the you know, for development to occur, you're going to need the full density that's in the Broadway plan. Uh, so there's going to be a whole bunch of um, a rush to to have development in these pockets in the Broadway plan, and limiting these these um, blocks to just two towers. I think is going to be a missed opportunity um, because the economics are going to work now. It's probably going to work for the long term in these pockets, and if there's only two towers per block. There's going to be an even further rush for landowners trying to uh, position themselves to be the, 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 the like the towers on these blocks. Uh, so it's asking council to consider removing the two tower requirements on blocks and letting you know the typical Vancouver policies such as you know um, maximum floor plate, tower separation, setbacks to pr prevail in the blocks, not a two tower requirement. Um, the other thing, um, you know, have staff to consider or council to consider is uh, I think most of you know I'm a, I don't I support uh, shadow or the shadow requirements on retail streets. Um, you know, I generally I would say I'm in full support of shadowing on, or limiting shadowing on parks and schools. But currently the plan, um, you know, it's again providing more sh uh, limiting shadowing on retail streets, which then limits the, a significant amount of housing that can be provided um, in the plan long term. So I just, you know, prioritizing shadowing on retail streets or is it housing? In my view, I think housing is more important than retail, uh, shadowing on retail streets, especially because, like I said, we have four plate maximums, power separation, and, and that the, you know, the sun obviously moves. So, you know, there's always going to be solar experience on the retail streets. So that's just my two comments. Um, and again, I want to generally say that I'm in full support of the plan. Thank you so much. Uh, I just uh, want to ask council for those two considerations. Okay. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much. If you don't mind staying on the line, do you have some questions? Yes. 
Councillor DiGenova, go ahead up to three minutes. Hi, Evan. Thanks so much for speaking to Council. I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm going to try and get through both of these questions, but on the tower requirement, the two towers per block, are you concerned that, that this is a large plan and you know how often this plan will be reviewed so we could, in fact, uh, be in a situation where this isn't meeting the needs of our population growth in the future? Yeah, I just, I think the plan, I think it's a 30 or 40 year plan, um, but the plan has, you know, it's, it's trying to balance everything. And there's, I think there's only going to be pockets of development in the Broadway plan that where you can balance everything. And by limiting these pockets to two towers per block, it's just a lost opportunity for housing. And it's, you know, it's also going to be a lost opportunity for landowners because the people that aren't paying attention right now, you know, they're, they're going to lose out because, you know, whoever's paying attention first and they're going to have their two towers on probably 150 feet each, that's only 300 feet on a full block. Um, yeah, that's a huge loss opportunity long term. Okay, so you've addressed that question on the long term. And then you mentioned the sh the shadow. Um, I think you had you had said the shadow requirements. Do you consider that? So right now we have a shadow policy, or we have a shadow bulletin. It's not technically a shadow policy. I understand from our staff that there's interpretations and in some other plans, like the West End plan. But do you see the shadow bulletin being something that you're given and told? Here's a bulletin. Please try and consider it, or is it being um, is it being interpreted as policy? Is that how you see it? The council's already passed. Yeah. So the bulletin is the shadow bulletin that we're, I think you're referencing to is in the West End, and it's a staff enforced bulletin, and. It's, in our interpretation, it's supposed to be minimized shadowing, but staff interpreted as there should be no shadow. In the Broadway plan, um, specifically, the uh, the shadowing um, call it requirements are prescribed in the policy, um, in the plan. So, um, unlike the bulletin, applicants have no kind of strength on, on trying to ask counsel. To allow to, uh, you know, in, uh, provide shadowing on retail streets because it would be considered policy in the Broadway plan, not a bulletin. Are you concerned that because the shadow bulletin, um, it it came after the West End plan, that there may be a shadow bulletin that comes of the Broadway plan, and that there might not be well, consultation I, with industry? Well, well, I think I think the, the difference here is the shadowing is within the West End or in the Broadway plan. So yes. staff are bringing it forward now, not after the You're plan okay is adopted. You're okay with that? Well, you like it to be changed. I, I, I think I, I think the shadow, I, I disagree with the shadowing on retail. I think the housing priorities are more important than the shadowing. But what staff are doing now are, are bringing it forward as policy, I think they're doing a better job than they did at the West End, where it was uh, a bulletin that was done after the West End was created. And I'm really sorry. I'm going to have to stop Thanks, you Evan. there. You're well over time, Councillor Di Genova. Appreciate that. Thanks, yeah. Evan. Okay, thank you. Um, that's it for your questions. But again, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, wait, we do have more questions. Um, just one oh. sec. Councillor Weeb, go ahead up to three minutes. Yeah, just a quick clarification. You talked about that there would be density in certain pockets. Can you speak to a little bit of which pockets that you would expect the density to be delivered in the near term? So I, I, I would just say generally, like if you look at all the maps that are in the West End plan, there's a bunch of overlays that would, could say, limit the amount of density that is achieved, that would be achievable on site. And um, most of the sites in the West End plan, um, especially if they are like rental buildings, they're, they're maximized to their full potential right now. And if, uh, if the council's objective is to, you know, uh, make, you know, tenant protection um, and meet all the other objectives in the plan, it's going to be really hard to do that um, unless you get the full density that's in the plan. So, for example, if... Uh, if there's a site that says you can do 20 stories at, say, 8 FSR, um, and then there's existing 100 
rent, uh, the 100 unit rental project. If, if you cannot develop to that 8FSR um, because of a view cone or shadowing requirements or call it a heritage requirement, um, those pockets will not be developed in the near term. So there's, you know, if you go, if um, we're just doing the analysis right now, but there's, you know, say a quarter of the Broadway plan that will be likely um, unencumbered by restrictions other than density and floor plates. And those are the, those are the pockets where there's going to be the most amount of development. And, you know, and then, but if you, if you're, you're focusing development in these pockets, trying to limit that uh, by putting two towers, I just, kind of think it's a lost opportunity um and i and i don't know why it was just two towers like if it was to if two towers are, if it was a two tower requirement to limit um to make development of like a slow slow the pace of development i would you know i would think that was a bad bad move um if there's two towers to i i don't know i just think two towers on any block would be a bad move because there's such good you know basic principles that we have, like I said, floor plates and power separation and set black, that really separate these buildings already. And I don't think we need to, you know, in, you know, create greater distances between these buildings. Okay. Thank you. If, that, if that gives you, your, that gives you your answer. I don't have direct pockets, but um, I wish I, yeah, you know, just, I, I just, was able to do the work. Yeah. Are you seeing a bidding war in these small pockets? You're almost out of time. Sorry, I just missed what you said there. Oh, good. I'm out of time. Thanks for speaking today. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, thank you again for not only speaking to us, uh, uh, but also answering the questions. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, speaker 121, M. Wickham. Hi, I have slides. I'll Looks like they are um, up. Yes, they're up, so go ahead. Okay. All right. Good evening, Chair and Councillors. I'm Marlene from Vancouver. I oppose the Broadway plan. The Broadway plan is supposed to make Broadway into a great street and make it more livable. Slide two. Think of livability as lovability. What is there to love in this plan? Critics were aghast at Stephen Balhus's tall, blocky renderings. However, they highlighted what you didn't see planned groups of buildings around planned protected green space and planned protected space for new schools. The May 24th Heather Lands presentation, demonstrating a desirable and lovable city plan, had a clear design aesthetic, buildings that relate to each other and abundant green space for which Vancouver is known. This is the type of thoughtful design that one would expect from a great legacy plan. As far as I could see, there was no advisory report from the First Nations on the design of the Broadway plan. In fact, the Broadway plan is a detached planning process for individual buildings disconnected from each other. It cancels the love and commitment brought forth by neighborhood plans. By eliminating neighborhood plans, areas falling outside of the Broadway plan become available for developer speculation. There is no plan for increased proportion of affordable family-sized three-bedroom homes. There is no plan for intergenerational living. There is no standardization of apartment size. There is no plan for affordable home ownership. So who loves this plan? Urban planners do, and de developers. We've already heard them avidly auditioning for work. Slide three. The community's thoughts are less clear. From the phase three community engagement report, 2042 completed 57% of an online survey, 1,872 watched a video or read a booklet, and 241 participated in a session. Slide four. 52% think life will be better. Slide five. For themes, many wanted more affordable housing and weren't keen on tall buildings. Slide six, they wanted parks, more walking space. They disliked car-free streets and no parking. Regarding building permanent bike lanes on Broadway, we still need bus lanes to UBC. And we live in an earthquake zone. Emergency responders need unobstructed access along major arterials to attend to disaster, especially if Broadway is highly densified. Don't be like the feds with pandemic preparation and put a bureaucrat in charge. Leave the experts like fire services, BC Ambulance, and VPD to make these decisions. The Broadway plan is a living document, meaning that it can be changed at any time. This has already happened in the past week. After it's passed, anything goes. How can anyone consent to this plan in good faith? 
The Broadway plan expects us to just trust the planners, however I cannot. Unlike the Heatherlands, where MST proactively consulted Conseil Scolaire Francophone for a mutually agreeable arrangement, the City of Vancouver selected land for the soon-to-be extremely busy terminal subway station and bus loop beside St. Augustine Elementary School and a preschool without community consultation. In the words of Lon Leclerc, GM of Engineering, Arbutus and Broadway will be an unresolvable transit bottleneck. Slide 7. I do not love the solar inequity against independent schools. And please skip to slide 9 with the purple appendix A. Located at the red X is St. Augustine School to be eventually surrounded by very tall buildings. Slide 10, please. Whereas public schools are not. On May 18th, when Councillor Dominato asked Matt Chilito about the solar inequity, his answer was, it was just a consideration in the balance. We wanted to focus on protections of public lands and public schools. We had to balance the objectives around delivering development, particularly around affordable and rental housing and job spaces. So we wanted to balance of being restrictive and allowing development to take place. With that particular judgment, we decided that the public schools were the priority. Please go back to slide, slide nine. Why are independent school children being treated differently? The independent St. Augustine School is located beside the future Arbutus Terminus subway station. St. Augustine School has existed at this location for 110 years, with the newest version constructed entirely from 17 years of fundraising by parents and parishioners. Is it coincidence that the city has a solar access policy excluding independent schools? This process contrasts with MST's collaboration with Conseil Scolaire Francophone in the development of the Heatherlands. In this living document, will there be future policies to exclude other groups of people? Slide 11, please. I oppose the Broadway plan. I say leave it and send it back to the public for revision. The public may surprise you with ways to make planning more lovable. Thank you for your time. I would be happy to take questions. Um, thank you very much. You do have questions. Councillor Hardwick, go ahead, up to three minutes. Well, my question is, have you made this presentation available to council uh, together with any written remarks? Uh, no, I have not, but I can submit that. Um, uh, well, it would be yeah. appreciated because we've got to keep the pace going here, but uh, it would be nice to reflect on it uh, later. I think uh, we've done a, would, a very interesting Would you like job. to look at my other slides? Because I can show you the slide 12, because I have the, about the Great Northern Way, because I think it should be more like uh, Salamanca, Spain, with a uh, small club space for all those post-secondary schools. I would like the idea about converting or having multi-use industrial space and used into another space in the evening. I think all those schools could relate together to get fantastic ideas. And my very last slide, 14. Since Lon Leclerc mentioned that uh, the Greenway is going to become a street, and there is an objective in the Broadway plan about creating uh, green, uh, more high streets, and it's a Greenway. Okay, they want Greenways to be connected to other shopping districts. So, before there's more building along the Greenway, let's think about our Ar Arbutus Greenway Village. Well, um, we didn't get those slides, but again, if you would send that oh. along, it would okay. be um, appreciated. Um, and and again, okay. a great job, very well well argued point. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Those are your questions. Again, thank you so much for coming to speak to council. Really appreciate it. Okay, all right, thanks. Good. Great, speaker 122, Neil Wiles. Good evening, Chair Carr and council, can you hear me? You bet. Go ahead. Excellent. Uh, clearly, I'm here to speak about the Broadway plan. Um, I have some, some concerns. Clearly, you've heard a lot uh, over the past number of days. Um, none of the, my concerns, I think, are going to be news to you. Schools and parks are integral uh, in a plan of this size. Um, and I think we all know that they cannot be added uh, later once everything is built out. Um, but my biggest concern here and uh, is the uh, Mount Pleasant Community Plan, uh, which seems to be slated to be abandoned um, if the Broadway plan is adopted. Broadway is not a neighborhood. Mount Pleasant is. The Mount Pleasant Community Plan should not be abandoned in favor of the Broadway plan because the Mount Pleasant plan is, is working. Um, I think Mount Pleasant is the fastest growing neighborhood in Vancouver. Uh, the Mount Pleasant plan has delivered the needed density. We're nine years into a 30-year plan. What do we know now that we didn't know then? Um, 
The Mount Pleasant Community Plan includes language around transit development and employment in the uh, Mount Pixel and uh, uh, Olympic Village areas. Uh, this plan was hashed out and hard fought by all parties over the year, um, developers, residents, and business people. Um, and I think simply tossing it out uh, would be a disservice uh, to all that was gained and all of that work. Um, we've seen many place, many spaces uh, in the Maine and Kingsway area uh, developed, and frankly, uh, they were parking lots or you know some used car dealerships that permeated the area. Uh, there was lots of good development, and it's delivered the density to the area. So by no means are we sitting in the uh, NIMBY camp. Mount Pleasant has seen and welcomed lots of development and has benefited from it. The Mount Pleasant BIA, uh, which I represent, contains 13 blocks on Broadway, um, which is part of the area being proposed. Uh, while I think we can agree that uh, not every space in those 13 blocks is showing as best as it can, uh, we do feel that there's aspects of the area that need protecting. There are numerous spaces uh, on Broadway in Mount Pleasant that need to be developed. Uh, there would be a great community benefit to see some of these spaces developed. For example, uh, the old MEC building that's sitting there uh, right now. It would be a great opportunity for some density uh, and with some additional amenities to go along with it. Another site is, of course, the much beloved and sung about Kingsgate Mall. Um, the Mount Pleasant Community Plan allows for this development on sites uh, like is being proposed in the Broadway plan, but opening the floodgates uh, without any additional assurances would be very concerning. We've seen a site sit empty for 15 years. So yes, this should be developed and could be under the Mount Pleasant Community Plan. The Mount Pleasant Community Plan has provisions for increased density that include height, that would include the that would include some amenities that uh, would benefit the area. Uh, I'm also looking at a document, uh, which is the supportive policies agreement between the city and TransLink from 2018, um, which the city commits to keep the Mount Pleasant Community Plan in place. This is from four years ago, uh, and is part of the larger conversation of, around the Broadway line uh, and jobs use. Um, for a, a, a commitment from so such a short period ago, I think I think there's a there's a trust issue um, here with throwing the community plan away. Um, another concern I have, um, of course, is the highest and best use taxation policy. We already know that Mount Pleasant and other areas in the city um, are under incredible pressure from this policy. I'm concerned that the Broadway plan will introduce some additional crushing property taxes on these businesses. Um, not enough we saw a few years ago, um, if you remember the uh, artworks, uh, I think it was on, the, on Smythe there, they were paying for 24 stories of property above a little art store. Um, so although we are uh, in general um, supportive of the Broadway plan, we do have a lot of concerns. Um, and the biggest one, of course, is seeing uh, the, uh, the Mount Pleasant Broadway plan uh, Mount Pleasant Community Plan being tossed out as it's working uh, so well and it is so new. Um, so although I think the Broadway Plan is going to set uh, a good set of guidelines, um, I think we also need to put in um, some guide rails uh, in there to, uh, to to protect areas like Mount Pleasant. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And uh, you do have questions, if you don't mind staying on the line. Councillor Hardwick, up to you okay. for three minutes. Hi, Neil. Would Hello, you, uh, you're, you're generally supportive. I mean, the reality is there's a subway that's going to go down Broadway, no matter what, it, we're going to have to respond to it. Um, you, of course, are legitimately arguing for retention and following up of an existing plan that's not very old. So the question to you is, would you prefer, if you could, make, if you could choose, um, to put off the decision on this until the next council after sufficient time had been spent to consider ways to integrate the existing plan? That's a big question. Um, I, I do recognize that we need increased density around these, um, these transit hubs. Um, and I, maybe that's what had started this because yeah, I've lived here a long time as you have and know that there's a bunch of transit stations that just have no density uh, around it. So I, I would, I do support that. Um, you know, I, I don't know if this is something we want to keep kicking um, down the line. Um, you know, you know, it would be. I, I don't know if it's unfair to say you'd uh, leave it at the feet of the next uh, of the next council. I'm sure there's a number of amendments uh, floating around. This document is by no means perfect, and I think it, it needs a lot of work. Um, and all that you've heard over the past few sessions, I think, is indicating uh, that the people want that work to be done. I don't know if it can be done that quickly. 
Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Thank you um, so much, Neil. Uh, that's it for your questions. Um, appreciate very much you coming to speak or you speaking to Council. Thank you. Great. Um, speaker 123, uh, Donald Rennie. Hello, I'm here. Yep, we can hear you. Yes, I'm the treasurer for the Vancouver Kingsway Federal Green Party Association, and I want to thank you all for working so late. Amending the Broadway plan could set trends that save all life on Earth. These are things that exist, and we can help them become more widespread by asking to test them now. Climate emergency demands it. So please amend the Broadway plan to include language that creates a path to citywide mandates for both carbon negative concrete and 100% selectively logged dead tree lumber. So we can leave the trees that are alive living and let them absorb more CO2. So, so all cement uh, would be carbon negative and all wood would be 100% dead trees in the city of Vancouver. <clears throat> And we can start by asking ASAP for all Jersey barriers installed in the Blondbury plan area to be from this carbon negative concrete as a way of testing which method of making it is most durable. And we should, you know, before we start erecting 90 story buildings with it. Carbon negative concrete needs carbon negative aggregate, which is made from direct air capture CO2 and carbon negative neutral cement and carbon neutral steel, both made from 100% renewable powered energy. And uh, those are things that exist. And, and we can get a chemistry that continues to draw CO2 from the air over the life of the planet. And similarly, we can get a path towards mandating uh, dead tree wood by building a one-to-one -one replica of the Eiffel Tower from this mass timber made from 100% selectively log dead trees. And, you know, even if we could just calculate that that's possible, we could use that as a as a, in, a contingency for putting in this dead tree mandate into the Broadway plan. We can also fix our carbon footprint by putting language into the plan that mandates less than 50% window pro ratios, triple glazing those windows, and uh, four vertical feet of below basement river rock per above ground occupied floor to be used as a heat sink for heat pumps instead of gas furnaces and AC. Why throw away heat when you can put it underground into this rock and use it for when you need it later? It, it works so well, it works summer to winter, not just night and day. And so energy costs money and lower use like that, it creates to more affordable housing. But to get there, we should also insist on 50% of new housing be affordable to those making average wages. And that would mean that 40% of those units be capped at 30% of a tenant's income and another 10% of units be rented at the shelter rate. And how's my time? Uh, uh, you, you still have two minutes. Oh, good. So we can lower those costs by insisting developers buy directly from owners to eliminate property flipping. And, and, and we can, you know, also mandate those lower energy use ideas and, and use less energy in transportation by making cycling more uh, easy and available. Uh, personally, I am a disabled cyclist, and I have been to Broadway a couple times in the last month to, to buy things, and my choice was risk my life on the street or endanger pedestrians on the sidewalk. So I would like cycle lanes on Broadway, because if there's not room for them on Broadway, then there's no room anywhere, and clearly there is. The studies show that cycle lanes are good for business and increase safety for all traffic. They also show that three-lane roads with center turn lanes are safer and move more traffic than four-lane roads. So we can make that the new standard on every arterial, especially Broadway. And, and cycle lanes are usually wide enough for fire trucks and ambulances, so unlike cars, bicycles can get out of their way and, and actually by putting cycle lanes in, it makes it easier for emergency vehicles to access places. It makes it easier for everyone to access it. So has Councillor Boyer's amendment come up yet? 
No, we're, this is a process right now where we are um, listening to speakers. Uh, there has been no motion table. It will happen after we finish all speakers. All right. Well, uh, I think I said a lot there. If there's any questions, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll defer, defer to council now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, there are no questions, but again, thank you very much for speaking to us. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, speaker 124, Elena McGregor. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very clearly, go ahead. Okay, great. So my name is Elena McGregor. I am a resident of Kitsilano, and I am calling to oppose the Broadway plan. I am calling to ask you to please preserve the beautiful city that we live in. Many who came before you understood this, which is why we have such a beautiful city. I trust okay. that you will have the same understanding and take into consideration the many sensible recommendations presented, which are far more likely to meet city's goals and our community's needs. Many of the points that I wanted to bring up have already been mentioned by qualified professional and experts. So all that I will say is that enough issues have been brought up that undoubtedly indicate that setting in motion the current version of the Broadway plan would be an irreversible mistake. I simply would like to ask that you please consider the experts that the expertise that have been offered and revise the plan to protect our city. Thank you for listening and for representing our views with your vote. Uh, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate you speaking to council. Um, there are no questions for you, but have a good evening. Thank you. Great. Speaker 125, Marley Laval. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Go ahead, up to five minutes. All right. Uh, thank you, council, for your time and attention. My name is Marley Laval. I am a Vancouver resident, and I am a two-spirit disabled Métis youth and a policy analyst on the topic of urban Indigenous public health. I also lived and worked in the Broadway plan area for several years, but before eventually being priced out as a low-income renter. I'm asking you to oppose the current plan until there are significant details regarding the equity of these proposed spaces. As some speakers have said before me, there needs to be a disability and poverty lens applied to the Broadway plan. As that's noted by Gabrielle Peters and Ruby Langan from the City Planning Commission, there are a lot of specific details in this plan about the housing density, but no real metrics attached to accessibility and inclusion. It should be unacceptable to you that details on accessibility, as noted by a staff presenter last week, will not be available until July, after the assumed approval of this plan. While the staff member noted the current bylaw adaptability requirements for units, too many disabled people, and especially poor and racialized disabled people, are in inaccessible housing. And without real metrics right now, how can we be sure that the Broadway plan will be any different? Accessibility cannot be an afterthought, especially for a long-term plan that's been in the works for nearly four years. In an equitable and truly inclusive city, it's a necessary condition. It is vital to the health of both individuals and the city. And if this plan is so focused on economic development and the creation of new job spaces in the area, then we can talk about how access promotes economic prosperity for both people and local businesses. But more importantly, access is a human right, not a bonus, and it needs to be the foundation of all city policy and planning. And um, as an urban Métis person, I see accessibility as an Indigenous issue, not simply because dis disabled Indigenous people like myself exist, but because urban planning is a process of choosing who can live where. Planning has roots in colonialism. It displaces people from the land and makes living on that land inaccessible by design. A common value among Indigenous nations is that everyone has a sacred role and place in our communities. If Vancouver really is a city of reconciliation, then the Broadway plan needs to prioritize leaving no one behind. I also want to touch on how um, in Appendix A of this plan, Section 21.6 calls for another community policing center in the Eastern Plan area. CPCs operate under the guise of relationship building, but they do not change the material conditions and structural inequities within the community. If anything, they sustain them. 
CPCs are employed to displace those who the city isn't planning for while creating a perception of safety for everyone else. In all likelihood, the people being policed by this new CPC will not be the people with strata ownership, but the people in below market and social housing. I have deep concerns that current or future councils will support increased policing in the Broadway plan area, rather than looking at non-carceral ways to support the health and safety of this growing population. I think that the $2 million proposed for this new CPC would be much better spent on community-led services that do not criminalize poverty, just as this council unanimously voted to prioritize doing. Lastly, to anyone saying that this is an imperfect, imperfect plan, but that it should be passed now because of the need for more housing, I invite you to reflect on who can really see themselves and their loved ones in this plan. Of course, we need more housing, and I will never argue otherwise, but this housing cannot come at the expense of underserved people who, through intentional policy and planning, have the least means to thrive in this city. And as we look at the next 30 years, we need to think bigger and plan better for all of us. Uh, Thank you again for listening. Um, I thank you again for taking the time to speak to council. Um, you don't have any, oh, you do have some questions, if you don't mind staying on the line. Mm-hmm. Councillor sure. Weeb, go ahead, up to three. Yeah, thank you very much for speaking. Um, and also hearing some of these concerns from the Person with Disability Advisory Committee. Can you talk about what you would like to see in a revised plan that really speaks to being more accessible and ensuring that these a plan like this has more inclusionary policies in it? Um, Well, the main thing is just, um, you know, based on current bylaws and housing and building codes, um, I just don't think that they're adequate for the diversity of access needs that, like, community members like me face, um, not only related to mobility, but also, you know, sensitivities to things like severe allergens, environmental concerns, um, sound, sense, um, you know, all of these things. Um, and with the recognition that maybe living in multifamily housing isn't physically possible for a lot of folks um, and incorporating like those accommodations into the plan as well. Um, but yes, also, you know, recognizing that density is important and absolutely necessary for a growing city. But, um, you know, taking unit size into account is going to be a huge part of that, too, to ensure better access, um, especially for families. Um, it's going to be a big thing. Um, And also recognizing that, you know, what might be considered walkable in the city um, doesn't always mean that it's accessible, especially for wheelchair users. So um, there are a lot of times where I see, you know, renders of what walkable might look like, but then disabled folks and wheelchair users are, you know, they have to go onto the road or a bike lane and things like that. So, you know, think about access not only as part of um, like the physical unit, but also, you know, what, what goes on outside that unit as well. Um, and, you know, just related to the climate crisis that we're in, um, climate actions that we take, they need to prioritize historically underserved people, um, especially as poor and disabled people are disproportionately impacted by things like the heat dome. Um, and any climate actions as well must not be coupled with, you know, for possibly the benefit of for-profit developers because that's going to leave people behind. Thank you so much for the clarity of that answer. Appreciate it. That's great. Thank you, Councillor okay. Weeb, and uh, thank you very much. Um, there are no more questions, but uh, really appreciate you not only speaking to Council, but taking the time to answer the questions. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Speaker 126, Chris Flerich. The speaker is not on the line. Thank you. Speaker 127, Lucy Maloney. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm, in, I'm in favour of an amended Broadway plan that includes separated bike lanes and addresses the concerns raised in the dissenting opinion of the Vancouver City Planning Commission regarding the lack of specific provisions for affordable and accessible housing for disabled people and I really agree with the, a lot of um, the comments made by the previous speaker. My family and I live downtown and we mostly commute by bike. Some of you are wondering why would anyone want to cycle on Broadway? And the simple answer is to get to the places we want to go, just like people who drive. 
Every barrier we put up for cyclists, whether it's indirect routes, hills or danger from cars, stops people from cycling for transport. Commercial streets in Vancouver are the flattest and most direct way of getting places, which is why they developed into commercial streets in the first place. I've been cycling for transport my whole life. I've ridden my bike to and from elementary school, high school, university and work to get the shopping and run errands and take my kids to and from school. I've cycled on Broadway a number of times recently. I've visited a notary, a locksmith, a bike shop, a shop that sells dance clothing, Bed Bath and & Beyond and a medical clinic. And it's scary and, and intimidating cycling on Broadway at the moment, even for a confident and experienced cyclist. Separated bike lanes on Broadway would entice even the most timid and inexperienced cyclists to linger and explore. Cycling to Broadway using Vancouver's bike network via a cross street can be three or four blocks from your destination. So without separated bike lanes, you'll either have to ride along Broadway, mixing it with four lanes of cars, trucks and buses, or ride on the footpath if the plan isn't amended. When I have to go to Broadway, I don't want to have to ride back to 7th and 10th to travel between places on Broadway. And 7th and 10th aren't separated bike lanes except in a few limited places. Separated bike lanes will also create a better return on the subway investment through increased ridership by more than doubling the catchment area. People will walk several blocks to a subway station, maybe a two or three block catchment area on either side of Broadway, but with a bike, that catchment area becomes much larger. But it means that people on bikes need to be able to access the stations. And cycling access to the stations has been eliminated all along Broadway. They don't even have rear access from lanes or side streets. Think about the 260,000 new residents and 210,000 new workers on and around Broadway over the next 30 years. Many of those people will also cycle or use e-scooters, electric tricycles and mobility scooters using the separated bike lanes. City staff said that a three-lane configuration would probably be the most appropriate for including unidirectional separated bike lanes on either side of Broadway. And the good news is that multiple studies show that arterials with three motor vehicle lanes, so a turning lane in the middle and one moving lane in either direction, are safer than four lanes because this configuration re reduces intersection crashes. And it's apparently better for motor vehicle flow. Staff also said that the Broadway plan was about fostering vibrant public life. Now, if I was going to one of the many new restaurant patios envisioned in the Broadway plan, I'd much rather be sitting next to a protected unidirectional bike lane than a noisy, smelly, dangerous lane of speeding motor vehicle traffic. Is Broadway to be simply a noisy, smelly highway or a pleasant thoroughfare full of interesting, beautiful and useful destinations? There are already lots of reasons to go to Broadway and this is only going to get better. Demand for e-bikes, e-cargo bikes and e-scooters is skyrocketing. They are really unlocking active transport for people who have young kids as well as less fit people. E-scooters are also experiencing a surge in use because they're cheaper than e-bikes and easier to store and secure. Reducing another lane of car traffic on Broadway to install bike lanes would not only provide realistic alternatives to private car use, but would give residents of apartments a quieter, less polluted street to live on. My family and I have had very positive experiences living in towers. I think this plan is a very modest increase in increase in density and should go a lot further. Multi-family homes are our first choice. Before we moved into our current home we lived on the 31st floor of an apartment building in Yale Town and when we lived in Singapore we lived on a 28th floor apartment. We had great experiences raising our children in both apartments and I would choose to live in a tower again in a heartbeat. I feel like the opposition to towers comes from a place of fear rather than of, of experience of what it's really like. We've enjoyed getting to know wonderful neighbours, shared facilities that you don't need to look after, gardens that you don't need to maintain and the convenience of being close to work, beaches, parks, shops, transit and bike paths. We, we lived in a low-rise apartment complex in Chile and we currently live in a townhouse. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, you, 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 have, you have just run out of, uh, you're well over time. Um, but you have questions uh, from one uh, councillor, so if you don't mind staying on the line. Sure. Thank you.
Councillor Dominato, go ahead. Uh, hi, Lucy. Thanks for calling in this evening. Um, really appreciate the perspective you're bringing. I, I was curious if you could just comment, obviously having you've lived in other places and other cities, um, just your thoughts on how we ensure um, uh, if there's integration of a AAA bike network and wider sidewalks to accommodate um, pedestrians, patios, people, individuals, maybe in wheelchairs or uh, scooters, um, uh, how we also accommodate um, uh, goods movement in the city. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts or experience of what you've seen in other cities. Um, well, I think that it's really important to plan in um, delivery zones. You know, um, if you've got parking for um, only for private cars in, in parking bays and you don't properly plan for delivery zones, what you're going to have is what happens in the West End a lot at the moment, which is um, the courier companies in their trucks um, just pulling up on the wrong side of the road um, outside apartment buildings and dropping off or like in um, a, an apartment building close to me where there are metre parking right outside the front door where all the couriers come to drop off to to, to a tower and um, that um, metre parking needs to be removed and a delivery zone put in. So I think it really is easy for um, delivery vehicles to be accommodated. You just have to plan for it. Right. No, I appreciate that. And I guess my second question is simply around, um, um, well, I, I think there's an aspiration to um, overall to reduce the number of vehicles on streets. Uh, pragmatically, um, we're a, a destination city um, for various reasons. Um, um, arguably, I notice a difference in the traffic when it's, you know, slower weekends and holidays, but we do have a lot of commuter traffic coming to the city. Do you have any thoughts on how we deal with that? Uh, well, that is a very complex issue because we need a lot of public transport, but that depends on us having density. Um, but I think that it's very important that we don't sacrifice the needs for the people who live in the city of Vancouver um, uh, um, to benefit people who, who are living um, out of the city of Vancouver and want to commute through it. Um, I think that um, it's really important to reduce noise and pollution um, especially for the people that are going to be living in apartment buildings uh, on broad, Broadway and who already live in apartment buildings on commercial streets. It's just not really fair that these people have to put up with um, so much noise and pollution and um, lack of safe ways to get around outside cars when probably about 50% of the population don't actually can't actually drive cars anyway and we don't want everyone in the city of Vancouver to be relying on driving private cars. It's just not the way of the future, just simple geometry. We don't have room for everybody to be in their own car to go everywhere. So we've got to provide alternatives. Great. Thank, thank you. you. I think it's probably my time. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Councillor Dominato, and uh, thank you so much um, for coming to speak to Council and answering those questions. My pleasure. Great. Uh, speaker of 128, uh, Bryce Margots. Good evening, Council. Um, thank you for letting me speak to you this evening. Uh, my name is Bryce Margots, and I am in full support of the Broadway plan as currently presented by staff with the hope that this document can continue to grow and evolve and be flexible where it needs to be through constructive consultation during each rezoning application with the development industry and each community and block where the plan touches over such a wide area. My children are fourth generation Vancouverites. I was born in this city. I've been a resident for 47 years. I continue to live in Vancouver with my wife and two children and I am the senior vice president and partner in my company's operations in Western Canada. We are builders, we are developers throughout the, the country and within this region, and we have active projects in the Broadway corridor. My message to council and the community is it's time to move forward now. This plan may not be perfect, but staff and consultants have done an excellent job and we've been working closely with them for years trying to bring this plan to fruition. Our company is Candarel, and we are the development partner who has been working with the La Maison Francophone Society. You've heard from many members of La Maison and how important this project is for them and the Broad Slopes Granville community for arts, arts and culture in these neighborhoods. But what you haven't heard is that we've been working with them for six years trying to kick off this project, and we've been uh, caught up for several years in the Broadway plan process trying to deliver this new home uh, with cultural amenities, including 
uh, a brand new 160 person performance theater. The project viability relies upon moving forward now. We cannot wait and delay further, and we cannot be the only project in this position. I have been listening to virtually every speaker since last Wednesday, and based on the vitriol of some, I can feel people sneering through their computer screens at the mention of someone who says they're a developer. I have some other comments on the plan, particularly in Fairview Kitchen, and North Mount Pleasant, where we are also working on sites. But before I do, I'd like to offer this perspective. I also own a metal manufacturing business that's been operating in the city of Vancouver for 60 years, which I purchased from my father when he wanted to retire. Together with my business partner, we employ over 35 people. We are, as they say, a going concern business. Our goal as a going concern business is to make a 15% net profit per year. Sometimes we do better, sometimes we do worse, such as in the last two years when we almost didn't make it. I think every speaker on the line today and last week can agree there is nothing wrong with a going concern business making a 15% profit. If we didn't, we wouldn't be in business making things and employing citizens of our city. I can tell you unequivocally that these developments under the current plan and based on the density and form of development created by planning and the consultants barely make 15%. In fact, it's closer to 13% in most cases. My main job day to day is to try and build housing. And yes, our goal is to try and place capital where we can make around 15%. It's no different than a going concern business and we cannot make this amount. There will be no project and no further supply of housing. The change is already made reducing the height from 25 to 20 stories and reducing the density from seven and a half to six and a half is jeopardizing the ability to make these projects financially viable. In my opinion, these changes to the plan killed any chance of near-term redevelopment on any site where an existing 40 to 50-year-old condo building currently sits. The Mount Pleasant North area in particular is so badly in need of upgraded housing, in my opinion, based on all the job growth that's happening at the new hospital along Great Northern Way, and it will not be touched by developers for many years, <clears throat> not until the buildings are basically falling apart. The numbers do not work. Here are some additional points. In the Fairview, Kitts, and Mount Pleasant zones, the final draft, in my opinion, was changed last minute from allowing two towers per block to allowing two towers per block street to street, including the lane. For those of us following the plan, this essentially cut the supply in half from what we expected. This may be an unpopular comment, but I think it's ridiculous we are only densifying 300 of 1,000 feet on each block, street to street, including the lane, and not taking advantage of such a massive opportunity for a $3 billion investment in a transit line. Another perspective, there are at least 7 to 10 small, sorry, 7 to 11 small apartment buildings on each typical block. The plan currently contemplates two to four of these buildings being replaced with two towers. The only site size that makes sense is 150 feet, in our opinion. So there will remain five to seven of these old affordable buildings left for rental housing at the current rates. Furthermore, a 150-foot site with a three-story walk-up contains about 35 units, with average rents of one we just looked at of 1677 per month. The replacement tower would create 36 affordable units at or below these rents and an additional 146 market rents. Make no mistake, we are in a countrywide emergency on the supply of housing. We need more. This will moderate rents and make things for more affordable. We need more, not less. Thank you for listening. Uh, that was perfectly timed. Um, and uh, you have no questions, but really appreciate uh, you taking the time to speak to us. Thank you. Great. Speaker 129, Margot Nicholas. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, we can hear you clearly. Go ahead. All right, thank you. Okay, you've been hearing a lot about lack of resources to support such a massive increase in density. I will focus on one, parks, dog parks in particular. I work in the pet industry. If you don't already know, Vancouver is a city full of dog lovers. About one third of the population of Vancouver owns a dog. Due to the pandemic, there has been a rise in dog ownership and all predictions are that this will continue to grow. Pets make for a healthier, safer, and more connected and happier society. Dog owners treat and care for their dogs like they were their children. Every decision in their life is made with the consideration of their pet's well-being. Currently, it is extremely difficult to find a place to rent that allows dogs in the city. Some buildings don't permit them even if you buy. The Broadway plan may add some pet-friendly buildings at will, but that won't help. The first concern of pet owners and why they can't move here is because there are limited options for where their dog can safely play and socialize with other dogs. 
doggy daycares are not a replacement for outdoor space. And at $35 to $50 a day, it is not a service that people you are hoping to attract can afford to pay every time they need to go to work. The city is in the final stages of approving a small off-leash area in Granville Park. Fairview, Kitsilano, and also Mount Pleasant have been identified by the city as the most underserved areas in the city when it comes to dog parks. Here is what the city had to say about its efforts to improve availability of dog parks. The strategy identified the importance of providing off-leash areas within a 15-minute walk of most residents. An off-leash area at Granville Park will increase access for dog off-leash activities in two priority neighborhoods that are currently underserved. The key words being currently underserved. I have heard a lot of people in favor of this plan comparing the Broadway plan to Yale Town, so I want to do some park comparisons between Yale Town and Fairview. Yale Town, current population about 14,500. 14, it's almost fully developed, so in 30 years I will add an increase of 20%. That's 17,400 residents. Fairview includes Fairview, Fairview Slopes, and South Falls Creek. Current population, 33,600. The Broadway plan generally doubles population, but the city is on record that it will triple population of South Falls Creek, and Fairview will include three stations where the most density is planned. I think it is fair to say the population will triple in 30 years. That's 100,800 residents. Fairview is about three times the size of Yale Town, but it will be twice as dense. The city has already said dog parks should be within a 15-minute walk of most residents. I would assume that would be the same for humans. Yale Town parks with off-leash areas within a 15-minute walk are Cooper, Emory, Nelson, and Sunset Set Park. Fairview parks within off-leash areas within a 15-minute walk are Charleston for about half the residents, Ground Club Park if it's approved for about a quarter. Yale Town, all parks within a 15-minute walk. George Wayborn, David Lamb, Cooper, Emory, Nelson, and half a sunset. Fairview, all parks within a 15-minute walk. Charleston, Granville, Granville Loop, City Hall, Shaughnessy, and Heather Park. Fairview residents only have a 15-minute walking access to two of these parks, depending on where they live. All Yale Town residents have access to the six parks I listed. Also, Yale Town is on the north side of the creek, where most of the parks get sunshine all year. Fairview is on the south side, where there will only sun late spring to early fall. The new towers will decrease light density all year round. I have heard people speaking in favor of this plan, saying we need parks and outdoor spaces, but go ahead, we'll figure it out later. This baffles me. Outdoor spaces should not be aspirational. They are not requirements for good, they are requirements for good physical, physical and mental health. They are a cost-free place people can gather. You can't call a neighborhood vibrant without them. If you were buying an apartment in a building that had not yet been built, and the developer showed you a diagram and said you can't see it, but it will have a 200-square-foot deck, would you just believe them? If we really need a tower-based model with this much density along the Broadway corridor, I'm asking the city to create a plan with specifics on contributions developers will have to make to outdoor spaces and to show us a map with parks on it. Yes, including dog parks. I'm opposed to the current Broadway plan. Thank you for your time. Mm, and thank you very much for your time. Um, there are no questions for you, but you uh, spoke very clearly. I appreciate you speaking to council. Thank you. Great. Um, speaker number 130, France Emmanuel Jolie. Good evening. Yes, we can hear you clearly. My name clearly. is France Emmanuel. <laughs> thank you. My name is France Emmanuel, and I am a uh, a Vancouver resident, a cyclist, and uh, uh, also involved with the uh, organization Réseau Femmes Colombie-Britannique. And we uh, just a few minutes ago heard from uh, someone from Canderel, who is indeed the uh, developer that the Maison de la Francophonie has been working for, working with for over six years. But as an umbrella organization and a group of francophone organizations, we've been working on trying to improve the uh, facility that the Maison de la Francophonie is so that it can offer not only better, uh, better uh, office space or uh, cultural space to uh, the organizations that are housed in this building, 
but also offer better community and cultural spaces. I think that that's one of the important points uh, that we want to make and that I want to make on behalf of the Maison de la Francophonie. One of the uh, the things that I wanted to add is that uh, a lot of the organizations that are involved in the Maison de la Francophonie are also uh, have a broader mandate than just having a, a, a local mandate. And uh, it's important to have community spaces for that reason, so that when we come together, we can also uh, benefit from spaces that are uh, that have proper equipment and that are also offering a number of uh, uh, cultural facilities. There, I agree with uh, speaker number 125 that there are a number of things that are lacking, and I, and I would in the same uh, way advocate, uh, because I am part of a women's organization, for a better gender and intersectional lens. Uh, I know that there has been efforts uh, by uh, city council members to uh, promote accessibility, to promote to talk about affordability. But I'm hoping that there can be an additional review of the uh, of the plan uh, to make sure that the um, uh, that there is uh, access for everybody. So, for example, earlier Speaker 125 was talking about how uh, people with uh, uh, with uh, mobility issues might need, you know. Uh, uh, better access in terms of sidewalks, in terms of not having to go on the road or in uh, cycling paths, etc. It is also something that is important to parents and to women who have uh, strollers, who, who have young kids who might be on bicycles. So those are other things that need to be taken into consideration. And trying to think in terms of um, the uh, most vulnerable uh, populations who will take advantage of the uh, of the neighborhood and of the facilities is something that um, could probably benefit if there's another reading of this long plan. Uh, one of the things that is really important for the Maison de la Francophonie, as I said, is that we want to really foster a sense of community and also offer those spaces that would be open as I said, not only to uh, people who are currently housed in the Maison de la Francophonie in terms of organizations, but also uh, other community members and other community organizations. Sadly, in a way, the only way for, uh, for a uh, community building like the Maison de la Francophonie to be able to um, enhance and improve its facility is to have um, housing built above and to have uh, to be part of a tower. Uh, it is not necessarily my favorite thing, but at the same time, I know that that's the way development is going. Uh, we would strongly like to advocate for a range of housing options because it, this is really important that there be a diversity and that some of the housing options can also support, uh, so for example, uh, market housing can also support uh, uh, social housing or rental housing. So those are uh, some of the focuses uh, that uh, we wanted to point out. And I think that in terms as, um, uh, sorry, I can't remember the name, the uh, person from Canderell who was speaking earlier, was also pointing out is that one of the uh, assets of the Maison de la Francophonie and obviously something that would still exist in the next generation would be to have uh, uh, a theater or a multi-use space that would be accessible to other organizations and to members, yes. which is also I, bringing... I, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you, you're, you're oh, well over time. I'm sorry. Um, okay. That, that that's great. You were you spoke clearly and uh, conveyed your points. So thank you very much for speaking to council. You're welcome. Speaker one thirty one, Derek Robertson. Hello. 
Yes, we can hear you clearly. Go ahead up to count uh, five minutes. To All speak right. to council. Perfect. Thank you. Chair Carr, members of council, thank you so much for the opportunity to address you this evening. My name is Derek Robertson, the Senior Manager of Government Relations for Canada uh, for Lime Technology, Inc., and I'm here to lend my support to the Broadway Plan. In 2019, the Vancouver City Council rightly declared a climate emergency and committed to taking the necessary actions required to address the biggest threat we face today. The reason why I'm here to speak in favour of the plan is that it creates necessary density along key transit corridors and it helps to create more livable neighbourhoods by turning major sections of Broadway in, into a great street. I will also note my support for the amendment proposed by Councillor Bloy, Blo sorry, Councillor Bloy, uh, Boyle, rather, uh, to de-emphasize the role of cars through this corridor by implementing a car light Broadway. With the, res with, with the proposed expansion of, of mobility lanes in this plan, coupled with taking action to legalize shared mobility in Vancouver, Council has the ability to provide Vancouverites with the tools they need to get out of private vehicles and on to public transportation and other forms of sustainable transportation uh, in support of the climate emergency plan. I thank you for your time. Great, thank you. Very clear, uh, no questions. I appreciate you taking the time to speak to Council. Have a great night. Great. You too. Speaker 132, Dale McClanahan. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm um, a member of the Granville Island Council, and I'm speaking today on behalf of the Council, uh, which has been appointed by the Minister responsible for CMHC to add local perspective and decision-making regarding the island. The Council is in favour of uh, the Broadway Plan, and we see it as adding uh, very uh, thoughtful amounts of um, housing density with a very healthy affordability profile, which will um, enhance and uh, further extend the uh, services that Granville Island provides in cultural, educational, marketing, and uh, artistic endeavors. Uh, I'm also a resident of the area. I'm at 16th and Granville, and I think that the addition of the um, additional density envisioned by the plan will be on, on balance very positive for the city, particularly the much needed housing density. Um, one of the aspects of this plan will be to add buildings uh, that will intrude into my view of English Bay, which although modest is very beloved by me and my family, but nonetheless, I think that trading some of my view for a healthier Vancouver and a Vancouver with better housing opportunities is well worth the trade-off. I think that uh, I'd like to add a couple of observations with regard to the technical aspect of the plan. <clears throat> I think that the uh, amount of CACs, which are to be paid by developers should be stipulated up front so that we'll have a faster implementation of plan. Currently, it's left uh, unspecified for negotiation. And when this approach was taken in the uh, Canby corridor, it delayed redevelopment in that area by often two or three years because developers and vendors were unable to ascertain what level of CACs they would need to pay. I'm not specifying what level the CAC should be. In a way, the higher the better, as long as it doesn't stay for redevelopment. But leaving it ambiguous will create unnecessary delay. Uh, I'd like to leave my remarks at that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, very clear. Um, there are no questions for you. I appreciate you coming to speak to council. Thank you. P, uh, speaker 133, Peter Whitelaw. Hi, can you hear me? You bet. Go ahead up to five minutes to speak to Council. Great. Thank you very much, Chair Carr and members of Council. I'm a senior planner with Renewable Cities, a special initiative of the Centre for Dialogue at SFU. Because the plan will help us address our climate and affordability crises, 
Renewable Cities is speaking in favor of passing the plan, and we want to lend our voice to those recommending some improvements. Uh, recognizing that you've got 200 speakers to work through, I'll keep my remarks short and to the point. You can find more details of our response to the plan in our written submission, which is also available on our website at renewablecities.ca. So as others have said, no plan is perfect, but the Broadway plan is thoughtful and makes many important contributions. I'd like to highlight two of these. The first one is that the plan really shows how we get value for money through integrating land use planning with major transportation infrastructures, infrastructure investments, such as the Broadway Skytrain. The second one is thinking about this from a regional perspective. If the 30,000 new homes envisioned in the plan were to be developed at typical densities on Metro Vancouver's urban fringe, they'd consume some 2,500 to 3,500 hectares of forest and rural lands. Instead, the plan creates affordability in two ways. First, by providing a lot of affordable and rental housing, and second, by accommodating residents where they can choose low-cost transportation modes. And transportation is the second largest household spend after housing. At the same time, I'd like to echo and add to recommendations you've heard from others. Uh, first of all, to strengthen affordability requirements. The plan is certainly ambitious, but the proposed mix of housing will likely, likely not meet the needs of the bottom half of all households by income. Affordability commitments should focus on rent geared to income units for households making less than the median income, ensuring that workers in the city can also be residents of the city. We think a key opportunity to do this is to leverage public lands to secure affordable housing. The city's already committed to housing over transit stations, and looking at schools and city-owned facilities could also be a focus. Second, uh, the city should drive for more diverse buildings and for wood construction. But we note that the city has made great strides on energy and carbon performance of high-rises, and this is one reason we're so supportive of it. We also encourage low and mid-rise buildings with higher densities possible using mass, mass timber construction. Third, uh, I'll echo many comments made by others about strengthening the green space and public realm commitments in the plan. And greater ambition here, as a speaker just said, really is a requirement for livability in this community. First of all, I think the plan should establish some targets for public green space in terms of the total amount. This will ensure a high quality of life for residents in the high density corridor, whether they be families or seniors. Ample green space is also essential to reduce environmental impact and financial costs associated with conventional stormwater management and can help mitigate extreme heat and flood risks. The city has been ambitious with public realm design, and this is an absolutely critical area to push further. As we grow, our region has the potential to have far fewer people moving by car, freeing up room to use our public rights of way as amenities. So a couple of specific examples here. The plan identifies some green streets, but could reach a lot further by having a much more extensive network of car-free linear parks, creating a really green and livable community. Similarly, uh, people have spoken about Broadway as having more public realm, but the new cross sections reflect, I think, fairly conventional thinking about where transportation demands will be in 20 or 30 years. We could imagine much less space for vehicular traffic and much more space for pedestrians, cyclists, and other users to take much less space on the road. Uh, last, uh, there's a fantastic opportunity to turn up the volume on bringing the wild into the urban by surfacing some of the dozens of streams that flow into False Creek. So I'll close by saying that the Broadway plan presents a strong vision of a growing urban district. With improvements, it has the potential to realize a stronger vision of a beautiful, comfortable, affordable, and inclusive urban community. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you. And uh, there are questions, and um, I'll start with myself. Um, taken by the point you made about uh, green streets and car-free linear parks, um, we have um, passed at the council uh, a while ago a motion to look at uh, reallocating 11% of Vancouver's streets um, to purposes such as you mentioned, of car-free, linear parks. Um, 
uh, of community gardens, play areas, uh, areas to socialize, etc. Um, what do you think about actually incorporating into this plan um, the uh, that actual objective to uh, to reallocate 11% of the streets to those kinds of uses? I would think that would be an absolute minimum for a community with the density that's envisioned in this plan, both in terms of jobs as well as in terms of residents. Uh, I, and I think that in the longer term, that, that's sort of looked at in this plan of a, a 20 or 30 year horizon, that the potential for this city to really shift away from cars into other modes can free up uh, more than that sort of 10%. Um, for example, uh, a number of years ago, um, Patrick Condon floated the idea of every second street being green. Um, and while that may be a bit of a stretch, I think it gives you a sense of, of the vision uh, that's possible. And I think the question that we should be asking ourselves is as much about what it would really be like to live in a place like this and to work in a place like this, as much as uh, sort of our, our fears and reservations about the practicalities of it. So uh, over this kind of time horizon, I think we can reach further than we imagine we can. Great. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate your response. You have more questions? Councillor Weeb, over to you. Yeah, my first question is on your website where it talks about your response to the Broadway plan, it's got a picture of the historical creeks. And one of them is China Creek, where currently the VCC has got a master plan that follows the Broadway plan. And it talks about only doing a symbolic gesture to the creek and not actually doing things differently or actually building integrated water management through the park and being really creative and bold and innovative. So looking at the work, do you think we really need to be more creative and bold in this plan to change the way we build so we have more resilient and restorative cities? Uh, in principle, I would say yes. Uh, we definitely should push in that direction. I should say I have not seen VCC's plan, so I can't speak directly to that. But yes, in principle. Um, and, you know, if you look back at the no, before the Mount Pleasant plan, uh, there are a number of there's a, a city policy saying that uh, city creeks would be represented uh, in a few different uh, design uh, methods uh, in sites. And I think that's helped a little bit to surface the creeks, but we could do a lot more. And again, here, those right of ways are tremendous opportunities. I think one of the neatest ones. Um, to take a quick tangent, is the uh, creek that runs down into the Snoch uh, village site. Uh, and there might be some fantastic cultural opportunities there just as a, a pure idea to, to float out. Okay. Yeah, we saw in the Heatherlands the opportunity to kind of bring water and biophilic design into these cities to make them more livable. So I appreciate your comments today. Yeah, General, I mean, to respond to your question, in principle, yes, and I think you should push hard in that direction. Great, thank you so much. Um, uh, that, that's it for your questions. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak to council and answer those questions. Thank you, have a great night and appreciate your time and efforts. Yep, have a good night too. Speaker 134, Don Gardner, in person it says. Wait, not on the line? Is he on the line? Okay, not on the line. Speaker 135, Esther Duquette. Chair Carr, uh, speaker number 135 has withdrawn. Thank you. Chair, point of information. Uh, yes, go ahead, Councillor Weeb. I'm wondering if we're going to take a five minute bio break soon. <laughs> you know, you must, have, you must have read, you must have read my mind. That needs to go. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we will. Um, we do have a speaker in person, um, Speaker 143, and I just want to make sure I'm going to count the time to make sure that we can get to it. Right. Uh, no problem. That will definitely get to the speaker. Um, so we, um, why don't we take that five minute break now? Bio break for everyone. Stretch your legs and um, see you shortly.
Okay, Council, we're reconvening. Um, we just have bare quorum right now, so please uh, stay at your stations and keep your video on, um, and hopefully others will join us so it won't be quite so touchy. Uh, and so we are now on Speaker 136, James Tang. Speaker 136 is not on the line. Speaker 137, uh, Fran, uh, Frank Hinselman. Yes. Yes, I'm here. Hello, can you hear me clearly? Yes, very clearly. Go ahead, up to five minutes. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, dear Mayor and City Councilors, and especially, hello, Adrian Carr. I appreciate that you're presiding this meeting tonight. As a Vancouver resident for the last 30 years, I oppose the Broadway plan. In my view, there's only one Vancouver. The, the Broadway plan and the construction of luxury high-rise towers everywhere, in my opinion, would destroy the beauty and livability of Vancouver while not effectively dealing with the affordability crisis. The Broadway plan is not about addressing affordability in a meaningful way or quality of life or livability or even taking into consideration climate change awareness or even city planning for the public, public good. Instead, it is about cramming as many addresses as high off the ground into the area. The plan, in my opinion, is all about raising as much property taxes for the city and the province as possible. What is the soul of Vancouver? Big question. Honestly, I don't know. However, I know that views of the ocean, the North Shore Mountains, and Stanley Park from a multitude of spots across the city are an integral part of the vibe and feeling in the city. The physical setting of our city is so special. Do not destroy the beauty by plastering luxury high-rise towers everywhere and thereby granting the views to only very few privileged people who can afford the new the new suites on the higher floors. The solution to providing greater housing density isn't high rises or nothing. There is something in between. There is a more climate resilient, less carbon intensive, more family friendly middle ground that will enhance our communities and green spaces and preserve the livability of the city of Vancouver for generations to come. Please pursue an alternative plan based on four to six stories throughout the area with park space in between. Based on an article by Brian Palmquist on City Hall Watch, such a plan would result in an increase of about 50,000 people over time, I believe over the next 30 years. Get city staff to lay out such an alternative plan, model it, and make it publicly available. Please build as they did and do in Paris, not as they do in Manhattan. I don't want to live in Manhattan. That's not what Vancouver is all about. Vancouver deserves to be treated with kid gloves. The Broadway plan is a sledgehammer. Please accept the Broadway plan for information purposes only. Please refer it back to staff for neighborhood-based planning with affected communities to adopt human-scaled forms of affordable development in the form of low mid-rise options, which adequately reflect and accommodate the unique context of the various neighborhoods and the broader context of Vancouver as a whole. I ask that you bring the new Broadway plan back to council after the municipal elections this fall. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much uh, for speaking to us this evening. There are no questions for you. Uh, you are very clear. Thank you. Speaker 138, Barbara May. Hello. Yes, we can hear Hello. you. Hello. Yes, we, we can okay. hear you. Go ahead. Okay, good. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and uh, Council. I'm uh, one of the directors of the Upper Kitts Residential Association. We have a little over 400 members on our email list. Uh, the Upper Kitsilina Residents Association is dismayed with the major overdensification plan for the Broadway corridor and surrounding areas and asks you to reject the report as written. 
before any housing plan is created, we need the actual data on how many residents and newcomers we are building for. Councillor Colleen Hardwick asked for that information long ago and to this day has not received it. Head planner Teresa O'Donnell said the information doesn't exist because the city lacks technology to perform the task. So here we are with a plan that calls for 50,000 new housing units, including scores of 40-story towers, all to be built over the next 30 years based on nothing more than aspirational numbers. Under the Broadway plan, neighborhoods will be transformed, livability will be compromised, communities with official community plans will have their plans repealed. These plans were formed in the days when the city worked with residents and took years to create. The people who voted for you are not happy. Two large rallies, including residents from every neighborhood across Vancouver, small business owners and renters, protested against the plan at City Hall in recent days. Residents feel they were not consulted on the height or form of the building and fear they will be priced out of their homes. Locally owned businesses are being strangled by the construction along Broadway and elsewhere. One important question with all the new housing is affordability. If the reason to have a major plan like Broadway plan doesn't address housing affordability, why have one at all? We all know Vancouver is in the midst of an affordability crisis. The idea of new, more expensive apartments and towers replacing affordable older rentals is diabolical in a city already suffering mass homelessness. And there are many cracks in the mayor's tenant protection plan, despite his claim that it's the best in Canada. Even the Vancouver Tenants Union resorted to protesting at City Hall to show their dissatisfaction with the plan and their fear of coming evictions. Yes, we need to renew the older apartments, but we can do it without tearing everything down. We need more housing, but not by building unsustainable towers. It can be accomplished with low to mid-rise housing, as architects and urban planners in the community have shown us. It's clear that both the city and province are relying on developer fees from tower construction, but these actually add to the cost of housing. The Broadway plan will further promote speculation and inflate land values and reset throughout the affected areas years ahead of the redevelopment that will displace renters and homeowners alike. In our neighborhood, we are seeing more and more for sale signs. One real realtor told us this is happening because people know the Broadway plan is coming and they don't want to live in the city envisioned by the plan, a city of non -cult monoculture glass and steel towers, hyper-gentrification, ever fewer green places, international chain retail, and impossibly high prices. In some, the Broadway plan is misguided. It lacks community input and will have the opposite effect of what we're trying to accomplish in terms of affordability. We need to know who we are building for, and it isn't certainly for the current residents. We implore you, please reject or significantly amend the Broadway plan so it works for everyone. Thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, you're very clear. Um, there are no questions for you. Appreciate very much, though, you speaking to Council. Okay, thank you. Speaker 139, Kathy Hochashka. Me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, up to five minutes. Thank you. Madam Chair, Mayor, Councillors, my name is Kathy Hachashka. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. I am a resident in Fairview, and even though I oppose the Broadway plan, I hate throwing the baby out with bathwater. So I want to leverage everything that is in it, because there's a lot of work, refer it back, do more detailed community engagement, and come back with a more robust and inclusive plan. There's a lot of work in there, 500 pages. You've probably heard of these last couple of days. I've only heard a few of them, but I had a lot of questions about affordability of pricing, supply, the process that the plan went through, and some of the lost revenues that may happen for the city and some of the unintended consequences. I initially was going to talk about some of these questions because there's a lot of them. But in fact, tonight, I actually just want to talk about a few different sort of process tools that may help you. In not only in this Broadway plan, but possibly any other type of zoning or rezoning question. So the first thing, as I said, it's a behemoth of a, of a document, almost 500 pages. Something it would be wonderful to see is a two-page 
term sheet that identifies the and highlights specifics of what the plan's going to do. Another thing, it'd be fantastic to see it about a month before a meeting like this even happens, because with all the reading that you as mayor and council have to do, it's too much to take on in a matter of a couple, a couple of days. Secondly, this is kind of an important one. Whenever I work with businesses, we have to have ways to be able to measure and define success. They're both qualitative uh, measurements and quantitative metrics. I'm going to focus on two specific metrics that I think will help you uh, uh, both not only with this Broadway plan, but any other type of zoning. And quite honestly, by having them, first of all, I know for me, it would answer some questions I have. And I suspect that for people who are in favor and against the plan, it would help them too. So the first metric I would love to see, and I know it exists, is, is something like an inventory continuity schedule. And you could do it by the type of zoning, so be it light industrial or commercial. You could do it by residential for social housing or discounted rental or co-op. And it would show the number of units approved, the, those under construction, and the final numbers. This is a critical piece of information that shows you supply. And in fact, it would help you understand, you know, is there a dearth of 85,000 units or is there a surplus of 120,000 units? That's 200,000 unit difference. Where does it stand in there? That piece of the information, these kinds of metrics, being able for you to look at point blank every time you sit down for a decision like this and to be able to share with the public will allow a really good decision. Similarly, that same kind of continuity, inventory continuity schedule could be shown for zoning capacity, once again, to understand what exists and what could exist. Another type of metric um, is it's actually three variables, um, and I'm going to focus on residential, but it could be applied to commercial, retail, any other thing. And it's, it's going to be what is the actual square footage size for bachelors, bedrooms, one bedroom, two, three bedrooms. The other thing is what's the price per square foot? And then, of course, A times B equals C to get the actual total cost. These are really critical because even though you may hear that, hey, the, the uh, what do you call it, the price per month for a rental is $2,000 per month. Well, that's fantastic until you find out that it's only 100 square feet. So that's not so helpful. Once again, these kinds of metrics, I feel, should be front and center uh, uh, that uh, in front of you now and in front of the public so we can understand whether or not things are getting better, things are getting worse, or they're staying the same. Very, very important to me. Another thing, which is not a metric, um, but it, it talks about, I want to consider some sort of legal types of solutions for how do you look at capturing the land value and, and minimizing the speculative land lift. So something I didn't really see a lot of in the plan was something like rental-only zoning. Another thing was what about co-ownership agreements? Another thing was what about looking in private-public partnerships? Another thing was what about the nonprofits, using more nonprofits? And the final thing, um, which is interesting because the Vancouver plan does talk about this in one of their survey questions, number 24, is what about doing the small scale up zoning of anywhere from three to six stories in neighborhoods, which you've already spoken about before in, in other meetings, in order to minimize the land speculation. Those ideas um, are, are legal concepts that you could basically see whether or not this plan could incorporate this plan or others, or a, an improved version of this plan. Finally, this is not a, this next suggestion is not a small change. It would be a big change, but it would be huge. You know, people need anybody who's in business needs to make profit. Otherwise, they go out of business, and we've seen what happens like to that in the pandemic. It's terrible. So, developers in the construction industry want to mitigate their risks. They want they want some certainty. How do you provide some certainty in some time frames? Well. You provide a framework for them in a plan, like a lot of the details that have flushed out in this plan, and, and be able to say, in this area, this is how you build, this is what you build, this is what you do. And you okay. know what? Whenever they I'm put sorry. their permit I, I'm just forward... Gonna, I'm sorry. Oh. I'm going to have to interrupt you. You've gone well over your time. Um, but I'm going to oh. uh, gonna um, uh, forward... Uh, you have questions from Councillor Hardwick. So, Councillor Hardwick, go ahead. Oh. Oh, okay. Thank you, Kathy. Um, 
You may or may not know that I've been trying to get my hands on housing data pretty much since I was elected. So I just want to go over the list of data that that you were describing and you can confirm for me if it's accurate. Can we do that. Okay. Sure. Well, I don't uh, know what exactly exists, but I know what I'm trying to suggest. Okay, well, I'm just trying to 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 make sure that what I'm asking is is a asking you is aligned. So pipeline of existing development. Check. Yep. Yep. Zone capacity, existing zoning that we can grow into. Check. Yep. Yep. Um, secondary market rental and short term um, market rental um, to determine the, the, the flow of people in and out on faster basis. I didn't have secondary that on my list, market. But, um, but I can see, and, I can understand. It it doesn't, yeah. So the idea is that there would be um, a dashboard that would show the accurate information about these different um, categories so that as we plan for, for density throughout the city, that we're informed by actual evidence. Well, yeah, but I mean, it's it's just factual based stuff. I mean, I, I can't imagine making a decision like this at this size or many other ones without having this kind of information. I mean, this is just inventory. There's nothing more than that. This is this is very sta standard basic stuff. Yeah, it is. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Great. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Hardwick, and um, and thank you very much uh, for calling in and speaking to us. Um, so I'm just going to make an announcement right now, um, not only to um, to all the council, but to anyone who is listening in at this point in time. Uh, we have one speaker in chambers. We have one speaker online. Um, so unless people call in, um, we will be. I, I'll make a call for speakers, but and I will go over the list of, of people who, um, who I had originally called that were not here. But um, at that point, we would then uh, close the speakers list. So. Um, and move to debate and decision. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you the number to call in case you don't have it and you are a speaker and you are listening in. Um, the number is 1-833-353-8610. I'm going to repeat that. 1-833-353-8610. Participant code 1061445-POUND. Again, participant code 106-1445-POUND. It's a point of procedure, Chair. Um, sure, go ahead, Councillor DiGenova. I was wondering when would be an appropriate time um, if I was planning on moving a motion uh, to, to refer debate and decision to the next meeting? What is the next reserve date for this? Is it May 31st? Um, the next reserve date for this meeting is May 31st. Um, so uh, the appropriate time would be at the close of the speakers list um, okay. if we end up closing it tonight. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, um, so um, again, um, if there um, is, perhaps you can let me know staff if, uh, um, or clerks, if 140, 141, 142 are on the line. Just double checking, Chair. But my understanding is no, we do not have Speaker 140, 141, or 142 on the line. Thank you. Um, we are now moving then to Speaker 143, Richard Evans, who is here in person. And councillors, thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Richard Evans and I'm an architect, member of a housing cooperative in False Creek South and chair of the replan committee of the False Creek South Neighborhood Association. My remarks are informed by all of these interests but are my own personally. The Broadway plan and the Vancouver plan, which will soon follow, are basically proposals to upzone first the Broadway corridor and then the rest of the city. I could support the Broadway plan report if it included a section that addressed this central issue directly. We tend to talk openly about improving the resiliency of our systems, but for some reason we are not talking about, or have simply accepted it as a given, the ever-increasing value of the land, which many view as the primary driver 
that will shape the development forms within the proposed Broadway plan. This is also the driver that will destabilize, if, if left unregulated, the existing stock of character homes and affordable rental homes along the corridor and make existing small-scale business interests unviable. All of these interests being at the core of what we consider to be the foundations of complete communities and define what neighborhood character is. The economic basis for whatever we do should support good urban design principles, enable existing interests to grow and prosper, and provide existing renters and affordable housing interests to participate in the economy rather than disenable their participation. Upzoning means that the value of the land will increase. Without measures to temper this value increase, I, and believe many others, fear that the aspirational goals within the plan, sociability, housing affordability, small-scale retail services, sunlit urban spaces, neighborhood character, etc., will be rendered impossible to achieve because we will have cut the economic basis for their existence. Or, we have allowed the unfettered for-profit development model to undermine these important civic values. I believe that we are faced with an economic governance rather than an urban planning challenge. The good governance piece sets the context for the urban planners. In this case, the economics make multi-lots consolidation and high building forms givens in the urban design vocabulary, which creates a significant challenge for our urban design colleagues to overcome. The Broadway plan report section that I would like to see has two parts. The first explaining clearly what the problem is, and the second proposing what to do about it. There's a rationale behind the need for ever higher and higher building forms, and the need for multi-lot assemblies as we've seen along the Burrard Street and Canby Street corridors. What is the rationale? When such rationale is clearly understood, uh, stated and understood, the second part critically examines these financial drivers and provides measures to control the implications of significantly upzoning large areas of the city. We are seeing what these measures could look like within the recent council directive related to False Creek South and the current good work of the city, city Seniors Advisory Committee and the Vancouver Tenants Union. Other speakers have addressed these issues as well. In October 2021, Vancouver City Council set the policy direction in False Creek South to accommodate a significant increase in population based on the following terms. Ensure the retention of existing affordable housing to maximize affordability. Work with the nonprofit sector to deliver all forms of housing tenure. Target an income mix based on Vancouver's rental, uh, renter household income of one third lower income, one third middle income, one third higher income residents, and to integrate every tenure into every corner of the neighborhood. And to include social equity and inclusion for families with children and essential workers. Granted, False Creek South is on city-owned lands, but why not seek out ways to craft policy that applies these principles more widely across the city on privately owned lands? The Seniors Advisory Committee, Vancouver Tenants Union, and other commentators have proposed other measures. Guaranteed housing affordability, embedded social amenities for seniors and families, rights to remain, rental controls tied to units rather than individuals, ceasing public subsidy, subsidy to private landlords, and 50% mandated affordable units rather than the proposed 20%, and targeted retention of service workers who make average salaries and below. It appears that we have the tools to curb the land value increase imperative and make the civic making process work for us rather than the other way around. What we need is the opportunity to implement them, which as I read this situation with respect to the Broadway plan is now. Thank you. Uh, thank you. You do have questions. Um, go ahead, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, thanks for coming in, Richard. Um, I liked what you said about how we need to say what is the problem and then what do we do about it. Um, basically, instead of starting from what the finances of the situation are and how can we accommodate them, I, w I wonder if you could maybe expand on that a bit. Well, I've just been seeing and noticing and listening to the other commentators over the years say that when you in upzone something, then the land value increases. And that's become kind of the, the way of doing things without, it, without any controls to that. It just seems like a, a higher and higher and a no, 
it's a no, no end game. It doesn't it doesn't result in what we're actually looking for in our neighborhoods and our our communities. So I, I suppose I'm just making an appeal to consider that central question to all of this because if we are indeed just accepting the premise that the higher building forms are givens, that means it drives up the property values around. And without um, uh, tempering that lift, as, as the recent other uh, speaker said, we really are just in, in, in something that just grows and grows and grows without giving us the kind of civic things that we're looking for. What about the argument that this is a capitalist system, and if we want housing, it's better to get the expensive kind than nothing. Well, I know I'm a grandfather, and my, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure my grandchildren are going to be challenged to remain. And I'm seeing my friends and colleagues move out of the city, so I don't, I don't see how it can serve everybody's interests to continue this way without changing the way that we think about how, how we're going about this. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks a lot, Richard. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you. And um, sorry, I'm going to advance uh, Councillor Hardwick for questions. Councillor Hardwick. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So um, I, I really also like the way that you put it. What is the problem that we're trying to solve here? Um, growth change is inevitable. It's the only constant. We're, we're looking at growth. What I'm wrestling with here is the difference between promoting growth and managing growth. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that relates back to your question. Have you considered it through that perspective? Well, it just, it just seems to be such a... Um, it's disheartening, actually, to watch the neighborhoods get replaced with buildings that can only provide a small portion of what was there already and at what I consider to be higher higher um, rental rates than, than exist. So maybe it's just a matter of tempering change and doing it more incrementally over time and questioning the central values that we hold around who does what in terms of controlling development and what serves the interests of our communities. So I'm hoping we can find that way. It just feels like a plans like this go for the existing way of thinking about development and that it will serve our interests when it seems to be kind of the other way around. And I guess I'm talking about a rethink of the basic values of what we're trying to do and do it more slowly and incrementally over time so that the existing interests have a chance to participate. And speaking personally, my children can participate and my grandchildren. I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick, and um, I do have a question too. Um, I'm very interested in what you said about uh, emphasizing the nonprofit sector. Um, do you have any suggestions about how that can be done? Um, for example, um, zoning um, to enable, or not enable, but to, to prioritize uh, the nonprofit sector, including co ops, social housing, um, supportive housing, et cetera, or, or any other ideas that you can think of? And, and what do you think about that idea of, of potentially zoning to preferentially um, support those kinds of housing forms? Well, I think it's terrific. I live in a housing co op, and I think it would be fantastic to promote the, that. I also live in a, on a situation that, on city owned land, so it's a, it's a different way of, of looking at the issue and the potential there, I think, is to um, create a zone, a non-profit development zone, so that we can try to do some things differently. Throughout the rest of the city, I think there's other people that can speak to that, um, Corporate House, Housing Federation and non-profit housing people, to see how we can extend that through the rest of the city, because the lens that I'm applying to this is, is probably 
um, within the context of living on city-owned lands and what we could potentially do down there within a community housing trust or something like that so that we really just create a, these zones within the city. So I completely agree with you. Create just zone for non-profit approach to what we're doing. Right. Okay. okay. Thank you. Appreciate that response. And um, uh, there's no more questions for you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much for Thank coming you. in. Really appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Um, I just uh, had the clerk, uh, sorry, the uh, yeah, um, inform me that uh, some speakers are beginning to call in. I'm going to announce the number one more time so that in case somebody didn't get it earlier, they get it now. Um, because we are, uh, as I say, we don't have that many people on the line, but we have some. And at the point where we don't have any more on the line, we will. I will be closing the speakers list. Um, so speakers, if you um, are listening now, please, and you haven't yet spoken, please call in 1-833-353-8610. Again, 1-833-353-8610. One zero six one four four five pound. That's one zero six one four four five pound. So, clerks, if you could tell me what the who, which is the next speaker on the list, I'd appreciate that. One forty-five, is it? One forty-four. Thank you, Olivia Edwards, speaker number one forty-four. Are you on the line? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, and councillors, I, I wanted to uh, represent myself, although I am a board member of the Dunbar Residents Association, but I am tonight just as, a, as an individual, um, because obviously the broadcast plan right now, as it stands, um, doesn't actually um, uh, impact Dunbar proper, but when when it gets to the bank plan, it will uh, it will matter. Initially. We all already are, are seeing most of our our uh, blocks uh, for uh, for businesses um, brought down and and then built up to, up to you know, five stories, which. Um, we we when when we had our a Dunbar vision plan back thirty years ago, um, we accepted at that time that we agreed to having townhouses and that sort of uh, densification on our major routes, uh, for instance, just like you know has been put forward. But we've never been against densification. So, but to get to the Broadway plan. Um, I, I highly oppose the amount of high rises along the corridor, and I'm um, much more in favour of um, just having a more livable stretch uh, on Broadway and behind Broadway, um, so that uh, it's just not wall to wall, um, wall to wall, uh, wall to wall towers. Um, to me, it's it it just totally obliterates um, the livability factor. Um, as which, as I know that it possibly, you know, from from area to area, um, you know, obviously some towers can go in, but not just a, cutting a swath through uh, Broadway and um, having that, that, what we call the, the um, uh, uh, concrete uh, uh, street, basically, wall to wall. And especially in these times of, of um, uh, climate change, where we, we all know that concrete does retain heat, and it will just exacerbate that whole area in terms of heat. So I much prefer, uh, as much as possible, Lower rises um, and maybe even 
extend it further, you know, if, if that's what it takes. Um, I have friends that have an apartment near the Arbutus and Broadway area that have been in their apartment for 20 years. It's a three floor. Um, well, it, it, it does have an elevator. And, you know, they're looking at, you know, re- uh, renovation. Um, and so, but where do they go? You know, they're, they're both professionals. Um, and, you know, I just, I just think it's, it's not going to be very workable for a lot of people when these renovations start to happen. So, uh, where do they go? They're going to go outside of the city for two, three years and then, and then come back, you know, to, to, uh, you know, find that, you know, yes, they, they may have a place in, in the new building that they use to live in that footprint. But um, meanwhile, you know, two, three years, it's, it's, it's just, you know, just changing their whole life. So I totally disagree with just the amount of, of uh, renovation that will, will possibly happen. And um, just, um, I, as it stands, I just disagree with how it is going forth. And I think it really needs to go back to the staff to uh, uh for them to have another look because the uh, to to my mind of uh what i've heard uh, from a lot of people th- these towers just wall to wall towers is just uh it's going to destroy the the livability of of vancouver um the the view scape so i i really disagree against it so um and uh, I also don't want to, sen- to lose a sense of neighborhoods as well. So uh, that's that's basically uh, what what my viewpoint is on on this. Thank you very much, uh, very much. There's no questions for you, but very uh, much appreciate the clarity of your presentation and you coming to speak to council. Thank you. Um, so. Um, uh, potentially um, others on the line. I, I'm just seeking um, the support of clerks in identifying who, which speakers are on the line. Yeah. Uh, yes, I believe we have speaker number 145, Ian Poole. Great. I, Ian Poole. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Perfectly. Go ahead up to five minutes. Great. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor and Councillors. My name is Ian Poole. I am a resident of Vancouver, and I work as a public elementary school teacher in Vancouver as well. Tonight, I recommend that you receive this plan and refer the plan back to city staff for significant improvement and further public consultation. As the Broadway plan aims to build thousands of homes without including any definite plans for new schools, new parks, or new community centers, it really is an incomplete and negligent plan. As an elementary school teacher, I see firsthand that neighborhood schools are paramount for supporting families for enhancing community connections, and for encouraging placemaking within a neighborhood. Yet since city staff have not sufficiently partnered with the Vancouver School Board to identify land for future schools, the Broadway plan simply does not support the families that will be living along the Broadway corridor, potentially for generations. Furthermore, in the Fairview neighborhood where I live, the two closest elementary schools, False Creek Elementary and Henry Hudson, are already operating at full capacity. There's no more room for any more students. This is an abandonment of families and a complete disregard of the city's responsibility to support its residents by seeking to build homes for families where there are no available neighborhood schools for their children to attend. Additionally, since specific new parks and community centers are not included in the Broadway plan, city staff seem to be completely unaware of the needs of families. Additionally, Uh, The Broadway plan does not include enough provisions to ensure that it will be an affordable location for families to live. Um, As suggested by UBC's Patrick Condon, City Council should make an an amendment to the plan to set and meet a target of a minimum of 50% affordable non-market housing along the corridor. And he suggests housing that is pegged to 30% of average city household income. Conan also explains that in doing so, council will signal to the land markets that their value estimates will need to adjust to this demand and the ridiculous land price inflation now raging on this corridor will be quelled. 
In my opinion, an amendment such as this would clearly support families who are struggling through the housing unaffordability crisis in Vancouver. As it stands now, the Broadway plan does not provide clear, specific details on how to support families. Rather, I view that it signifies an overall abandonment of families. So if you care about families in Vancouver, you will refer it back to staff for significant improvement and for further public consultation. Thank you. That's everything. Yep. Thank you. Uh, you do have questions? Councillor Hardwick, go ahead. Thank you, Ian. Several of your comments relate to the infrastructure needed to support the plan's proposed population growth. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you think about the population growth figures that staff have used to formulate this plan? Have you looked at that? Oh, um, yeah, I certainly have. I And I do have significant concerns. Um, for example, in creating their projections, um, I learned that staff have actually backed into their growth estimates to figure out the maximum number of people that they could that they could jam into this area, um, which is really an illogical top-down approach as opposed to, you know, starting with the best data available and then working out to see how many people would uh, reasonably need to be housed in the scope area as well as across the rest of the city. Um, so really the result being this this ludicrous plan to house an additional uh, 140,000 people and only 7% of the city's land mass. And in my opinion, this kind of density will not only result in huge land inflation, but also um, you know, increased pressure on existing residents, neighborhoods, and like I mentioned, as well as parks, schools, and amenities for where there are no detailed plans. So what I heard is you think that that council should refer this motion or to refer the plan rather. Um, Absolutely, specific yeah. Amend in specific amendments. Sorry, Councillor, can you repeat your question? I lost you there a bit. And so, in addition, to, so refer or are there specific amendments that you'd like to see? Oh, oh, absolutely. Um, uh, for example, I would. Uh, um, see the council refer the plan back to staff that uh, the, the, we have to have further neighborhood-based consultation uh, in which staff actually listens to what residents have to say. Um, I, I believe that staff need to be using census data-based job and population growth forecast to form, formulate development needs. Um, also really add highly detailed school and public amenity development plans, which are directly linked to the, the uh, population growth forecasts. Um, and one I already mentioned, of course, uh, connected to Condon's article is the idea of increased affordable non-market housing to 50% or more. Um, and something I had mentioned before, um, but very important is the idea of using sustainable wood frame and mass timber construction that uh, other other speakers have mentioned before also throughout the scope area. Um, that's for starters. That's where I'd I'd, I'd go for recommendations and amendments. List. Great, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great, thank you, um, Councillor Hardwick, and uh, thank you very much for calling in and speaking to council and answering those questions. I'm just going to start going down the list because there's a number of uh, callers that are now um, coming in on the line. So I'll start going from the number we just finished, which was 145. Well, wow. um, sorry. Thank you. Are you nervous? Uh, that's the speaker who, did, who hasn't I, I hung up. Well. I'll let. Great. Appreciate it. Okay. Are you good? Thank you. Speak is speaker 146, Stefan Nielsen, on the line? Just checking. No. Okay, is uh, 147, Cheryl Grant? No. 148, Caroline Ramsey? No. 149, Janice von Bergman? No. 150, Colin McGrath. No. 151, 
Aiko Osugi? Yes. I'm here. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Go ahead. Please. My name is Aiko Osugi. I'm a resident of Vancouver, and I'm against, I oppose the Broadway plan. I'm sorry if you cannot hear me. It's because I have to get off the bus. I'm uh, at the busy corner of Alma. We can hear you. you. You're very clear. Okay. Yes. Just a second, please. Um, yes, go ahead. Broadway, I, I, I oppose this plan because it will turn Vancouver into concrete jungle of towers. And there is no provision for additional school or parks. And only a small portion of with rent is going to be with rent for average income earners. Besides, this plan will displace the current renters and cast shadows over its vicinity. There was a letter to the editor yesterday, and um, the letter writer mentions of Post Creek, South and North, Yale Town, Cold Harbor, as an example of successful development. However, these areas, Post Creek, South and North, Yale Town, Cold Harbor, previous to the uh, development, they didn't have lively neighborhoods as the Broadway corridor with Fairview Slope, Kitsilano, Point West Point Grey, which we have very lively neighborhoods. I think it's a, it's a grave mistake to go ahead, go ahead with the Broadway plan. I have been a proud resident of Vancouver for the past over 46 years. I started with a small room in the house, working as a secretary. Now I'm fortunate to have own a house in West Point Grey. I want Vancouver to continue to be a place where all the people can enjoy and be happy about the green space. Please reconsider. Please do not go ahead with this Broadway plan. Thank you very much. That's all. That's great. Thank you very much. That was very clear. Um, there are no questions for you. I, again, appreciate you calling in. Speaker 152, empty as pop -up. I'm here. Yeah, go ahead. You're, you're very clear. Up to five minutes. Uh, thank you for constantly for hearing me this evening. Um, very concerned about the Broadway plan. Um, uh, we live at uh, West 10th in Alberta uh, in a three-story older apartment building, which is likely to be torn down at, uh, for higher uh, price building. Uh, my partner works just a few blocks away, uh, walks to, and has long hours, um, you know, 10 a.m. to 10 uh, p.m., um, and comes home for lunch and supper. It's only 10 minutes away. So if we're displaced, uh, you know, with the promise of coming back to the building a few years later, where are we going to go in the meantime? Right? Uh, in, in an affordable area. And, and, and this will be a serious displacement for us. So we're very, very concerned about what what's going to happen to us. Where are we going to go um, to make room for a new development? And where are we going to go in the meantime? And will it, will it be affordable? You know, it's going to be a big displacement of, of where we are in our lives. Very concerned about this uh, Broadway plan and how fast it's moving along. You know, I, it, it, this, is the, this is what I told the mayor. Um, that, you know, wherever there is SkyTrain, there's going to be development. SkyTrain is not about development. I mean, SkyTrain is not about transit, generally. It's about development and speculation and uh, 
building these towers along a broadway corridor as others have said is is really really going to change our lives uh not for the better so uh i i do oppose this plan and and uh, uh as other speakers have said i caution it going forward quickly uh, send it back to staff um consult the community who are going to be affected by this plan um in terms of what where will we go what about schools and parks there's so many things at stake for the livability of this uh, this city thank you so much um thank you um and there are no questions for you very much appreciate you taking the time to call in speaker 153 ward stirrett no Okay, a speaker 154, Neil Adolf. Yes. Neil Adolf, if you can hear me, go ahead. Can, can, can you hear me? Yes, you're just fine. Oh. Go ahead. Thank you, Councillor. Um, uh, my name's Neil. I'm uh, a resident of the Mount Pleasant area, um, and I, I want to kind of speak in support of the broad, Broadway plan. Um, I'm quite excited about it. When I saw it, I, I appreciated how ambitious it was. Um, and I recognize that it wasn't a complete plan. Um, it's a, a plan that's going to take 30 years to develop. And in those 30 years, um, those, those, some of those details that aren't quite visible right now will be uh, made clear just by doing the work. Um, one of the things that I really am excited about with this plan is that it's actually, to my mind, going to improve affordability and sustainability in the, in the city. Um, because what it's going to do is it's going to produce 50,000 new space for 50,000 new residents. And 70% of those spaces are actually going to be rental. Um, now, I am fortunate now, shockingly, and I have no idea other than through, through good fortune and a whole lot of undeserved privilege, um, I, I am actually fortunate enough to be an owner um, in, and a millennial. Um, the vast majority of my friends will never be able to own a home in, in property in Vancouver, and they're renting um, if they're living in Vancouver at all. Um, and as renters, sometimes they're not in good walkable neighborhoods. Sometimes they're they're having to rent a basement, um, and it puts them in really unsecure or insecure rental situations. Um, sometimes with landlords who don't actually follow rental regulations uh, that are made by the city or by the province. Um, and what excites me about this plan is it actually is going to produce a whole lot of purpose-built rental, um, and that actually increases protections for renters in a lot of ways. Now, there are a lot of affordability challenges and questions around this, of course. Um, I'm excited about what the city has so far announced around rental protection, and I can appreciate that, but I can appreciate that there's a lot of concern about displacement as well. So, so I think part of the work that needs to be done um, in the actual doing of the work is ensuring that there's protection for those folks that are displaced um, and protection for the prices of the units that they come back to, um, protection that the, the, the actual price of the unit um, is or the price of the rental is connected to the unit rather than to the renter as well. I think that's a, a hugely valuable or essential piece of this work. Um, but but one of the other pieces that I'm really excited about is that in addition to 50,000 new residents in the next 30 years, this plan is actually going to build bases for more than 40,000 jobs as well. Um, and that's exciting to me, partially because I believe deeply that the health of our community is actually dependent on the health of working people. Um, and the availability and accessibility of their work in their everyday lives. Um, and having neighborhoods that are walkable or transit accessible, where people can work and live up in the same space or within walking distance of their home, um, is one of, an, one of the incredible things about how you build quality of life within a city and that within a city plan. Um, I'm, admittedly, I'm not originally from Vancouver. I'm from the prairies originally. and Part of what attracted me to Vancouver was this possibility of being connected to both a neighborhood that felt like a neighborhood, and I'm in Mount Pleasant, so I'm fortunate to have that in a lot of ways, um, but also a neighborhood where I could walk everywhere. My hometown is a car-based city. Um, that doesn't interest me both for my personal life right now or for the future of, of the city that I want to live in. So I, I moved to Vancouver very much aware that I was coming to a place that felt um, and, and was moving in a direction that was making and focusing on accessible transportation and accessible communities and neighborhoods. You can't have an accessible community and neighborhood without density. You can't have it um, in a good way, uh, in a way that is sustainable for economies without having uh, more people living in a neighborhood. 
And sometimes that means taller towers. Sometimes that means uh, shadows over our neighborhood. Um, but it's it's a it's an exchange that I'm actually okay with uh, as a as someone who lives in Vancouver, um, because I've seen the exact opposite, and it's not a healthy city. It's not a place where people thrive. Um, the the other things that I'd like to highlight um, are I I I, I'm, I work in the charitable sector, um, and one of the areas of work that to, for, that we are involved in um, is in food security. And the only thing that I want to mention as as a, a space for consideration or growth um, on this plan is what this means for the food security of these new residents. Um, and I mean this both in the hyper-local development of, of food or growth of food, but also in the sense of emergency preparedness. Um, one of the things that in, really popped up as a result of the floods and the work that we do um, prior to the floods as a result of the wildfires um, is that localized communities have underdeveloped their own localized capacity for growing food. Um, and what excites me about this plan is that there's a real opportunity to build into these 50,000 new residents and 42,000 new workplaces some development of localized food growth. And um, if you that, could just wrap it up, you're, you're, just, you're at your time. So, yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll wrap it up there. Thanks, Councillor. Okay, that's great. Appreciate that. That was very clear. Um, there are no questions for you, but appreciate you calling in. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker 155, Lucy Ferrari. No. Speaker 156, Michelle Scar. Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Go ahead. Great. Hello, Council. I am a young professional living with my parents in Burnaby, calling in support of the Broadway plan. Back in 2013, when I started university, I was also living with my parents and commuting to UBC. I was on transit for three hours every day before I decided to move to a basement suite closer to campus. It was somewhat affordable because it was a two-bedroom suite that we turned into a three-bedroom suite because we put up cubicle walls in the living room to form the third bedroom. We also only had a toaster oven. There was no real oven. Then I moved again into a house with six roommates. So there were seven of us sharing a single kitchen. It was almost always in use and often messy. Unfortunately, these types of living arrangements are not uncommon in Vancouver. My point is, the options for renters here are dismal, and they've just gotten worse since my time in university. It doesn't have to be this way, and I think the Broadway plan creates a solid foundation to provide more homes for everyone. Increasing density in cities is explicitly mentioned as a climate solution in the latest IPCC report. And even if that wasn't the case, building homes closer to jobs in a central location makes sense. I would like to see some improvements made to the plan, including increased height and density across the entire plan, especially the areas that are currently just single-family homes. I would like improved renter protections because we need more homes but we must do as much as possible to avoid hurting the renters who already live there. I would also like to see bike lanes added to Broadway to encourage active transportation and provide easy access to the many businesses and services along Broadway. I also think you could do away entirely with parking minimums because there are many people, myself and the last speaker um, mentioned, he enjoyed walking everywhere, um, who, enjoy, who prefer to live car free. I hope you value not only the opinions of those who already live in the area, but also the thousands of future residents and previous residents as you consider this plan. Housing is a regional issue and the choices you are making absolutely affect me. And even though I don't live in Vancouver right now, I would love to move back. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your time. Um, and you do have questions. Councillor Fry, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, thank you for sharing your perspective, and I, and I hope you are able to move back soon uh, to Vancouver. Um, I'm curious, though, when you talk about, and I totally uh, appreciate you sharing the sort of shared accommodation perspective and what that was like. Um, 
when we contemplate adding new housing for this, and, and when you think back onto the, the kind of rents you were paying during those shared accommodation days, are you, do you have an expectation that we'll be delivering rental uh, apartments that could kind of meet those expectations of that kind of rent, that kind of affordability? Um, no, because that was many, well, not that many years ago, but it was a few years ago. Um, I think when there are more units available, um, it creates like downward pressure on rent, right? So like, if there's actual like competition and landlords have to like find people to live in their units, then they will lower the rent. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Th- okay. So th- that's in theory. Do you have a, a a sense of like where we should, should we target them at a certain like income strata? Do you think that there's, we should be targeting affordability and we should kind of have an affordability metric or should we just, are you suggesting we just see where the market takes us? Yeah, I'm really not sure. Um, I think personally, I think like more housing is a great start. Um, I know people like to say that they would like to see like more multifamily units and like three bedrooms. But like right now I live with my parents in a single family home. And like this could totally be a house that like children could be living in. But because I'm here and so is my brother. It's like it's all these adults living in this single family home. We could very easily be living in smaller units if there were enough small units everywhere that it was like more feasible. Fair enough. I'm sure you're still her babies to your mom, but yes. <laughs> um, no, thank you. I just I really wanted to kind of zero on in the affordability piece because that's what we're struggling with too, right? Is how do we ensure that there, there is that affordable housing for folks and we're not just introducing pure market level, which as you know, is quite expensive nowadays and not necessarily affordable to yeah. average incomes in, in the city of Vancouver. I, That's what I, we're struggling with. I think there's just not enough. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Like if, well, you, you, if for... you go to like, try to apply for rentals, like there's, there's like hundreds of people applying. So yep. we need yeah, more. no, for sure. The vacancy yeah, rate is very low. Line. And, uh, we definitely need more supply. We, we need a, a variety of supply too. But. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Thank you for speaking to us. Great. Uh, thanks, Councillor Fry. Um, you do have more questions. Councillor Swanson, over to you. Uh, you might be on mute. Councillor Swanson, we still can't Sorry. hear you. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you for coming in. Uh, you don't have to answer this if you don't want, but I'm just wondering, would you and your brother be cool with paying like three grand a month each? for a one bedroom apartment? No, probably not. We would probably still live at home until the rents drop. But the rents aren't going to drop unless you guys add more housing. It's actually just going to get worse if you don't do anything. Um, yeah. <laughs> what about the idea of trying to get more non-market housing that actually had cheaper rents? I love that. I love, I totally support more non-market housing. I, but I also think like uh, until we have governments that are going to like, like provincial and federal governments that are going to put a ton of money into this non-market housing, like we still need more market housing. Most people live in market housing and the wait lists for non-market housing are like years long. So I think we just need more all around. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Swanson. And thank you so much. Um, That's it for your questions, but really appreciate you speaking to Council tonight and answering those questions. Speaker 157, Sydney Ball. Hello. Yes. Um, You're very clear. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I live in a building in Mount Pleasant. It's not two blocks away from Broadway in the plan. Um, and it's definitely considered, quote unquote, aging housing stock. Um, it's over 100 years old and it could use improvements, but it's safe and it would be able to last many more decades. The issue that I've seen in other buildings isn't this natural aging out of rental stock, but landlord negligence and a complete disregard for the safety of renters. For buildings that truly need to come down, 
I'm wondering how long landowners have been profiting off of gambling with tenants' lives and waiting to cash in on the increased land value that this plan will bring them. Meanwhile, the proposed targets for non-market housing in this plan, I think, look, look little more than a wish to me based on past city plans. I've seen a lot of speakers talk to the difficulty of making social housing viable, and to that I say that this council and developers and landlord interests that hold power in the city have not demonstrated an intent in pursuing the changes needed to make more public housing possible. We currently rely on the private market to subsidize social housing while still keeping their profit margins, and this will never deliver the, the results that we need. Our political leaders would have to first actually admit that property prices do need to come down. This plan needs adequate measures put in place for the expropriation of buildings that have been left to decay and to purchase houses in some of the single-family zones before prices climb um, to turn them into truly decommodified housing, which means social housing, housing, housing built by unions, co-ops, and fully public housing. Uh, we need to look beyond private-public partnerships to build it, and they will the, what we have will never serve people on pensions, welfare, and disability who cannot be afford, afford to be ignored. The proposed tenant protections by Mayor Kennedy Stewart are much better than what's being proposed by staff, but they also need a component of enforcement. I have been witness to city staff administering the tenant relocation protection policy ignore language in the policy um, to find vulnerable tenants, quote, comparable housing. They've ignored tenants with disabilities or family structures that dictate that they need the same amount of space after being them evicted. Every eviction is a transfer of wealth from tenants to landlords, and every rehousing under this plan will be a loss in the quality of life for low-income residents. Some speakers have argued that this plan is a beginning that we can look into making it equitable later. I think that means sacrificing low-income tenants in the name of wealth accumulation and saying that low-income people don't belong here. Um, if you're worried about how to eke out more affordability later, uh, the value of apartment buildings is going to increase the day this plan is released, and so it's going to be further out of reach. We need the city to support options that curb speculation and the reliance on private developer cash, like progressive pop property tax, which this council did not support, expropriation of buildings, uh, fines and business license for consequences for poor maintenance, which New Westminster has been doing a much better job of, vacancy control, right of first refusal for public purchase of apartment buildings to go up for sale, much more rental-only zoning everywhere, and um, also defunding the police, even though I know that don't, didn't work out. Um, that's all I have to say. Uh, that's, uh, that was great and clear, but you have questions as well. Councillor Swanson, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for coming in, Sydney. Um, I just wondered if you could expand for a minute on um, the benefits of if we could expand vacancy control to this area or maybe to the whole city like we have we have got it in the SROs now. What would it do for affordability, do you think? Well, besides obviously just adding um, fewer increases in rental prices, what it is is in um, it removes the profitability of eviction and therefore is an anti-speculation ma manner. So right now, um, I've been in a lot of buildings along the corridor and the people that are most at risk are seniors because they've lived in their buildings for the longest time. Um, and that's because they pay the lowest rents below market. So they have the largest rent gap, as the um, Vancouver Tenants Union report said. Um, and that makes them targets. It makes them targets for harassment. It makes them targets for legal evictions. It makes them targets for illegal evictions. And it means that buildings that go up for sale usually advertise how many um, below uh, market rents they have. So this is also a measure for anti-speculation, I think, because of that. Were you part of doing the, one of the volunteers that helped do the VTU study? Uh, I did. I did door knocking, so I talked to a lot of tenants. And, um, what, was and the, was, what was the rent gap that you found between um, in in each building? The difference <laughs> between to... the lowest and the highest rent. 
I'm going to have to re-refer to the report, I think, <laughs> but it's definitely in there. Oh, um, <laughs> but it's um, it's much larger for people that have obviously lived for more than a decade. And I think there was um, a like surprisingly significant amount of tenants that have actually lived in their buildings for more than a decade. Here I've got it. So we've got a 64% rent gap for studio up to a 69% rent gap for a two-bedroom. Um, that's a lot. That's a ton more. <laughs> it's a huge amount. If um, tenants were given the right of first refusal at their same rent in a new building, do you think there'd be enough places for them to go to in the interim with a landlord top up? Absolutely not. I think um, it's similar to right now where like the TRPP is just offering tenants kind of um, some Craigslist posting and then making people compete with their neighbors over trying to get in on those Craigslist posts. Um, I don't really see how that's going to work. I would like it to be really strongly enforced. And so if it doesn't work, that means that the development doesn't go through. And I think that's the only thing that this council can actually do to protect people. Um, yeah. If it doesn't work, don't pass the development. So not no build, no demolition permit unless all the tenants are housed to their satisfaction? Absolutely, like comparable suites. Um, I also, to be honest with you, with, you know, buildings like the one that I live in, I don't see any reason for it to go down at all um, for a little while longer, especially because I already live in a pretty dense neighborhood of three, four lockups, and there's a lot of uh, single-family zoning around that could be up zone with yeah. decommodified housing instead. And that's it for well over your time, Councillor Swanson, but um, thank you for those questions and thank you so much, uh, Michelle, for answering the questions and for speaking to Council. Thank you. Speaker 157, Sydney Ball. That, that was Sydney. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, I just had it on the wrong, wrong row there. Uh, Speaker 158, Daniela Elsa. Yes, I'm here. Hello? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Go ahead. Uh, dear councillors, mayor, and city staff, I'm Danielle Elza, Vancouver resident. Uh, it is very hard to embrace this plan. So much of what is at stake has already been spoken about. I would like to reiterate an aspect that Vancouver has to not only contend with, but have to curb and even actively fight against, and that is the financialization and commodification of our homes, which is a global phenomenon, really, so it's not just Vancouver to be blamed, but w and way beyond Vancouver, but directly impacts the affordability and livability and the quality of life here, which is what we want as goals. So how will we prevent... Uh, speculators from owning the houses and using them as mine, a mining industry for profit, uh, which is another way that industry has been defined. Who will own the buildings we built? I live in a co-op, and the, the people who live in the co-op own the building. And yes, we do rent the, the land from the city, which is a great way for the city to uh, secure that land and make sure only affordable housing is built. Living in inadequate housing is not a personal failure, though this attitude still persists. Franz Timmermans, vice president of the European Union, says, quote, social housing is not just for the poor. You do not have to be poor anymore to not be able to afford a roof over your head. And so this is a, a social failure problem. We have shifted more of the and more societal neglect and dysfunction onto the individual and burdened them with what is not that they're doing. This plan is endangered, in other words, to exacerbate the very issue it purports to solve if it does not have stringent policy to protect our homes from this global epidemic of turning them into a mining industry for profit. That is why just building more housing is not going to solve our problem, but protecting that housing from being commodified might solve the taxing problem that allows people to sit on land to speculate with it and without putting it to work as well. As you think through this plan, I hope you will seriously consider the implications and consequences it entails. These are the few obvious ones for me that I would like to see. Protect existing affordable housing with a vengeance. Uh, put in place those protections to avoid displacing people or scattering communities. Do not replace buildings that do not need replacing. We're seeing examples of this already playing out. Do not tie affordability to the market, tie to actual incomes. Secure that rents match income and not what the market bears. 20% of the market is inaccessible to many, and the market is not interested in well-being of people, but our government should be. A recent report showed that Canadian cities simply aren't affordable for our young people aged 15 and 29, and 
and I have two sons in that range. Seniors in lower and moderate income households despair. You need to think not only about survival, but how people will thrive in these spaces. And many have spoken to this. Approved density and zoning that is human scale, not discriminatory, promotes well-being, allows for communities that exist to continue to exist, and protects against speculation. When you move people from a place, move the whole community. Don't just move them individually and scatter them. These are very important. Uh, build incentives uh, from the get-go to push builders and developers in the right direction. Somebody asked the question, how do we manage this uh, balance? Well, government's job is to direct and guide the market, uh, and your job is to be ethical and moral about it, which the market isn't. Apartment buildings, or especially co-ops, have strong independent communities, and they support their members on multiple levels uh, in adversity. So keep them together, because otherwise you'll have to be taking care of them. Ban rent evictions through rent hikes. Protect renters and tenants. Vancouver has the highest rental eviction rate in the country. In Denmark, they propose a 10-year ban on renovations and rent evictions, and they settled for five. And basically, that what it resulted is aggressive investors have moved other places with less protection, like Vancouver, for instance. This allowed for the construction of new properties to add apartments to cut on the speculation. And this is candy land for REITs, real invest, in, estate investment trusts, and speculations in various shifting forms. They keep shifting under our feet not to mention the illicit and criminal money which are circulating the economy and competing with regular incomes. About $5.3 billion of those are deemed to have gone through the real estate uh, in B.C. alone, which is sufficient amount to raise the property housing prices by 5% and deprive public contribution in tax revenue. Give viable co-ops, heritage hubs, and historic attractions on city land 99-year leases, which will not only show that city staff are bargaining in good faith, but also will display goodwill to co-plan with these establishments established and successful communities, then negotiate possibilities for redevelopment. Don't hold them hostage. Build more co-ops with the mixed tenure. If this if it passes, the plan repeals and annuls a number of community plans. Why is this not a further testimony that the city continues to avoid engaging and working with neighborhoods and already improved community plans and prior engagement? This erodes trust. It makes us feel that the city staff is not bargaining in good faith. And let's get creative with the way we build new buildings. Do not aim for another downtown look. Mining our homes for profit is a man-made crisis. Money has been divorced from value, morals, and ethics, and it is on you to regulate the vulture and savage practices that privates from basic human rights like a home and a shelter. And ultimately, a segregated society is prone to radicalization and polarization. And please, 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 let's do our homework and not allow that to happen in Vancouver. Thank you. I think, thank you uh, very much. And um, if there are no questions, you're very clear. Appreciate you speaking to council. Thank you. Have a great night and yeah. good luck. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Speaker of 159, Anne O'Sullivan. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yep, we can. Oh, hi. Yes, so um, thank you, um, Mayor and Council, um, for all these proceedings. My name is Anne O'Sullivan. I am opposed to the Broadway plan. And I, um, I thank the previous speaker for her very um, astute analysis, because that's sort of what I would say, but not in as much detail as with um, as many um, possible solutions. Um, my original thought of um, looking at this plan is it's going to displace a lot of people. There's enough disruption and displacement of people right now with all that's happening with um, floods and fires. Um, I think the, the strongest um, thing we have in this climate fight is community resilience. And if you destroy a community, um, there, goes, there goes your number one factor in being able to deal with all the things that are going to be happening. Um, as climate change unfolds. Um, so that's just one thing on top of what everybody else has said. And the other concern I have is um, with all the embodied carbon, um, with the high rises that are proposed, um, once you go beyond a certain height, um, you increase the amount of materials you need, you increase the amount of um, carbon that goes into the processing of materials, you increase the amount of excava excavation, you increase the amount of digging that you have to do. And I just don't think it's the way to go when every um, ton of carbon counts right now. Great. Thank you. Um, and uh, that was very clear. Uh, there are no questions for you. Really appreciate you calling in. Thank you. Um, speaker 160, Nathan Edelson. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Carr and uh, members of council and, and the staff uh, for bringing forward an important plan for consideration 
as we struggle to address a growing housing crisis and to take advantage of expanded rapid transit system. I'm the project, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm the project manager for the False Creek South Neighborhood Association's Replan Committee, but today I'm not representing that organization. I'll speak as an individual who worked for the city for 25 years on an array of citywide policies, as well as neighborhoods, including Collingwood, Yale Town, and the downtown east side. Today I'm also speaking as an individual who lives in False Creek, in Fairview Slopes. I agree that a considerable amount of housing can and should be added to the Broadway corridor, but I have four concerns about the draft plan and would ask that you instruct staff to bring, back, to bring it back to residents and an array of outside experts, experts and members of council for further consideration. First, as others have stated, I'm very worried that despite some of the creative, and I think they're heartfelt, restrictions that are embedded in the plan, it will result in a significant loss of existing affordable housing, as others have said, and that much of the new housing will be considerably smaller and more expensive. Even though this is not a wholesale rezoning, it will still likely uh, lead to a great deal of speculation as buildings are sold with the expectation of considerable increases in height and density. The first thing that will happen is taxes will increase. This will, uh, all, this will likely lead to disinvestment in existing buildings as well as making it more likely that they will need to be redeveloped. Second, I would suggest that the staff members and, of, and members of council meet with the architects and others who have argued that property designed Properly designed low-rise buildings can provide as many units as high-rise or a similar number. If this proves to be true, new development with some taller buildings near the stations and, others, and other strategic locations will result in a much higher level of livability and neighborliness than a market-driven mix of low-rise and very tall buildings. Third, I would also suggest that much of the development should be undertaken by non-market enterprises. There are a, growing, a considerable and growing number of them, and these are dedicated to providing affordable housing. Fourth, all of the rent control measures should be tied to the units, not to the current residents, and that all such units should be managed by non-market companies or social enterprises. This is the best way to ensure that an array of services and healthcare workers, students, low-income uh, residents um, who are currently live in the area will be able to remain into the future uh, near expanding employment opportunities. I'd like to conclude by reminding you of some of the motions the council unanimously adopted a few months ago to guide the future of False Creek South. First, existing buildings should be maintained for as long as possible because they provide more affordable housing and would have unnecessary environmental impacts if demolished prematurely. Uh, in Central Broadway, by the way, this would include the Heritage Co-op. Second, new buildings should be wood frame because they will be more environmentally sustainable than concrete. Third, community amenities and urban design matter. They contribute to livability and help residents of different incomes and tenures to meet one another and form the kinds of relationships that can significantly reduce the sense of social isolation that has become too common in our city. As one councillor mentioned, Vancouver needs more False Creek Souths, and I believe that some of the essence of this can be carried out in the corridor or in parts of the corridor by careful community-based planning. To achieve this, I would suggest that council encourage consultation that engages a diversity of residents and business people to work together with staff and outside, resident, outside experts you know, and residents uh, in a way that respects differences of opinion, generates new ideas, and puts forward innovative policies and zoning that meet anticipated needs, not simply a voting to see which idea was picked as favorite. Surveys of various sorts can be helpful, but genuine sharing of ideas and brainstorming together alternative solutions can help build the kind of communities in which we can all be proud. This is actually how we plan Collingwood Village and Yale, even Yale Town, where many community amenities, parks, neighborhood houses, uh, health care facilities, and social housing were put in place before thousands of new residents moved in. Even in the downtown east side, we were able to add considerable new social and market housing and provide innovative health care services as well as innovative heritage conservation measures, 
by taking seriously the ideas of a diversity of people and, where possible, encouraging them to work together. Respectful debate and trying alternatives should be a hallmark of Vancouver planning as we move forward in a very uncertain and challenging time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and uh, you do have questions. Councillor Hardwick, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Nathan. Less of a question and more of a request. Uh, could you please share your remarks with council if you have not done so already? Yes, I, they're remarks. electronically available. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, and thank you for your legacy of, of community planning in Vancouver. Well, thank you. Great. Um, that's it for your questions. I really appreciate you um, calling in. Thank you so much, Nathan. Thank you, Councilor Carr. Uh, speaker 161. Uh, Council, um, just for your information, we now have um, at least one person in the gallery and 11 speakers online. And I think there's a few more than that um, if, if I have to go back over the list again. So uh, we are unli unlikely, uh, well, it's impossible to get through that many now uh, by, by 10 o'clock. Um, and so uh, I'm going to suggest that we do end at 10 and uh, we'll have to be coming back anyway for debate and decision. But... Um, uh, that's that would make more sense um, unless somebody moves a motion, which of course it's your privilege to do. I'm happy to move a motion um, that we come back for debate and decision on May 31st, Chair. Um, no, that's not appropriate, Councillor Di Genova. Um, uh, at the end of the meeting, we'll we'll end, and there, that is the automatic response. Oh, so so sorry. I thought you said unless someone moves a motion, and sometimes no. that's why they're asking for no. one. I'll take myself off the queue. Thank you. Yeah, I, I meant unless somebody moves a motion to have us go past 10 tonight. Okay, so we are now um, speaker 161, Jordan McDonald. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly, go ahead. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Jordan McDonald and I'm the CEO of Fabric Living. Fabric is a real estate development company that focuses on building multifamily buildings, including purpose-built rental and non-market housing in the city of Vancouver. Uh, the Broadway plan is an area that we are currently actively developing in and plan to be active in for many years to come. I am supportive of the Broadway plan and appreciate all of the hard work that the city of Vancouver staff have dedicated towards this initiative. I also appreciate the mayor and council's attentiveness in listening to all of the speakers to truly understand all of the different perspectives to ensure that they are making the most informed and optimized decision for our city. That being said, I'm calling in to highlight a specific concern that I have about the Broadway plan that is imperative to the success of delivering on the housing objectives of the plan. In the most recent draft of the plan, the site frontage requirement increased from 100 feet uh, to a minimum of 150 feet. This minor tweak in policy will generate two major negative unintended results. A significant reduction in the amount of rental housing that will be built in the Broadway plan, of which approximately 20% will be affordable. And two, a target will be painted on the back of existing affordable apartment buildings within the Broadway plan, as these are typically the properties that benefit from having the minimum 150 feet plus of frontage. Reducing the site frontage requirement back down to 100 feet will focus redevelopment of the unaffordable housing stock. For example, the single family homes, the duplexes, and the commercial properties, which will allow for a more gradual redevelopment of existing affordable apartment buildings within the plan area. The existing unaffordable housing stock is typically owner occupied and the owners are happy to sell and relocate as they are incentivized to do so. We as the developer are happy to pay the landowner a bit of a premium associated with more density as we understand that the owners require this increase in value to be motivated to sell and relocate. This also benefits renters as the redevelopment of the existing affordable apartment buildings would not be the main focus of developers, which would result in a more gradual displacement and, a new, and, and as new apartment buildings are constructed with a 20% affordable component, this will create new affordable options for renters to relocate to as the displacement more gradually occurs. The city as a whole benefits due to less disruption in the community and a more gradual replacement of the affordable rental stock while the new stock is being constructed. This is a win, 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 win. The 150 feet frontage requirement is extremely difficult for developers to achieve when assembling typical 33 foot lots of the unaffordable housing stock, as this would equate to five 33 foot lots being assembled in a row. 
To add additional complexity to the redeveloping the unaffordable housing, there are often duplex properties mixed throughout these land assemblies. This would mean that an assembly of five to 10 different owners would be required to achieve the 150 foot frontage requirement. It is extremely challenging to get five to 10 owners in a row to agree on selling, even if there is a monetary incentive to do so. Getting a few people to agree on anything is difficult. Think about all of the previous speakers uh, and, and all of the different perspectives and opinions. How likely was it to have 10 callers in a row that have the exact same opinion? Not likely. The less properties required for an assembly, the exponentially higher chance we as developers have of assembling the land and delivering the rental housing the city so direly need. Considering that the 150 foot frontage or the new 150 foot frontage requirement that's in the most recent draft of the plan would create significant hurdles for developers to assemble land for the redevelopment of the unaffordable housing stock, the development community will be encouraged to put our focus on acquiring and redeveloping the existing rental apartment buildings that are more affordable, thereby displacing a significant amount of the, uh, of the plan's uh, area's rental population. Not only do we morally prefer not to displace the tenants, we fear the public backlash associated with displacing tenants and what that does for our reputation as developers. The combination of the aforementioned comments will result in significantly less rental being built and the unintended expeditious displacement of a large contingent of the Broadway plan renter population. My request is that Mayor and Council support the plan, but request a small amendment to reduce the frontage requirement from 150 feet back down to 100 feet. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you very much for speaking. You do have questions. Councillor Swanson, go ahead first. Um, I'm, you're a developer, right? Correct. What you said? Could you go over again the danger to current rental apartments that you're saying will happen if we retain if we retain the hundred foot frontage? Is that it, or if we get rid of no, it? No. So, so it was in the more recent or, or the uh, previous versions of the plan. The frontage requirements were somewhere from anywhere from I think 100 to 150 feet. So 100 feet is, is fairly easy to assemble of single-family homes and duplexes. Um, once you get start getting into 150 feet plus, it's very hard to assemble that amount of property. The only properties that typically have that amount of frontage are the apartment buildings because they they are they occupy larger pieces of land. So the development community is basically going to go, okay, well, where's the low-hanging fruit? Well, if, if we need 150 feet, we don't want to go through the brain damage of trying to put together an assembly of 10 different owners that will probably never come together. We'll just go after the apartment buildings and redevelop those. And so it basically puts a bullseye on the back of all of the apartment buildings with this uh, increased frontage requirement. So if we decrease the frontage requirement, the development community can focus on the single family homes and the duplexes that are owner occupied where you're not displacing a bunch of tenants. We don't want to go and displace a bunch of tenants. We don't want to do it morally. Um, we don't think it's ethical. And we also don't want that as part of our reputation. But if the frontage requirements are increased at 150 feet, it encourages us and almost forces our hand. And if you're assembling single family lots, what happens to the price of them as you start your assembly? Does it increase? Well, I mean, the, the, let the, say the single family homeowner or the duplex owner, they should get paid a bit of a premium relative to what their house is worth. Otherwise, they're going to say, forget about it. I'll just stay and live in my house. If you're not going to pay me more than what it's worth, why would, you know, you're knocking on my door. Why would I, why would I sell? I'm happy here. So they need to have some sort of an incentive to sell. Um, so yeah, we pay a bit more for the land and, and, and we need to because we need to incentivize them. A lot of people will say, well, that lift should go to the city. Well, if the lift goes to the city as a CAC, we just factor that into our pro forma. It comes right off the land value. And then we're unable to pay the landowner more than their house is worth and they don't sell. And then the housing doesn't get built, not the affordable component or the, or the market component. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Swanson. If there are more questions for you, Councillor DiGenova, you're next. Thanks so much. And Jordan, you and I have spoken about this before, and I really appreciate you 
um, you bringing sort of this math and, and explaining it to, to council so succinctly. But I'm going to ask you what happens? It, is it going to be unattainable um, if you don't have that extra frontage to sometimes put a land assembly together to actually make a land assembly work? Uh, sorry, I'm not really following the question. Like, well, for instance, mind... for instance, when it comes down to a land assembly, it would mm -hmm. possibly be easier to move forward with 100 feet than having 150 feet. Is that correct? Con considering what's being proposed in the plan, it, you're being yeah, told definitely. you can move forward with land assemblies. But it's almost you can move forward with it, but it's not as easy at 150 feet. I'm I'm just saying, do you feel that it's kind of contradicting itself in the plan a little bit there? A hundred percent. So get you know, getting say three single family homeowners to agree to do something, whether getting you know a bit more for their home than they would if they sold just as uh, on the market as a single family home. Getting three people to agree is hard. It is. It's very challenging. But it'll happen. But then you need to add a fourth and a fifth, and then maybe there's a couple of duplexes in between. Trying to get a, a a group of people, of random people that are in a row to agree on something is it just becomes exponentially more difficult with each with each owner that you try to get on side. Even if there's financial incentives, mo there is a ton of people that are probably fifty percent that aren't that they're just not motivated by money. And so um, you think, oh, they're going to get more money for their for their home, um, they're gonna they're gonna take it and, and move on, but it's not I the case. It's really question challenging for to put you. these together. I put for I've I've put together an amendment on this. I mean, it, full disclosure, I know a number of other counselors have. We'll end up probably with one amendment on this, but I have one. Um, I I've heard from people a hundred feet is the magic number. I've heard from some seventy five ninety nine. Do you just are you suggesting that it be a hundred? Or that it be at least 100, not 150, but the minimum requirement just be 100. So you you'd be okay if it was to go to 99 or 75. That would be okay with you. Yeah, I mean, if if you're going to go to 75 or something like that, I don't think that there's going to be a, many takers on that. Just with the setbacks that are involved in the floor plates and the efficiencies of the building, I just don't think that they're they're viable. But um, that 99 feet or 100 feet, that's 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 a viable, um, you can have a viable project with that. And I think that 150 is just completely excessive and not required. Okay, and and we see this in other large world-class cities, correct? 100 feet isn't of course. outrageous. Oh, of course, of course. Of course. Thank you so much. That's my time, Jordan. Thank you. That, Thank well, you. well time, Councillor. Did you know about um, more questions, though? Councillor Weeb, on to you. Yeah, just a quick question. With a 100-foot frontage and trying to maximize FSR, can you still do a tower in a park, or do you have to have a podium at that level? I mean, yeah, you can you can do a tower on a park, for sure. Yeah, so even with the lower, with the 100-foot, you'd, you'd be able to still get the maximize of square footage um, and be able to do that with the square plates and the setbacks? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Hey, and that is it for your questions now. Thank you so much for answering those and for coming to speak to you, Council. Thank you. Okay, and Speaker uh, 162, Evelyn Jacob. Hi, Councillors. Um, I just want to warn you that I've been waiting so long to speak, um, my battery is starting to die. So if you hear, you know, minutes where there's nobody speaking, that's my battery going. Anyway, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. I'm a lifelong resident of Upper Kitsilano. I'm opposed to the Broadway plan because it fails Vancouver residents on several counts. Many excellent speakers have already told you about some of them, so I'm only going to raise a few concerns. After reading most of the plan, it quickly became clear to me that the Broadway plan, even though it is being promoted as an inclusionary plan, was not written with the interests of all residents in mind. Staff say that they have created a plan that speaks for the many unrepresented voices in our city. However, in doing so, they have chosen to abandon the interest of many longtime residents who have helped build the city, who now fear that they too will be forced to leave the neighbors they love. Building new towers causes a huge land lift, as you have heard, and also it will see property taxes soar. 
Mine went through the roof this year because of the development on my street, and I live up on 14th, not even that close to Broadway. Rising land lift is a great money maker for the city and province, but it kills community. The constant chipping away at established neighborhoods over the past four years, the loss of neighborhood planning and plans, and the growing uncertainty of what changes the Broadway plan will bring is causing increasing anxiety among all residents. As one neighbor who lived through the Camby Street fiasco uh, told onlookers at a recent protest at City Hall, there is no green space on Camby Street, no parks nearby, so children are now forced to play on their balconies. There is no neighborhood left here, she concluded. That's sad. I drove down Oak Street yesterday, and it is in the process of being gutted with land assemblies everywhere. In Upper Kitsilano, neighbors are worried that the city wants them gone. And just where are all these people, many on fixed incomes, supposed to go? For the past four years, people in my neighborhood have lived in fear of the next city plan, especially seniors. They take no comfort in the plan, and I don't blame them. This is what the city's website says about seniors. The seniors' population is growing locally and nationwide. Seniors will represent 25% of Canada's population by 2036. Governments at all levels need to plan for this shift and develop increasing services and supports for a growing number of older, more vulnerable seniors. Since seniors are the fastest growing population in Vancouver, I expected to find something about them in the Broadway plan. But when I looked, I was shocked to find that there are no plans, nothing. And it's my understanding that there are no locations for community amenities or for new parks in the city, even though the city and TransLink agreed to provide them along the Millennium Line extension in 2018. And yet staff must have realized when they were drawing up this plan that many baby boomers are now fast approaching retirement and that soon be, there will soon be a huge demand for assisted living facilities, for services and amenities for, throughout the city. This should, have been in plan, this should have been planned for yesterday. If we don't get going on it now, we are going to find ourselves in a terrible mess. Council should not approve a plan that doesn't include this. I think the main thing that needs to be said about the Broadway plan is that it fails to provide affordability. Many speakers have already mentioned this, and I think the point really needs to be driven home because the word affordability has been lost in discussions about housing. Vancouver, like many other cities, is experiencing an affordability crisis, not a housing crisis. We know this from census numbers. The affordability crisis is due in large part to the financialization of housing, which is happening worldwide, as other speakers have noted. Both the city and province benefit when the price of housing increases because they have let themselves become utterly reliant on developer fees and tax to stay in business. So I say to all of those who support the false narrative that more new housing will be cheaper than what we have now, you are wrong, wrong, just plain wrong. Housing is going to get far more expensive, especially when land transfers transfers out of private ownership into corporate hands, where the end goal is maximizing profits. Let me put it this way. There's been a flood of new housing in Vancouver over the past five years. Have rental prices decreased? Sorry, no. If this lift continues, what will you tell the young people moving here in the next 30 years? You will have to be making over $50,000 sorry, $50,000 a year to afford a tiny 350-square-foot studio. There are so many holes in the Broadway plan that cries out for a major resuscitation. Please either reject this plan or refer it back to staff. Council, please don't just settle for this plan, as many are urging you to. Right. Ed, okay. pr- prioritize you. affordability, livability, and access with human-scale density this That's, is a once-in-a-century chance to get it right. Okay, that, that is you. it for your time. Um, and you have no questions, but thank you again for um, speaking to Council. Very much appreciate it. Thanks, Councilor Carr. Okay. Um, Council, we are at three minutes to um, ten, so there's not time for another speaker. Um, so, um, I'd like to move no, a motion. Uh, you, no, you do not need a motion. Um, I, I'm just recessing this meeting to uh, Tuesday, May 31st, starting at 3 p.m. And we will go on Thank to everybody. 
Yep. Good. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bye.